honourable members, the speaker. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this Parliament, direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The Honourable Minister. Mr Speaker, I move that notice number one, government business, be postponed until a later hour this day. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Government business, order of the day number one, dear slaughter levy bill, resumption of debate on the second reading. Before uh, the debate is resumed, I'll remind the House that it has been agreed that a general debate be allowed covering this bill and orders of the day numbers two to five. The honourable member for Braddon. Uh, thank you very much. The honourable much, member uh, for Cook resume Mr. his Speaker. seat. Well, it's very confusing to the chair if there are a number of members standing at the one time. Uh, thank, member for Braddon. thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. This legislation, which is before the House, as uh, you've just indicated, covers uh, five different uh, bills in regard to uh, the deer industry. And this legislation will establish a deer industry research and development fund through industry levies and government contributions. And I don't want to uh, delay the House very long on this issue, as the main of the debate has been held yesterday. But I do want to go just briefly back over some of the facts in regard to this industry. It is a, a growing industry in Australia, and this legislation has been requested by the Deer Farmers Federation of Australia. This industry at the moment has 155,000 deer and around about 1,000 farms involved in that production. And it's an industry which is growing at the rate of around about 25 per cent per year. Up until this stage, the industry has had voluntary levies on its members and has uh, had an income of $25,000 from those levies. These bills here ex would mean that the industry would expect something in the vicinity of $100,000 coming in from the industry for research and development and for promotion of this growing industry in Australia. And, uh, the Coalition supports the government in this legislation in the House. I would like to uh, just make a few general comments about the need for our industries to be world competitive. Because in listening to the debate in this House, uh, people have mentioned the fact of competition, which is occurring particularly from New Zealand in this area where they have a much larger deer industry. But Australian farmers and people in manufacturing businesses, the miners and so on, we have to as Australians realise that we are now in global markets and that we have to face up to the fact of world competition. And uh, perhaps Australia is going to have benefited from the fact that we do have a close country to us who is competitive and will make industries in Australia more efficient. And I think that is the case in regard to the deer industry market. What we have to do as Australians is to make sure that our infrastructure in Australia, which is often outside the control of uh, the farmers or the business people of Australia, is also efficient. These areas in which government have a say and uh, if we're going to be competitive in this industry, the deer industry, if this money which is raised in the deer industry is going to be beneficial in promoting venison as a product within Australia and overseas, then we've got to have competitive transport systems. We've got to have a competitive industrial relations framework in Australia because it is these types of costs which impact and impose on our industries. We cannot ignore the fact that we are in a global market. We're not just in regional markets. Australia is part of the global community. And therefore, 
we as a parliament here have to ensure that the infrastructure costs which are imposed on people such as deer farmers by governments, by the framework which we put in place, are the most efficient possible. And so, in this particular industry, it is good to see a developing industry. And certainly in the state of Tasmania, there is around about uh, 85 or so producers at the moment, and I'm sure that that is going to continue to grow. And they are able to get rid of their product, and it is an important industry in that state. And I think, as members of parliament, we should give every encouragement in the rural sector to new and rising industries in this country. We need to diversify because as we diversify, we're going to find niche markets around the world into which we can provide products. And the deer industry is one of those areas which is growing in Australia, and it's one which should be encouraged. And I'm sure that the investment of some of the farmers' monies into research, development and marketing will bring benefits will bring benefits for this industry. Now, of course, it has been alluded to that uh, some of the deer industry people within Tasmania are not happy with the overall deer industry and the direction in which they feel some of this money may be used. And I say that I think it would be good if the Deer Farmers Federation of Australia actually came in under the umbrella of the National Farmers Federation. That is the peak body in which the Tasmanian deer farmers would like to see their deer industry to be part of the National Farmers Federation. And that I believe that as this type of industry develops, there does need to be recognition that there may be regional <coughs> differences in the way in which they would like their product marketed. Now, I recognise that from a national point of view that uh, we would hope that the industries would act in unison, but within those industries I would say that there is a need for an awareness that different products and different regions may need to market differently. And I would uh, encourage the deer industry to look at those differences within their own organisation to ensure that people are treated fairly. The Tasmanian deer farmers are not opposed to this levy, and they were part of the deer, uh, the <coughs> deer farmers' federation of Australia when the decision was taken to. Uh, support this uh, initiative. So it's not that they oppose it, but the way in which uh, the organisation is being run they do have questions about and are concerned about it. Finally, uh, Mr Speaker, I'd like to say that by improving investment and getting a better product turnover in the primary industries in Australia, which I believe this levy will help achieve all Australians benefit. If primary industries in Australia are vibrant, are dynamic, are competitive, have an edge in world markets, then all Australians benefit. And I believe that this industry is one in which uh, it can be competitive in the world markets. It may not be a large primary industry sector in Australia as time goes on, but it can be competitive and that as it is competitive and as people use their skill and creativity in marketing the Australian product better, then the benefits from having a greater share of the market in the world will flow throughout our community. And so I would say that uh, I support this legislation that I believe that benefits will flow not only to the deer farmers in Australia but to all Australians as another primary industry sector 
grows in this country. The question is, this bill will be now read a second time. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I won't uh, take the time of the House because there is basic agreement with these, this legislation. I'd simply concur with the concluding remarks of the member for Braddon. It is a small industry, but I think it has a very strong future and, a very and it can be a very competitive industry in world markets. And I think a recognition by the industry of its ability to so compete is demonstrated by their preparedness and their urging of government to support this legislation. And uh, I welcome the opposition's support for the legislation. There have just been uh, two points I think that are worthwhile uh, commenting on. Firstly, to note that there have been differences within the industry about the legislation, and uh, I join with those who have spoken before me in urging that the industry uh, does sort out those differences because I think it's uh, important if they are to compete effectively, if they are to take advantage, that they do so with as united a front uh, as possible. Um, the second point that uh, was raised in the um, Deputy Leader of the uh, um, National Party's uh, contribution yesterday was this issue of double dipping. He wanted me to reaffirm on the record, uh, Mr Speaker, that uh, it was not the intention of this uh, legislation that where a levy had been um, paid in relation to Deer Velvet in a domestic uh, sense that it would uh, then subsequently incur it in export terms. I can confirm that it's not the intention for double dipping to occur and I uh, direct his attention to um, clause 6.2 of the uh, Deer Velvet uh, Export Charge um, uh, Bill, Mr Speaker, where it uh, clearly says that no charge is imposed by this Act on Deer Velvet, on, and that's the Export Act, no charge is imposed by this Act, the Export Act on which levy has already Im been imposed by the Deer Velvet Levy Act 1992. I believe that that does uh, meet the point of uh, concern that's been raised. I thank the opposition for their support. I commend the uh, legislation to the House. Question is this bill be now read a second time. All those that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Second reading, a bill for an act to impose a levy on the slaughter of deer. Is it the wish of the House to proceed to the third reading forthwith? That being the case, the Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a third time. Question is that the motion be agreed to. All those that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to impose a levy on the slaughter of deer. Order of the day number two, deer velvet levy bill, resumption of debate on the second reading. Question is that this bill be now read a second time. All those that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Second reading, a bill for an act to impose a levy on the sale of deer velvet or the use of deer velvet in the production of other goods. Mr Wish to the House to proceed to the third reading forthwith. That being the case, the Honourable Minister. Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a third time. Question is that the motion be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to impose a levy on the sale of deer velvet or the use of deer velvet in the production of other goods. Order of the day number three, Deer Velvet Export Charge Bill, resumption of debate on the second reading. Question is that this bill be now read a second time. All those that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Second reading, a bill for an act to impose a charge on the export of Deer Velvet. Mr Wish the House to proceed to the third reading forthwith. That being the case, the question is, is that the Honourable Minister? Mr. Speaker, I move that the bill be now read a third time. Question is that the motion be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to impose a charge on the export of deer velvet. Order of the day number four, deer export charge bill, resumption of debate on the second reading. Question is that this bill be now read a second time. All those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Second reading, a bill for an act to impose a charge on the export of deer. Is the wish of the House to proceed to the third reading forthwith? That being the case, the Honourable Minister. Speaker, I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is the motion be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to impose a charge on the export of deer. Order of the day number five, primary industries, levies and charges, collection amendment bill, resumption of debate on the second reading. The question is this bill be now read a second time. All those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. 
Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Primary Industries Levies and Charges Collection <coughs> Act 1991. Is the wish of the House to proceed to the third reading forthwith? That being the case, the Honourable Minister. I move that the bill be narrowed a third time. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Primary Industries Levies and Charges Collection Act 1991. The Honourable Member. Order of, the day num order of the day number six, Supply Bill number one, 1992-93, resumption of debate on the second reading. Right. Now, where we are, we, I understand it's also a wish of the House to conduct this debate concurrently with orders of the day numbers seven and eight. The Honourable Member for, is there any objection? There's no objection, I'll allow that course of action. The Honourable Member for Curtin. Mr Speaker. Supply Bill No. 1 seeks inter interim appropriations of $12.383 billion for the beginning of the next financial year until around 30 November 1992, by which time the 1992-93 budget bill should have been passed. Supply Bill No. 2 seeks $596 million over the same period, while the Supply Parliamentary Department's bill seeks a further $53.1 million for the ordinary annual services of the government and the parliament. Last Friday saw the uh, release of the Commonwealth Government Financial Transaction Statement for February 1992. The year to date analysis in that document showed that the cumulative def uh, budget deficit to February was of the order of $12.5 billion. This compares with a figure of $4.017 billion for the same period last year. Mr. Speaker. The cumulative budget deficit to February was thus $8.509 billion greater than that for the same period last year. Mr Speaker, this is a massive variation and it would be surprising if this could be fully accounted for by the many irregularities that occur in the pattern of government's annual outlays and receipts. The recession is clearly having a continuing and largely unacknowledged impact on the Commonwealth Government's finances. Total outlays are running at 1.6 per cent higher than the considerable growth of 5.7 per cent in 1990-91 projected in the recession budget for 1991-92. This includes new start and job search allowance payments that are running at $1.534 billion higher than over the same period last year to pay for the army of unemployed created by the Prime Minister, our own Mr Recession, and his government. Revenue collections have fared even worse under the impact of the government's recession. Total taxation revenue collections are running at minus 8 per cent as against the 2.1 per cent fall forecast in the 1991-92 budget. So once again we see forecasts, budget forecasts being way off track. Tax receipts are down across the board. Net PAYE receipts are down 5 per cent. Prescribed payment system receipts are down 19.6 per cent, giving us some indication of the depressed state of the building industry. Company tax is down 11.6 per cent. Withholding tax is down a massive 42.7 40, per cent, Mr Speaker. Sales tax collections are down a more worthy but still worrying 2.8 per cent. It's interesting that the only areas of tax rece receipts to show an increase are those not directly related to economic activity such as the fringe benefits tax. Customs duty and the coal export duty, amongst the most iniquitous of the current range of taxes, have all shown, it's also shown increases of 2.3 per cent for imports and 23.4 per cent in the case of the coal export duty. Both these taxes are to be abolished under the coalition's fight-back package. 
What makes these percentage increases and decreases of even greater concern is that they are additional to the recession figures for outlays and revenue of late 1990 and early 1991. But these figures are interesting not simply because they reveal the depth and extent of the recession forced upon us by the government. They are also interesting because the shortfalls in tax receipts could have been much worse if uh, recent tax office boasts about revenue windfalls are anything to go by. For example, earlier this month, the tax office bragged that it was expecting a windfall of $300 million from taxpayers who failed to claim the expected deductions to which they are entitled. This is a strange boast, Mr Speaker, since it is indicative of taxpayers being unable to cost-effectively calculate their deductions and entitlements and meet the associated substantiation requirements. Self-assessment certainly live in, uh, live in this country, but it's not well. Nor is it equitable, Mr Speaker, if more tax is being paid by individuals than is rightfully required under the law. For many taxpayers, it's simply cheaper to pay the tax than spend valuable time and money calculating their entitlement to a tax deduction and subsequently having to, uh, having to argue their case with the tax office. But what this also means is that the uh, Commonwealth budgetary situation would have been $300 million worse off by the end of this financial year if it were not for this tidy little, albeit disreputable, windfall from the tax office. The same could be said of the tax office claim of $1.3 billion extra taxes being netted by the large case audit program of Australia's top 100 uh, companies. Another bonus for the revenue. But the budget deficit is nevertheless set to explode. The government's approach to the conduct of fiscal policy during the course of the recession has been grossly irresponsible as typified by last week's fiasco in introducing Appropriation Bill No. 5. My colleagues in the coalition well recall that it wasn't so very long ago that we were being browbeaten by a government claiming to be the paragon of fiscal virtue. The government was running a Commonwealth budget surplus and a close to zero public sector borrowing requirement. We were told in one budget speech by the then Treasurer and now regrettably Prime Minister, that fiscal policy was to be turned into the government's number one weapon against the current account deficit and inflation. But the government uh, claimed to be making a massive deposit in the savings account of the nation. Remember the words, remember the rhetoric. But no sooner did the government hit the rough and all the talk of fiscal rectitude went straight out the window. What a turnaround. Yeah, a huge turnaround. And we see it again, time and again. The surplus, we're now told, wasn't immutable. It had been before, but all of a sudden it was not immutable. We've been told that the rundown in the surplus and the emergence of a budget deficit was cyclical and not structural. Of course, what this implied would was that there never was a structural surplus to begin with, only a cyclical surplus, since there was no surplus to speak of once the recession had collapsed revenues and blown out expenditure. With the collapse of our economy, the cyclical surplus of the past, built largely on increased tax uh, receipts from strong economic growth, turned into a cyclical deficit. But instead of seeking to counteract this situation, the government is now heaping a structural budget deficit onto the cyclical deficit through the unfunded spending contained in the one job statement. Members will recall that the government's original budget deficit forecast contained in the 1991-92 budget was $4.732 billion. This figure was revised earlier this year to $6.3 billion and then to $6.8 billion only a few weeks later to take account of the $500 million to be spent in the current financial year on the one job statements. It's significant that this massive turnaround in the Commonwealth's finances doesn't even begin to take account 
of the increased spending in the government's one job statement. We were informed by uh, respected private sector sources before the release of the one job statement that the Commonwealth budget deficit could blow out to as much as $9 billion. Although aware of these dire predictions and not prepared to contradict them, the government has subsequently embarked on a massive program of totally unfunded public sector spending under the one job statement. All told, the government will be issuing $20 billion in new debt for the one job statement spending over the next few years. $20 billion of new debt. This is a nearly 60 per cent increase on Commonwealth government securities on issue at the present time, which amount to $35 billion. So in one fell swoop they are going to add another $20 billion on that debt over a few years. These figures are, of course, dependent on the costs of implementing the one job statement being in line with projections and upon the government's economic productivity and revenue growth fantasies being realised. Given the government's track record, we have every reason to expect that the budget deficit subsequent to the implication of the one job spending and the new debt required to finance it will greatly exceed government estimates. And we should not forget what Senator Walsh had to say about the budget estimates contained in the one job fairy tale. He said that the table in the recent economic statement which showed the budget coming back into surplus is definitely not a treasury table. You can bet your life on that. We know, yeah, we know where it came from. In other words, the government has again cooked the books, this time on the projected surplus. This is a matter of serious concern to all Australians. It's a matter of concern to all Australians and to their children and to their grandchildren, who will be obliged to repay this debt plus interest over future years. We on this side of the House don't value budget surpluses or balanced budgets for their own sake or as necessarily a matter of course. By increasing the supply of government bonds, the government, however, forces down bond prices, which in turn increases interest rates. These higher interest rates increase the cost of capital to the private sector and thereby put in jeopardy the new investment spending essential to pull us out of recession and to ensure sustainable economic growth over a longer term. With all indicators pointing to a slow and weak recovery, we simply can't afford to be put at uh, to, to put at risk new investment spending because of avoidable higher interest rates. Since private sector investment is more sensitive to changes in interest rates than, than private sector consumption, that investment will su suffer disproportionately to private sector consumption spending from higher interest rates. In terms of public sector investment, only the $1.1 billion in new infrastructure spending con contained in the one job statement could be strictly characterised as public sector investment. Most of the remaining unfunded spending contained in the one job statement is for public consumption purposes. The new debt being issued by this government thus favours public and private sector consumption over public and private sector investment spending, both through higher interest rates and through direct government spending for consumption purposes. Last Friday we also uh, saw the release of the most recent figures on private new capital expenditure in Australia. They show that private new capital spending in the December quarter declined 11 per cent from the September quarter and 14 per cent from the December quarter 1990. And this was in an environment of falling interest rates, not the rising interest rates we can expect following the one job statement. The significance of this is that uh, without greater spending on investment, we will not generate future, uh, uh, the future income stream from new productive investments to pay for this debt. In fact, what the government 
has done is to commit a greater proportion of our future income from existing investments to, to debt service requirements. We are again committed to borrowing from our future income to finance consumption today with little offsetting provision for greater flow of income in the years to come. This uh, situation might be summed up by saying that we are poorer as a result of this new public sector debt devoted to current consumption spending. It's true that uh, some of the non-infrastructure spending contained in the one job statement has investment characteristics. My good friend at the table, the honourable member for, uh, for uh, Goldstein, would be uh, aware that the, the increased spending on education can be regarded as public investment in human capital. However, the returns on such spending accrue to private individuals, not the government. Returns on these investments are thereby alienated from the government and can't be considered offsets against the repayment of public sector debt. Future generations of taxpayers will be obliged to pay for the bulk of the government's current investment in particular industries through spending on education. Even in the case of new infrastructure spending, the, the rates of return on these investments will probably leave much to be desired. The one job statement is perhaps most notable for the absence of the wide range of structural reform measures needed to make the Australian economy more efficient, more competitive and thereby more productive. The rates of return on public sector capital spending to the extent that they can be calculated in the absence of conventional accrual-based accounting in the public sector are far from being comparable with those attained in the private sector. Through the one job statement, we risk creating a series of infrastructure white elephants that will be more of a burden than a help to the Australian economy unless we address the whole range of key microeconomic reform issues. Until we address the issue of work practices on the railways, for example, the rail spending contained in the one job statement will not deliver satisfactory returns to taxpayers. Yeah, yeah. Until we tackle the reforms needed to take place in coastal shipping, we won't even know if rail is an appropriate long-term investment, given that it might be more efficient to transport some goods by sea rather than rail by reforming coastal shipping. The contrast between the government's ineptitude and the approach taken by the coalition in fight back is telling. We are committed to reducing public sector debt by some $13 billion through our fight back package. The retirement of debt financed out of current consumption spending serves to increase our net wealth since a smaller proportion of our future income is mortgaged to debt servicing. In other words, we are wealthier to the extent that we can use the federal budget to retire public sector debt. That should be self-evident. Moreover, we will aim to maximise the return on public and private sector investment by tackling the full range of structural reform issues that have, to be, that have been neglected by this government over the past nine years. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> One of the most important of these reforms, Mr Deputy Speaker, will be the reduction in protection to ne negligible levels uh, by the year 2000 and the associated phasing out of customs duties. This is in sharp contrast to the government's cynical backflip on protection and industry policy ahead of the Wills by-election later this month. The argument being put by the government that tariff protection is appropriate for some industries but not for others is both ridiculous and dangerous. It completely ignores the argument that have long been put for zero tariffs. The case for zero tariffs has nothing to do with the particular needs of the domestic industries currently enjoying protection. Zero tariffs are about Australian consumers being able to buy goods at the cheapest available prices and ensuring that our domestic industries are internationally competitive. That's right. if Australian industries are unable to compete with further tariff cuts at the present time. It is because of this government's failure to deliver on key microeconomic reform and its failure to address the impact that business taxes 
have had on the competitiveness of goods produced in Australia. Again, the Coalition's Fight Back package addresses both these issues in a comprehensive way. The Treasury analysis of the Coalition's Fight Back package supported the Coalition's claims about relief to be made available to businesses through the abolition of taxes on business. In the case of the manufacturing sector, this relief amounts to $5.37 billion in total, according to the Treasury, which equates to a 2.86 per cent reduction in costs. How long have you seen a government able to effect a reduction in costs in this country? And that is exactly what is both possible and intended in the Coalition's Fight Back package. If the government were genuinely concerned with the long-term viability of these protected industries, it would implement the tax reform proposals co contained in the Coalition's Fight Back package, rather than seeking to lumber Australian consumers with the job of supporting inefficiencies through higher prices. And when I talk about Australian consumers, I mean everyday family people. Under the government's proposed tariff re, uh, reductions, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Industry Commission estimates that consumer prices will be kept at 4.2 per cent above the level that would prevail with negligible tariffs as, as the uh, Coalition proposes. This is comparable to the CPI impact anticipated from the Coalition's tax reform pro, uh, proposals. Indeed, it's greater than the price impact anticipated by Treasury to flow from our tax reform proposals as spelled out in Fightback. The government's tariffs alone are a greater burden on consumers than the Coalition's tax reform proposals, including the goods and services tax. And the Prime Minister risks increasing this burden by opening the door to other currently unprotected industries who now have every reason, at least in their own minds, to demand similar levels of protection to those to now be enjoyed by the car industry, the textile, clothing and footwear industry and manufacturing industries generally. The case for free trade, Mr Deputy Speaker, was made centuries ago and is not some latter-day invention of the so-called economic rec uh, rationalists those bugbears of the left and of the Luddite right who now lurk in the pages of Quadrant magazine and elsewhere. It's sad to see that uh, some of the contributors to Quadrant now advocate economic policies similar in kind to those of the Stalin Stalinists that, that Quadrant once had uh, such a proud record in opposing, at least on questions of foreign policy. Long before the misleading metaphor of the level playing field was coined, Adam Smith declared that in every country it always is and must be the interest of the great body of the people to buy whatever they want of those who sell it cheapest. The proposition is so very manifest that it seems ridiculous to take any pains to prove it. Nor could it ever, nor could it ever have been called into question had not the interested sophistry of merchants and manufacturers confounded the common sense of mankind. Similarly, uh, Benjamin Disraeli was led to observe early in the 19th century that uh, protection is not only dead but damned. Unfortunately, uh, Disraeli was only half right in as much as protectionism is uh, still very much with us, but he was entirely correct in so far as he was referring to the death of protectionism as a credible idea in the minds of intelligent men and women. The dead and damned epitaph is entirely appropriate, however, Mr Deputy Speaker, in describing this government's approach to industry policy and the costs it forces upon Australian consumers. It's little wonder that the Financial Review, not, uh, not an organ known to be kind to, to the coalition party, but it's little wonder that it edi edi editorialised that the Prime Minister's out outbursts on the question of, uh, of protection were a case of bad theatrics. The Australian headline with uh, Paul turns on himself and the nation, with the question being asked by one com commentator, Paul Keating, how do you sleep at night? How do you sleep at night? Not a bad question. How does he sleep at night? 
How would you know? Mr Deputy Speaker, it's uh, this palpable lack of commitment to structural re reform on the part of the uh, government that makes its increasing resort to deficit financing all the more alarming. The lack of structural reform puts at risk our ability to provide the productive capacity that will be required to service the debt and provide a decent standard of living for future generations. There are thus good reasons for favouring a budget surplus to retire public se sector debt and to favour a balanced budget as a rule of fiscal policy over the longer term. In return for the uh, fiscal excesses of the one job statement, Australian taxpayers can expect very, very little except more pain. Not only will the increased public sector debt from the one job statement put at risk the economic recovery and thereby the jobs of many Australians, the nature of the proposed income tax in the one job st uh, in income tax cuts in the one job statement will also ensure that those fortunate enough to have jobs and earning around average weekly earnings will receive little or nothing by way of tax relief because the one job statement maintains the existing tax brackets for low to middle income earners and contains no commitment to the return of bracket creep these people will end up paying more tax as a result of the one job statement as inflation erodes the value of the $5,400 tax-free threshold and pushes some of them into higher tax brackets. This is particularly true of the millions of Australians earning $20,700 a year or less. A worker on an average wage of a, a worker on a wage of around $20,000 a year will lose as much as $12 a week due to bracket creep under the one job statement. This entails, of course, accepting the government's assumption of a low inflation rate of around 3 per cent, a rate which may turn out to be significantly higher depending on the extent to which the government through the Reserve Bank accommodates the uh, one job statement fiscal stimulus in its handling of monetary policy. Bracket creep in the uh, lower tax brackets will result in a revenue windfall to this Commonwealth government of $1.5 billion, with a similar amount accruing from reduction in the real value of, re of the remaining tax brackets. That is, this government will reap a further $3 billion due to its inflation alone. Another rip-off, as my friend says. The bracket creep will fund the tax cuts the statement promises to the relatively wealthy in the higher tax brackets. These tax cuts will result in someone earning $100,000 a year being about $2,464 a year better off. While higher income earners are also entitled to some tax relief following the government's PAYE tax grab during the 1980s, the fact remains that it is low to middle income earners who have, fared, uh, who have fared worse under the, uh, under the present Prime Minister and who are most in need of relief from personal tax personal income taxes at the present time. This is why the coalition's fight back cuts are concentrated on those with low to middle income, starting with an increase in the tax free threshold from $5,400 to $7,000. The tax cuts for people earning $25,000 a year or less under the coalition's fight back package range, from, range upwards from 25 per cent to 100 per cent. Moreover, our tax cuts are uh, additional to a commitment to the complete return of the proceeds of bracket creep. We've undertaken to publish in the budget papers the full extent of bracket creep and then return all of this revenue to taxpayers. Firm a firm commitment. The Prime Minister yesterday, uh, in his usual way, rhetorically asked uh, a, a, in question time what the coalition would do about its budget surpluses once it had redeemed all of the government securities on issue, knowing 
the question couldn't be answered during question time. That's a favourite ploy of the Prime Minister when playing uh, to our friends in the press gallery up there. An obvious answer to that question would be to give these funds back to their original owners, owners <laughs> namely taxpayers, through personal income tax. But that wouldn't. Uh, income tax cuts, but that wouldn't uh, occur to this Prime Minister, I can assure you. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is interesting that the Prime Minister thinks that any surplus funds in the hands of the Commonwealth need to be found some special purpose if there is no Commonwealth debt to redeem. His attitude seems to be that once the government has got its hands on some money, they should never give it back. The Coalition, through its commitment to the return of bracket creep, has shown exactly what should be done with surplus funds in the hands of the Commonwealth. They should be handed back to taxpayers in whose hands they will be undoubtedly better spent. The question is, this bill will be now a second time. The Honourable Member for Hunter. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Honourable Member for Curtin refers to rip-offs and ineptitudes. And, uh, I find that rather strange, coming from a member of a party which epitomises those very terms. However, I know that he's a good fellow and I understand how great his abhorrence of uh, those two words is. But how is his memory? How will I remember? How will I remember in 1983 when every day the parliament sat, the honourable member from Curtin was on his feet and he was lamenting the 9.6 billion deficit under Fraser and Hal as treasurer. There we had double figure inflation, double figure unemployment, double figure interest rates. And how well I remember. Am I mistaken? Wasn't the Honourable Member for Curtin on his feet every day lamenting the tragedy which had befallen this country. I can imagine him there with the tears streaming down his face. Ah oh, yes. Ah oh, yes. And let's not forget who was advising the Prime Minister and the Treasurer of that day. Ah oh, yes, the Honourable Member of the Opposition, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, the Member for Wentworth. An economic failure in 1983, but now masquerading as the saviour of the world's problems. And the solution, the solution coming from the other side of the house. Favour the rich and slug the needy. The leader of the, of the opposition who says, don't analyse my fight back too closely, just believe. We'll benefit you. Just believe. Read my lips. The honourable member for Curtin, who has just left the House, has quite a sound economic knowledge, but unfortunately he must toe the party line, irrational though it may be. I know how worried so many members on the opposite side of the House are about the GST. It just ain't going down there too well out there in the marketplace. And their knees are knocking together. Their knees are knocking together. Coming down in the plane the other day, I read the airline journal and there was a quiz compiled by Colin Dawson. The answer to one of the questions said, that Australia's first national strike in 1976 protested against changes to Medicare. That answer, of course, is wrong because Medicare did not come into effect until the election of this government. The health service, which was destroyed by the Conservatives, was, of course, Medibank. Now, the honourable member for Curtin mentioned cynicism. I merely point out the fact that the Conservatives destroyed Medibank. Remember Fraser? Read my lips. We will not dismantle Medibank. But away it went. And we all know that this present opposition has its heart firmly set on destroying Medicare and playing lapdog to Dr Bruce Shepherd 
and the other zealots in the Australian Medical Association. I'm going to mention quite a few things, and one thing which I believe will dead in the heart of most Australians who are battling out there during this recession is that we'll see the start of the bonus payment tomorrow. More than two million families who are entitled to receive family allowance. They get that extra bonus starting at $125 for a one-child family and ranging up to $250 for a family with four or more children. That's good news for families. Better news than the opposition's GST slug. In passing, I would also like to pay praise to the government and Minister Peter Staples. Uh, I'm delighted, and so is the remainder of my electorate, about the progressive improvements being made uh, throughout the length and breadth of the electorate of Hunter. A new daycare centre in Cumberland is going full steam now and much appreciated. Uh, the new age hostel in Sestock is to open next month and that will be a boon for the town. The aged hostel in Merriwar is well on stream and uh, also improved aged care facilities are proceeding in Singleton. I do have one grizzle, however. Uh, it puts me in a pretty foul mood. For the past seven years, I have been battling to achieve better social security arrangements for the people of the Upper Hunter. It is intolerable and totally unacceptable that the people of Scone, Musselbrook, Singleton, Merriwar, Denman and a host of other townships should have to depend on the social security schedule which visits Singleton for two hours and visits Musselbrook on one day for two hours. Now that's just not good enough. It's shameful, in my opinion, that people who cannot make contact with social security officials during those brief periods have to travel to Maitland to gain assistance with social security problems. The bureaucracy in the social security department doesn't seem to understand that not all unemployed people own cars, nor do they seem to have any appreciation of the distance and the time constraints in travelling to Maitland. Just recently, the minister decided that additional social security officers would be established in New South Wales, and I was confident that either Musselbrook or Singleton would gain a Guernsey. However, my electorate missed the boat, and uh, that's why I'm spitting chips over that issue at the moment. However, the fight has not ended. And uh, next Monday, I will be having a conference with the regional manager and other top personnel in Social Security. And some harsh words may be necessary, but I am determined to gain better Social Security services for the deserving areas of my electorate and those areas which are about to become uh, part of my electorate as a result of the redistribution. You know, it's interesting what is occurring in my electorate. I try to gain benefits, but sometimes those benefits are not appreciated. I refer to a bypass of the town of Musselburgh. Now, I'm not quite sure of the population of Musselbrook, but it's a lovely little town and a busy little town. It's in the heart of the coal mining area. It has a population, I guess, of about 12 to 14,000 people. But its main street is absolutely crazy. There is a, a viaduct with a which allows the uh, railway line to run over the part of the main street virtually. And with the passage of coal trucks and the other heavy traffic due to the fact that Musselbrook is on the uh, New England Highway, which is now the National Highway, it is impossible standing in the main street of Musselbrook 
to make oneself heard, and I believe that business is suffering as a result. Now, we see the idea behind the National Highway to enable people to get as speedily as possible from point A to point B. Now, we've passed so many towns. I was read for a time in a small town on the north coast near Bucker Heads. Now, as a result of the bypass, that town is bypassed completely. But to people to whom I speak in that town, they have no concerns because business has not suffered. Now, uh, Berrimo and all the towns on the uh, south coast of New South Wales used to have the main road going through there. They've been bypassed. Goulburn is to be bypassed. Mittagong is to be bypassed. And uh, I think it will be a wonderful thing for the people of Musselbrook when their town is bypassed by the National Highway. However, a few business people up there are concerned, and I understand their concern, but I was rather upset when one person wrote and says, oh, this is a political gimmick by Fitzgibbon to announce just before the election so he'll get a, uh, a bag full of votes. I took exception to that uh, because I always act in what I believe to be the best interest of the people. One other thing that has been surprising me, or perhaps not really surprising me, but is the increasing load of visitors I'm getting to my electorate, or in areas adjoining my electorate. And uh, they all wear the Conservative cap. And it leaves me in no doubt that they're rather worried. Election fever is in the air, and they're very, very worried. But they're sending these lightweights along uh, to try to stir the possum in my electorate. Unfortunately, however, they're finding that very, very few people are prepared to listen to their GST nonsense. As one Conservative supporter <laughs> mentioned to me on the quiet, the crowds they draw is even more disappointing than the message they bring. GST, he said. Bah! Humbug! And that's the message I'm getting back from my constituents. You know, they come in and they have a little meeting and they get ten or so people to hear their message. Compare that to the dinner that I'm having in Cessna on Friday week. A former Prime Minister of this country, Gough Whitlam, is coming up, and for two weeks we've had the house full signs. We've jammed them in, we've squeezed them in, but for two weeks we've had the house full signs up. And what a splendid night that will be. The member for Guider, a good fellow, a good friend of mine, he came down to Maiton to talk about the GST. We read in the paper that he was coming. Next day one would have expected to see in the paper a full report of his visit. Not a word. Not a word. Not a word. I wonder what happened to that meeting. And then we had the leader of the National Party come up to Maiden. The leader of the National Party. And I thought that next day there would be a full report of his support for the GST. Not a word. Not a word. The only two points he made was that my electorate was changing and I was moving from Sestock to my office from Sestock, Maitland to Sestock. And the other point he made, that not one person in the Hunter would support me any longer because I had supported the present Prime Minister against the past Prime Minister, although I love them both. But I think now, I think now that my support in my electorate has grown overwhelmingly as a result of that decision made by me. Not an easy decision, but a decision that I made in good conscience. Today my office received a phone call. Premier Griner, the Premier of New South Wales, wants a copy of a speech I made here last week, a speech in which I defended the coal miners of the northern coal fields. The Premier is a little bit upset because I had the effrontery to criticise him because of the Elcom Mines issue, because I had the, uh, the effrontery to criticise him 
for his government's policies which are sterilising coal reserves on the northern field. But Conservatives are no friends of the miners, and the coal miners of the northern field and the southern field, the coal miners, well know that fact. Well know that fact. As I've said, the opposition members continue to come, continue to come into the Hunter electorate, but they fail lamentably. I want to remind the House of a great speech made here either this week or last week by the member for Capricornia, my good friend Mr Keith Wright, in which he cited Justin Donnelly's book, The GST. And I'm not going to repeat everything the honourable member for Capricorn said because I just don't have the time. My time is running out. But the front page of that book said it all. The front page said it all. The GST. The GST. A nightmare. A nightmare that Australia must avoid. Do I hear a voice coming from Canada saying, too bloody right? Do I hear a voice coming from New Zealand saying, too right? A nightmare that Australia must avoid. And then we have evidence. The Canadian Federation of Independent Business. The Canadian Federation of Independent Business. How do they label the GST? A national tax tragedy. A national tax tragedy. And I could go through details of their criticism. I don't have much time, however. Never in the whole history of Australian taxation has there been such a proposal to take so much money from so many and give it to so few. As well as being unfair, the proposed goods and services tax is also illogical and inefficient. That's Donnelly in his book. Then we come to the Canadian Confederation of Business. And their advice to business people. Furthermore, you can plan on spending extra hundreds or thousands of dollars that will be required to seek professional advice from your accountant or lawyer on how the GST will affect your business. The implementa <coughs> implementation costs, on an average, were about $4,000 per form, with ongoing monthly costs averaging about $430. Of the total implementation and compliance costs, which amounted to $9.6 billion in its first year of operation, that's interesting. That was the deficit that the Fraser government left us, $9.6 billion. 82 per cent of these costs, or $7.9 billion was borne by small businesses with less than 20 employees. Gee whiz, I'm spending some stamps that day, but those facts have gone out to all the small businesses in the electorate of Hunter. And I'll tell you what, my message is being listened to far more avidly than that message which opposition members try to impart to the people of my electorate. But still they come, they come to my electorate, they must love the Hunter Valley wines, and why shouldn't they? Yeah. Senator John Tierney came up there. He went to Singleton and spoke to the Chamber of Commerce. I heard that he was coming. Heard that he was coming to preach to his own. But I have little need to take damage control here. I haven't heard a word about his visit since, and there wasn't a single press report. And then Senator Bishop. Senator Bishop came up to address the students from Newcastle University. 
and she told them that the GST would be the best thing for them since sliced bread. They didn't believe her. How extraordinary that students refuse to believe a senator of this nation because I, they saw through her nonsense. You know, how are tax breaks, tax savings, tax cuts, how are they going to benefit students who currently pay no tax? And I think students are smart enough to see that every bit of food they buy, every clothing they, bit of clothing they buy, I know the effect that they, that will have on their pocket. And you know, they know as well. And then an MLC, how low can you get? An MLC from New South Wales, a good mate of mine, John Jobling, comes up to the hunter and preaches to the vineyards about how the GST will benefit them. Well, I've prepared a reply to Mr Jobling, Order, and that will be republished the in all the papers in my electorate and will make really Order, good reading, the Mr Deputy Member's Speaker. Time has expired. I call the honourable member from Mayor. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. One can only uh, sympathise with the poor people of the electorate of Hunter who have to put up with that kind of anti-intellectual assault on the uh, Coalition's Fight Back program. And presumably the support that the member for Hunter gives to the One Nation program is equally woeful. I was interested, though, in listening to the member for Hunter's speech that he spent so little time talking about the One Nation program, which is supposed to be the heart of the government's vision for our country over the next four years. It's a vision, though, that I think we've all come to recognise is uh, one that can never, ever be fulfilled. It is just a claim, a cynical political claim of the type that the Australian public have heard over and over again, in particular from the present Prime Minister, the man who said with his budget a couple of years ago that this is the budget that will bring home the bacon, the man who claimed that, the recession, that we would never have a recession as the country gradually slipped into the worst recession it's had for 60 years. It is that man who is now claiming, with his colleagues, that their One Nation program is going to lead to a new era of prosperity in this country. What it in fact is, is over a four-year period, yet another uh, uh, example of politicians simply opening up the taxpayers' checkbooks or plunging their hands into the pockets of taxpayers, taking out money, spending that money on glittering projects and not knowing ultimately how the bills will be paid. There is a $20 billion expenditure blowout in the One Nation package, a $20 billion expenditure blowout with no idea, the government giving no idea of how they will fund that. Not surprisingly, although I'm not a great devotee of opinion polls, but not surprisingly, the opinion poll evidence is very clear that Australians won't be duped anymore by this kind of cynical politicking that they have got so very, very tired of. In an opinion poll published in the uh, Bulletin magazine today, I note that 46 per cent of people have given the uh, One Nation, One Job statement the thumbs down. Only 28 per cent of people, that I suppose is the definition of die-hard Labor supporters, only 28 per cent of people give it their approval. But more interestingly, and I suppose in a sense more relevantly to the uh, economic prospects of our country over at least the next year, for, we'll have to put up with One Nation for one more year, is the reaction of the business community itself. Because if we're going to do something about unemployment in this country, we have to get investment. And that investment is only going to come from the business community. Now, what did the Australian Chamber of Manufacturers survey of businesses within the, within the uh, chamber, and there are what 7,000 businesses in the Australian Chamber of Manufacturers, what did those members say in, the res in their response to the One Nation package? 92 per cent of respondents to the ACM survey said that the One Nation statement would not lead to them increasing their investment. Three per cent, three per cent said that it would lead to them increasing investment. 
I think, I think that is all the evidence that you need to prove that the one nation statement will in the end do nothing to create jobs in this country, nothing to reduce our massive level of unemployment, our historically high level of unemployment in this country, nothing to resolve the social crisis that goes with that unemployment because it is not going to inspire businesses in this country to invest. But uh, you know, these claims that the opposition might make you would uh, imagine could be put down as uh, partisan uh, denunciations of anything the Labor Party would do in the way that um, the other way around their denunciation of the fight back program is the same thing. But in truth, our claims, our claims about the One Nation package, our claims about it being unfunded, our claims about its assessments of economic growth over the next four years being little short of heroic are supported by all major organisations with an interest in this sort of proposal in this country. The Confederation of Australian Industry, which I think all would agree is one of the two major industry associations in, the, in Australia, said of the one, one Nation statement, and I quote, the economic statement is not about economic management. It is political from top to bottom. That was the Confederation of Australian Industries, not the opposition, not the Liberal Party, not the National Party. That was the CAI. And they went on to say, as I'm sure, and I'm sure they reflect the feelings of most Australians in saying this, one ultimately becomes weary of trying to fit all of the pieces into a coherent recovery strategy. So the Confederation of Australian Industry, in their uh, review that they published in, uh, in February, very soon after the One Nation statement was uh, released, gave it the most damning indictment imaginable. So too, though, did a recent report produced by the Centre for South Australian Economic Studies, what's called their March Briefing. They do briefings on a quarterly basis. Now, again, they have confirmed they have confirmed many of the things that we and people in the business community also have said about the One Nation package. They uh, say some, I'd have to say, some rather flattering things about the Fight Back program, which I suppose I should read into the Hansard, but I want to concentrate on the main point here, and that is the criticism of the One Nation package. What they say is this. The One Nation scenario appears, on the face of it, to offer an unsustainable growth rate over the period 1993 to 96, It would appear that the One Nation scenario is too optimistic about the net export performance and hence the growth prospects of the Australian economy over the period 1992 to 1992-93 uh, to 1995-96. goes on later in the document. One Nation's, the One Nation scenario is too optimistic. The growth rate it projects in the medium term, if they were attained, which we doubt, would cause a blowout on the current account of the balance of payments. Now that is the, center, um, the South Australian uh, Centre for uh, Economic Studies, which is, uh, which is uh, run by Flinders University and Adelaide University. It's nothing to do with politics or party politics. But it again is a damning indictment of the credibility of the One Nation statement. Because what they're saying is that not only is it a document which is totally unfunded and therefore, as the CAI said, is not an economic document but is just a political document, but what the Centre for South Australian Economic Studies is also saying is that it is built on foundations of sand, that the estimates for growth built into the One Nation package, on which the whole uh, structure of that package um, is, has been erected, the estimates of growth are simply phony. They are simply phony. You have a declining economy in Japan. You have the German economy stagnating. You have the Treasurer admitting to EPAC last Friday that the uh, decline in the Japanese economy is going to affect the economic performance of the uh, performances of the Asian tiger economies, and uh, you at the same time have claims by the government that we in Australia, over the next four years, are going to achieve the highest rate of growth of OECD countries, the highest rate of growth out of all 24 countries, because we're going to be dragged up by these neighbouring Asian economies. 
I mean, if you actually look at the figures for Australian trade, since the claim is we're going to have this great trade boom into Asia, if you actually look at the figures, the countries that have done best in terms of exporting to the growing Asian economies are the Europeans and the Americans and the Asians themselves, not Australia. Our exports as a proportion of GDP are the same today as they were in 1961-62. We haven't improved. We haven't improved in 30 years. And suddenly the government comes forward with a one-nation statement, what, I mean, what the most heroic political claim I would have thought that we've seen since the war in this country, that we're going to achieve the highest rate of economic growth in the OECD over the next four years. And all of the assumptions of the package are built around that one basic claim. It isn't only people in the business community, it isn't only economists, it isn't only the international financial community or the Liberal Party and the National Party which are cynical about the One Nation package, it is also people within the Labor Party. What did Senator Walsh say in his article in uh, the, Australian, uh, the Australian Left Review? It doesn't matter where the article was, but what he said about it, what he said is what matters. It's what he said that matters, and what he said was Mr Keating's One Nation statement was, quote, a very mixed bag. And it, uh, apparently when he was asked about the One Nation's proposals for tax cuts in 1994 and 1996, he said, and I quote, if the new tax scales are to be taken seriously, they show we've learnt nothing from 1989. We are guaranteeing major tax cuts years ahead in total ignorance of what the fiscal policy requirements of the day might be. And when he's, uh, as a corollary of that point, asked about the 4.5% growth scenario, remember, the highest rate of growth in the whole of the OECD over the next four years. It's fantastic news. And when he's asked about that estimate uh, in the One Nation package, he says, and I quote, that was the figure that was cited, but I, I doubt that it should be taken seriously. I mean, this is a member of the Labor Party caucus. This isn't a liberal or a national. This isn't an independent economist, um, some objective international financier making an assessment of uh, government policies in Australia. This uh, isn't one of the state premiers or whoever it may be. This is a member of the Labor Party caucus and a finance minister for most of the life of the Hawke Keating government. He's seen it all from the inside. And so he says, I doubt that it, the growth the scenario, should be taken seriously. And he goes on to say, but if it's going to be taken seriously, that's a formula for very largely repeating the mistakes of 1989 when tax cuts help fuel an overheating economy. And, there's an, and, and you know, he goes on, I won't uh, continue to quote from it, but he goes on and on and on, damning the One Nation statement in exactly the same way as the South Australian Centre for Economic Studies does, in exactly the same way as the Confederation of Australian Industries does, in exactly the same way as the 7,000 members of the Australian Chamber of Manufacturers does, and in exactly the same way as the great Australian public do. Forty-six per cent of them think it's a complete washout, it's a fraud and only 28 per cent of them, the definition of die-hard Labor voters, 28 per cent of, uh, of people in this country who think it's any good at all. So I'd have to say it is a, uh, a one-nation statement, the one-nation, one-job statement, which is really, really swinging in the breeze now, I'm afraid. Now, the Labor Party, however, since they launched their one-nation statement, have decided that really we'd rather not talk about it too much, and we had a few days of... Uh, um, frenetic activity talking about the monarchy and the flag and all these sorts of things. And uh, this, um, I must say, was launched the day after this attack on the monarchy and the flag and uh, the British uh, involvement in uh, the Malayan Peninsula in 1942. All of that, you might recall, was launched the day after the One Nation uh, package was announced. So we've had all of that. But once, they've decide, once they concentrate on what they believe to be the main agenda of politics today, the main agenda is the coalition. They're actually not really very interested in telling the Australian public about their own policies or about what they're supposed to be, which is the government of Australia with still one third of their parliamentary term left. 
They're not out there talking about that. They're not uh, within their offices formulating policies designed to further the broader interests of this country. They're running around Australia trying to scare the pants off people over the coalition's fight back program. And yet uh, the fact is that in the heart of the Labor Party there is a recognition that much of the fight back program is precisely what Australia wants. And let me give you some examples. We propose in the fight back program to get rid of the current ramshackle consumption tax system that we have in Australia. Oh yes, we have consumption taxes in Australia. The sales tax system, the payroll tax which is passed on to consumers in the form of higher prices, and every time you go Every time you take your car to a petrol station, you're going to a branch office of the Australian Taxation Office. Every single time you do it, a third or so of the cost of the petrol, you, the price of the petrol that you buy at the service station, is simply coming back here to Canberra for Mr Keating and his colleagues to splurge all over the country trying to win votes. So we uh, are saying we'll get rid of that consumption tax and replace it with a simple across-the-board goods and services tax. We'll get rid, for example, of the wholesale sales tax. Now, you know, what can one say about the wholesale sales tax? Well, um, somebody said back in 1985 there are three main advantages of a consumption tax. First, it will allow a more rational, indirect tax system than the current anomaly-ridden wholesale tax, which has multiple rates, numerous exemptions, and fails to tax the services sector. Second, it will enable us to generate tax revenues to provide for a major reduction in the marginal rates of income tax. No other tax has, been the, has the same potential for this purpose. Third, it generates tax from those who will continue to evade or avoid income tax. That provides a useful net dividend for distribution to the rest of the community. The virtually zero exemption single rate structure of the tax is a, crucial, is a crucial design feature. It will assist both administration and compliance. For business, this is a simple tax. They will also benefit from no longer carrying the cost of the wholesale tax which they pay and have to finance on their stocks. Now that, I think, sums up very well why we believe we need a broadly based consumption tax in Australia, which we call the goods and services tax, instead of the existing ramshackle indirect tax system above all the other sales tax. But that, you might think, was um, a quote from a speech by John Hewson, or uh, you know, the Leader of the Opposition, or the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, or the Member for Kuyong, or whoever it may be. But it wasn't. It wasn't. That was what Paul Keating, Prime Minister of Australia today, said in 1985. That's what he said. If you, if you believed him then, you'd find him pretty hard to believe today. But then, of course, Mr Keating changes as quickly as the opinion polls change when it comes to policies. And uh, I mean, I haven't got time to go through more and more of them, but the list of quotes just goes on and on and on. The Treasury, you see, in their critique, so-called critique, which was motivated by uh, politically uh, based instructions from the officers of the various treasurers as the Treasury were doing the work, the Treasury critique proves the point. The Treasury critique says that farmers will be better off to the extent of over $8,000 per farm as a result of the fight back package, that manufacturers will be better off by nearly $5.5 billion, that uh, wholesalers and retailers will be better off by nearly $3 billion, that restaurants, hotels and clubs will be better off to the extent of $318 million as a result of the fight back program. So, I mean, the fact is that, uh, and, and finally, exporters, according to the Treasury, according to the Treasury document, exporters, I mean, I wish they would go out and tell the public this. Why don't they? Why don't they? Because they don't have a skerrick of integrity. They should go out and tell the public that their own department, in this document I hold in my left hand, their own department says that export to taxes on exports under the fight back program will be reduced by almost $2 billion, reducing the price of exports by 3 per cent and making Australia more competitive. I mean, that is what their own document says. 
So I must admit it is just shameful the way they run around the country saying, oh, if you vote for the Liberals, you'll vote for this terrible consumption tax. And as somebody claimed the other day, uh, uh, yesterday, one of the ministers claimed yesterday, um, Australians will, as a result of that, suffer from malnutrition. I mean, really, at least we're comfortable in the knowledge that nobody, not even the most fervent, die-hard Labor supporter, would ever believe a Hans Christian Andersen fairy story like that. But what does the Labor Party do? It taxes goods, and it taxes goods right across the board with its sales tax system. It taxes through the payroll tax system. It taxes every time you go and fill your car up with petrol. It rips, uh, rips what, 26 cents in the litre out of your pocket. And through its tariff policy, I mean, through its tariff policy, which it's now apparently so proud of, um, it adds something like what, $30 to a pair of Reeboks. It um, it adds $12 to uh, knitted shirts, it adds $32 to a jumper, $6.60 to a bra and $3.89 to women's panties. A few examples of things that people would typically buy, all taxed by the tariff system to the extent of $650 per Australian per year. I mean, to claim that we are going to tax people when we're abolishing that tax and we're abolishing uh, six other taxes on top of that and as a result claim people Order. will be worse off is a fairy tale. It's a fairy tale. I call the parliamentary secretary to the Minister for Health, Housing and Community Thank Services. Thank you very much. Well, it, it is a blessing, I suppose, when some speakers stop. And what I'd like to do here is address the question uh, of superannuation because superannuation and the way it is treated by uh, the tax system has significant implications for government expenditure which is uh, the nature of the broad debate to d today on supply. And it has significant implications for government expenditure because of the generous tax treatment of superannuation that's been given by this and previous governments. I mean, it's an acknowledged form of savings and governments therefore tend to encourage an investment in retirement incomes using the vehicle of superannuation. But Recently I've been reading the new proposals by the opposition for a superannuation policy and I've also been reading some significant criticisms by the superannuation industry itself about the opposition's proposals for changes to superannuation. And these are most disturbing indeed because the quotes that I want to bring to the House today are indicating that we have here an irresponsibility in the way in which the opposition wishes to treat superannuation as part of a retirement income policy. And I'll take much of my, much of my material from an article of the, from the Business Review Weekly of March 27, 1992, which reported uh, on the proceedings uh, of a seminar held only weeks or so before that. Now it seems to me there's a, a fundamental <coughs> principle whereby the opposition and the government divides on the question of superannuation. The government has determined for some years now that we would make it wherever possible compulsory for Australians to contribute to a superannuation policy or through their work to have their employer contribute to superannuation, that is to their savings because it's our view that a minimum amount of compulsion is essential to make sure that those savings are put aside for people's retirement so that we don't, some years hence, 20 years hence, have too many people falling back onto the pension system. So it's absolutely essential that we have a minimum level of compulsion when it comes to putting away your savings and we prefer, our preferred vehicle is superannuation. Alternatively, though, the opposition is proposing that they have an incentive-based contribution systems, system of, uh, of contribution to superannuation. Now, not only do I and the government have significant differences of opinion here, but the superannuation industry itself has real worries about no matter what level of incentive, tax incentive is given, for people to contribute to superannuation, will they ever contribute sufficient money 
to promote their own retirement funds and keep them off the pension. I want to uh, take it to these uh, remarks from the Business Review Weekly, where the coalition believes that it can get people to save for their retirement by offering incentives. And these are, this is the view put by Senator Alston, the opposition spokesman. And he believes that their policy, the opposition policy, will provide sufficient incentive uh, to have people provide for their own retirement. However, the Association of Superannuation Funds of Australia, ASFA, informs us through this article that there is no country in the world where the provision of tax concessions has resulted in the general population saving enough for retirement. There is no clearer statement than that, but I've got as good statements about how an incentive-based system to contribute to superannuation simply doesn't do the job. Alternatively, though, we have encouraged a system whereby, through awards, workers at work on awards with their bosses compulsorily contribute money to the superannuation funds. And we've got some figures here. The ACTU Assistant Secretary Ian Ross mentioned at this Wollongong conference that since the introduction of award-based superannuation in August 1985, the proportion of employees with superannuation entitlements had risen from 39 per cent to 72 per cent. For male workers, it has risen from 50 per cent to 80.6 per cent, and for females from 24 per cent to a staggering 78.5 per cent. There's the alternative an incentive-based system which the Association of Superannuation Funds of Australia says simply cannot provide sufficient savings for Australians versus our award-based superannuation system, which not only will provide the savings, is clearly putting large numbers of Australians into that compulsory system. Now, Ray Block, the senior economist at SBC Dominguez Barry, we're not sure about the pronunciation, uh, has some remarks here. Uh, is it De Minx? Thank you very much. Uh, well, the deputy speaker couldn't uh, help me on that one. I'm grateful for you to sort that one out. He he says to us, the tax-induced super, the coalition's strategy, is unlikely to raise national savings significantly. At the incentive-driven margin, it merely directs private savings from one form to another. Unquote. Further than this. Uh, Diane Ross, a partner specialising in superannuation with the legal firm Hunt and & Hunt, says, and I quote, the general consensus in the industry is that the policy is horrible to the point of being horrific. At the very least, the coalition has a lot further to go before they get it right. Now, that's an extraordinary, an extraordinary criticism of a major section of policy of the opposition. This is a group that wants to come to government and implement a superannuation strategy which it claims will ensure that Australians put away sufficient through the vehicle of superannuations for their own retirement. Clearly, a number of people who are in the business of providing superannuation say that it simply won't work. Um, now, at the heart of the criticisms, lies this fundamental difference between the government and the coalition, but also between the coalition and just about everyone else in the superannuation industry. Voluntary contributions on their side and a system of compulsion on our side. Now, the industry, quite frankly, and we've heard from Diane Ross, is aghast that contrary to the experiences of other OECD countries with whom we compare ourselves, the coalition believes that voluntary uh, contributions will enable Australia to supplant the age pension with superannuation. Now, Ross Christie, Chief, Chief Executive Officer of the Local Authority Superannuation Board, comments on this and he says, history shows that a voluntary superannuation scheme just doesn't work. The coalition's policy is about as silly as asking people to voluntarily pay their taxes. And with the best will in the world, few people, with the exceptions of myself and others, uh, voluntarily pay their taxes. People gripe about it. But what the opposition is, is expecting us to believe 
is that people with a little bit of incentive will voluntarily contribute sufficiently to their own retirement savings that will provide for them 20 and 30 and 40 years hence. Um, he goes on, Christie goes on to say that the bulk of the population simply don't have the financial resources during their working lives to make voluntary contributions. As someone said at Wollongong, disposable income to these people meant that they might be able to buy their children's shoes. End of quote from Christie. And Christie uh, echoes the thoughts of others in the industry, and this is an exceptionally good report by the Business Review Weekly, uh, when he says that the only rationale that he can perceive for the coalition policy is an ideological commitment to freedom of choice. The ACTU believes that the coalition's policy is driven by a fervent opposition to award superannuation, somehow believing that these industry funds will give the union movement excessive influence over investment decisions. Well, I've been hearing that one for a decade, I suppose, in my involvement in the trade union movement. There's been no evidence to date that the trade union movement seeks any special control over superannuation funds. In fact, if you like, there's been some debate uh, between the government and the ACTU from time to time as to what role trade, unions would, trade union leaders would play in the management of superannuation funds. And it's trade union leaders who say to us, hey, don't fiddle around and direct where we should make these investments because we have to get the best return for our investors, that is, trade unionists. So trade union leaders, when placed in a role the same as anyone else who manages superannuation funds, generally come up with the same sorts of answers and questions. They want to make investments that return sufficiently or sufficient money to their people, to trade unionists. So I don't understand the sort of drive on the side of the opposition to have a, an incentive-based superannuation system that clearly, on the advice of a number of people from the industry, won't provide sufficient funds. Um, and, and the most damning thing here is uh, that uh, in this article is that there's a widespread belief in the industry that the coalition is opting for a policy that runs counter to the national interest. I don't think you can be more damning than that than a criticism of the opposition, that they have a policy that runs counter to the national interest. The national interest in this case is, of course, to raise the general level of savings. That's an objective that the government has and has heralded any number of times. But we might return to our friend Ray Block, uh, and he makes further comment on this, and he says, and I quote, this is the ultimate concern. How is Australia going to generate a large increase in savings and, in particular, in retirement savings? The Coalition's proposals are not plugged into any savings models. They constitute a bare minimum retirement benefits rather than a plan of imaginative action for the, f for the future." End of quote. Now, those are my concerns too, that there is a potential we're an sorry, there's a certainty we're, an op we're the opposition to be elected, that all our hard work in the last six and seven years trying to get people into mainly award-based superannuation schemes to ensure that they put money away for their retirement will be ruined by this system of taking away the basis of award-based superannuation, no further legislation for, uh, for the super in, in the form of the superannuation guarantee levy, which, which we have introduced, but to shift across, diminish the national effort, basically, by using this very weak method of incentive to get people to put away for their own savings. And as, as we've heard, people don't voluntarily pay tax, and they don't, by and large, voluntarily pay for their own savings, unless, of course, uh, there's an enormous and overwhelming uh, contribution also made by the taxpayer. I want to now move to some more particular and uh, finer criticism, criticisms uh, of the opposition's proposals on, on superannuation. 
Now, one element of this proposal is that there should be a, a $6,000 per year a contribution cap that individuals could make, make. And as a consequence of that, if, we are, if one is to propose a cap to the level of contributions that an individual can make to their own superannuation year by year, of course you have to take into account the fact that people don't work all of their lives. They may leave the workforce and then come back. So that they've made some, um, uh, some amendments to their scheme whereby people can make a catch-up if they fall behind in their contribution. That in itself is absolutely sensible, but I just want to take us through some of the difficulties with that contribution cap and the catch-up arrangements. Now, uh, the, the Treasury has done some work for us here, and it, it works through this and suggesting to us, in fact, what I might do is rather than quote Treasury first, is quote some people from the industry itself. And uh, the Association of Super, Superannuation Funds of Australia, I quoted before, is absolutely scathing in its analysis of the $6,000 contribution cap which the opposition um, touts. And it notes, and I quote, the limit on re re rebatable contributions will prevent most people from making adequate, adequate provisions for retirement through superannuation. It appears to have been based on a premise that a member would make contributions at this level throughout his, and I should say her, career. However, the coalition acknowledges that most young people show little interest in voluntary superannuation and that young marrieds would, in any case, be better off by paying off their mortgage rather than saving through superannuation. Now, I'm not agreeing with all uh, of that element, I might say. They go on further, though. As a result, most people will have little more than 20 years to save for the retirement and at $6,000 a year will not be able to produce a sufficient benefit to support them in retirement." End of quote. That's the difficulty we have th with this. This sort of cap arrangement may actually deny people an ability to put away sufficient funds for their own retirement. Now, according to figures prepared by Westpac Financial Services, a person who wants to live, an, uh, live on a retirement income that was equal to 75 per cent of their salary would have to save 17 per cent of that salary over 40 years. And to achieve that level of income over 20 years, a more realistic saving period, the person would have to put away 41 per cent of salary. A person saving 20 per cent of salary over 20 years, which is the scenario envisaged by the coalition, would end up with a retirement income of only 37.5 per cent of salary. Look, certainly the superannuation industry will always argue to have more monies flowing through its, uh, through its network. I understand that. But here is uh, a decent and very real uh, criticism of the opposition's desire to put a cap on the level of savings uh, per year that one can contribute. Now, also, this, this difficulty with trying to have a person catch up and make contributions, say, later in their work life if they find that they haven't put away enough for their own, uh, own retirement. We have some difficulties with this. The first is that the proposed catch up arrangement will, by and large, be of greatest benefit to the higher income earners, um, as this group is likely be, to be best placed to, to afford the catch up contributions. Um, we also find that the, the opposition has a desire to simplify all of these superannuation arrangements, which is a, a very decent thing to do when we share with that. But we find their particular arrangements here for catch-up will be complex to administer and police because of the necessity to maintain records of superannuation support received in each of the preceding five years and may provide insufficient scope for people who have not had the opportunity to contribute to superannuation. And this is a major concern of ours, for example, because people uh, have been out of the workforce, and that will be true for many women, um, and they may not be able to make the catch-up contributions in order to fund for them what will be an adequate retirement income. Now, the proposed $6,000 limit on total rebates will be difficult to administer, and for individual taxpayers, difficult to understand. And I might just 
work through one or two examples of this. Um, this will be particularly the, uh, be the case for members of defined benefit funds and unfunded superannuation schemes where the level of employer support received cannot be readily quantified. Um, and we argue that problems will arise where employer contributions do not vest immediately and people may be denied rebates and taxed at higher rates on other contributions because of contributions that they ultimately do not receive. Further, there's no indication in their documents of how the $6,000 will be distributed where a person makes both uh, uh, makes personal contribution and receives employer contributions or where a person receives employer support um, in several funds. Rules will be required to determine which contributions are to be rebatable first and of course this undoubtedly will involve complex deeming rules or complex notification requirements for fund members and the sort of calls I get through my office from people who are already worried about the complexity of the superannuation scheme uh, I don't doubt that this would double the number of calls through any member's office. Time is against me but I ask the opposition please reconsider your obsession with using a very weak mechanism of tax incentives to encourage Australians to put sufficient money away from their retirements. It hasn't worked in any other advanced nation. The industry has told you it won't work and I'm suggesting Order. that you will the have to members, back off your the policy. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary's time has expired. I call the member for Gippsland. Mr Deputy Speaker, in speaking to the legislation before the House today, I should wish to concentrate my remarks on the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation, CSIRO. The coalition, Mr Deputy Speaker, is convinced that the resources of the CSIRO are important factors in the solution of both the immediate and longer term economic and environmental issues confronting the nation. The organisation alone possesses a level of human skill and accumulated body of knowledge which can be applied to the range of environmental management problems as well as to the array of productivity and performance related problems which face Australia. CSIRO then will be called upon even more in the future. It will, for instance, have an instrumental role in industry development in the coming years, much more so than is now the case. Other countries are better placed in Australia as regards industry-related research. They possess a diffused yet active scientific and uh, technological research base in the private sector, as well as within large defence-related industries. The market pull in these countries is nothing short of fantastic compared to similar demand for competitively driven research and development in this country. The size and competitive position of companies like Siemens and IBM, despite its present difficulties, permit the existence of significant near-market and strategic research programs largely funded by private sector sources. Given the structural implications of Australia's economic history, we possess no such marked capability. We possess no crystallised industrial networks comprising key export companies and underpinned by efficient and innovative suppliers. The market as it has grown up in, in, under past uh, economic and industrial policies, has brought forth little by way of an aggressive, self-sustaining uh, R&D effort. On this basis, the economic role of the CSIRO's industrial and agriculture-related divisions will be even more critical in the future. Over the coming decade, Australia's industrial base will have the opportunity to restructure itself in relation to costs and market opportunities. But the extent to which it is capable of capturing the benefits of the much mooted microeconomic reform agenda will also largely depend upon the integration of technology strategies in business plans. The capacity of CSIRO to graft its expertise to specific companies or industry groupings to complement significant industry policy initiatives will be an important aspect of the reconstruction of Australian industry. That is to say, the diffusion of technology to achieve even greater efficiencies in production cycles or for the purposes of innovative product development will rely heavily on the resources of the CSIRO. This will be the case for primary industries as well as the industrial sector. There is no alternative. 
Economic restructuring means technological restructuring, and no other source of expertise, no other accessible reservoir of scientific and technological capacity exists to promote this type of change other than CSIRO. This is a fact of life which the coalition parties understand. I fully understand that the success or otherwise of restructuring will also depend upon the response of management and its openness to explore the investment timeframes related to research inputs. There will be a steep learning curve, no doubt, but there will not be too many choices. Given this, I would therefore wish to outline the continuing role of the CSIRO within the context of the coalition's overall industry agenda. There is sometimes an impression that the scientific and technological issues trail the mainstream economic debate. This is a simple fallacy, Mr Deputy Speaker. The object of the coalition's policies will be to remove the legacy of past policies which have largely created a profoundly constricted industrial and manufacturing base with little interest in technology acquisition. The apparent myopia of much of Australia's industry in respect of the potential relevance of the public sector research community is not symptomatic of industries elsewhere. When the CSIRO and other public sector research agencies confront the indifference or uninterest of the private sector to its activities, it is directly experiencing the legacy of the past. They are not experiencing a market failure as such. They are encountering structural problems which result from government failings. Until the various structural concerns are overcome, our nation will never advance on these concerns and its energies will be expended through frustration and the search for contrived solutions to fundamental problems. It is important the scientific research community be in the inside of these issues. There will be no sudden upturn in industry interaction with the research community until the private sector as a whole is driven to seek out technological-based solutions to its market difficulties, until business is hungry for technological innovation, until there is a basic impulse to search out the best science. I really do think we are deceiving ourselves and the wider community if we think we are ever going to reach any meaningful change if we continue to talk endlessly but never do anything on a massive across-the-board scale to boost private sector investment in research and development. It is an easy thing and a constant temptation for politicians to stitch together a cute initiative here and there and announce the problems under control. But invariably, the media binge washes off and the problem in all its bluntness re-emerges in time. As a community, we've been chasing these issues around for years. Political pressures build up and explode, and a few million is spread across the research effort, and there's a feast of self-righteousness by all involved. At some point, however, all of us have got to say, enough. I want the, the, the basic underlying problem fixed. So then, how do we as a nation try to build the innovative private sector which is so crucial to the construction of a large-scale, internationally significant research and development effort? What is characteristic of a powerful industrially-based R&D capacity? Recently, Mr Deputy Speaker, CSIRO headquarters published and disseminated the 13th David Rivett Memorial Lecture by Professor Nathan Rosenberg of Stanford University. It is a wonderfully brave and common sense look at what makes for competitive and knowledge intensive economies, an issue vital to the life of CSIRO. Interestingly, Professor Rosenberg turned the common wisdom on its head by showing that science rich countries are not, necess not necessarily those which are techn technologically intensive or apt to use technological innovation to build their competitive positions. In fact, he found that there was an inverse relationship between those countries which produce Nobel Prize uh, winners and their, their uh, comparative economic performance. Uh, copies of the CSIRO's occasional paper number six uh, can be obtained from the organisation, Mr Deputy Speaker, for interested members. Well, putting aside the complexities of the argument, 
Professor Rosenberg accepts there is no model performing economy. Some countries do have high growth startup companies achieving new sales based on new product lines and niche markets. Some have essentially mature industries which have upgraded product cycles, found new design opportunities and grabbed some extra efficiencies in their production processes, cameras, uh, motor cars and the like. But the common thread to all these performing economies is that they have a collective, almost primal urge to complete and to build uh, new and rebuild old markets. And now it is this instinct, this elemental impulse that is absent in this country. It is an old phrase, I know, but governments do not create wealth or produce or innovate. Private firms do, small businesses do, conglomerates do. And what creates an industrial cu culture which does this? Well, businesses which are conscious of and striving to match international best practices and win against international competition. The best firms, the firms which have a smell of the global market and all that requires of them are the most innovative. They're the ones that look instinctively to science and technology in one way or another to grab an opportunity to elbow into a new market. There's more to it than this, though. If it was this simple, then a quick lowering of tariffs would bring about a miracle in industrial restructuring. But such a process must be underpinned by a massive across-economy boost to industries, rural and manufacturing and service industries alike. There must be a dramatic reshaping of the total cost environment or landscape in this country, which saps scarce resources from such areas as research and development and spins them off into Commonwealth tax takes or squanders them uh, in wasteful on-costs. This fundamental reshaping of the production environment is the central intention of the coalition parties. It involves shedding $20 billion in company costs, which currently run into government coffers. It involves winning another $30 billion in gains from boosting productivity across the entire economy. This is the big game. This is where the fundamentals get remade, the environment in which new instincts are born. Strangely, in this country, if I was to walk out onto a public platform and announce an unfunded research initiative of, say, $100 million, I'd be praised. I could then say I was onto the problem and all will be well. It says a lot about a community and the media that politicians are allowed to get away with this stuff. I could bask in the sun a bit and even when the past started to rear its head again, I could get away for, say, 12 to 24 months by referring everyone to my track record and claiming previous initiatives were still working their way through the system. Easy to do. Great temptation for the non-performing minister and the non-performing economy presiding over the languishing research base. If you want a vital change in the culture of business so that R&D is seen for what it is, a vital tool for creating wealth and providing for sustainable growth, then you've got to do some heart surgery on the economy or perhaps a spinal tap or something. Business must be competitively poised. It must be subject to driving forces of change, technology and global competition. But it also needs the biggest across the board fully funded cash stimulus in this nation's history, a multi-billion dollar direct shot in the arm, which Fightback provides. The coalition and the scientific and technological community want to finally do something about the fundamental obstacles to creating a powerful industrial base in this country. The scientific community understands the critical importance of competitive economic performances to the take-up of research and the application of new technology. But they have watched enough government ministers pontificate to them about this road to Damascus, and they are wondering whether it's really there. Well, it isn't there. And it's not there and never will be until it gets built. And to build it, you have to use the tools of public policy and you've got to want to accept the scale of the undertaking and all which that means. Mr Deputy Speaker, CSIRO is integral to this larger task. As I said in my opening remarks, the reservoir of expertise in this organisation will be critical to the nation's ability to capture the benefits of the changes I've touched on. Economic restructuring is intertwined with technological change. 
CSIRO will continue to play a clearly important role in respect of its continuing work with established industries such as mining and minerals processing and agriculture. Not only are these areas in which Australia enjoys something of a comparative advantage, but they are industries with which the CSIRO has already cemented relationships. This in itself is critical to the commercialisation process. The pace of technological change and the rate at which market structures shift or new opportunities emerge is speeding up. This presents challenges to the whole manner in which we go about conducting commercially orientated research. Much earlier research, uh, much early research is already being integrated into the later stages of the R&D process. Hence, any commercial linkages the organisation seeks will require even closer relations with user groups in the future. On the basis of what I've said so far, I will no doubt have created anxieties as to how the coalition conceives of the balance of research within the CSIRO. While I am adamant that commercialisation of technology will remain high on the agenda, my interest is mainly in making current efforts more effective. It does no great good to push the CSIRO into providing a subsidised service for short-term industry research needs. That is the meagre end of the greater national need. Though I understand the private sector has short-term commercial needs, the CSIRO should be able to meet. Uh, there is much more to the game than just this. Industry needs to learn in the context of an economic environment that makes it receptive to learning that the strongest industries are those which possess a strategic vision of their business plan. Similarly, I believe the CSIRO must be able to retain and build upon its strong strategic research base. Innovation in management, as in research, is a product of planning and seizing hitherto non-existent opportunities. It is about prudent investments over time. It is about patience. Even in a crude instrumental sense, the CSIRO will best serve the community in the medium and long term by keeping alive its potentially most powerful capacity, that is, its capacity to seize the leadership in a given area of research. And that capacity ultimately resides in its strategic research effort. I have no doubts the organisation if it directed its research exclusively into near-market research, would benefit the industrial base in many ways. But to what benefit and for how long? It would most likely, by and large, yield incremental developments on existing technologies. We need incremental developments, to be sure. They will be especially important in consolidating the position of Australia's primary industries. But we also need a research base which will draw industry into new dimensions of technology and into new areas of market development. And research of this type will be fired by imagination. The retention of a sensible balance of research within the CSIRO is therefore crucial to achieving this end. On this basis, Mr Deputy Speaker, if Australia is to build an effective and lasting commercialisation or technology transfer process, it is one which must come to draw on a strong, competitive, strategic research effort. I know that one of the byproducts of the CSIRO's current commercial research activities is that industry is building in confidence in regard to the role of research in its business plans. There is a long way to go, I realise. The recession has compounded the problem, and as has the rural crisis. I know this crisis has hit sections of CSIRO directly. As a, as a member representing a country electorate, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is an issue about which I need little education. The more general recession has had a wider effect still. Businesses are disinclined to look beyond their core business plans. Now, I know the various research, rural research corporations have restricted resources at their disposal owing to falling commodity prices. But the process of working with the private sector, for all stresses it has placed on CSIRO's researchers and research managers, has been the only practical means of breaking into the commercial world. It has been the only way of demonstrating the unambiguous capacity of the CSIRO 
to directly benefit business outcomes. It has been and will continue to be an effective means of sending the message to industry that a commitment to higher levels of investment in R&D over a longer time period would yield even greater benefits. And it is working, though sometimes CSIRO might feel entitled to question the pace and extent of change. So then, Mr Deputy Speaker, when the coalition talks of the hopes it has for commercialisation strategies, it is not simply talking of the rapid-fire transformation of research into commercial products. It is, instead, looking to build a partnership between the public sector research organisations and the private sector, which is based on a shared view of the role of strategic research. Moreover, it is looking to build the environment which will see industry recognising the value of investment in research, which will capture significant proprietary returns down the road. If economic and technological restructuring are indeed to proceed hand in hand, if the nation is serious about rebuilding and redirecting its industrial capabilities, then this is the ethos which must guide it. The Honourable Member for Richmond. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I'd like to say to the member for Gippsland that uh, perhaps uh, if he does remain in the House and listens to my speech or on, on the text of my speech, I might be able to answer some of the questions that he has uh, posed there in his uh, address to the House. And I, I commend him for taking up the issue of CSIRO. It's, it's certainly uh, the, the flag, I guess, the flagship of the, of the research organisations within Australia, and it's uh, an organisation which I think uh, all Australia can be proud of. There are several things that the member for Gippsland did, uh, did address, uh, going on from the, the need for a boost to the economy to, to business. Uh, and uh, during the text of my address, I'll, I'll be glad to uh, canvas that issue and, and perhaps uh, illustrate some of the areas where the, where the, uh, the government is, is uh, addressing those issues and where the, the uh, Keating statement, the One Nation statement, will be addressing. The, the issue of the need for a boost to the economy was mentioned there and, the, and, the, and in, in actual fact I think there was a 20, figure of $20 billion actually put on it. Uh, it's, it's an interesting figure as to how you're going to uh, derive that $20 billion boost to the economy, Mr Member for Gipp Gippsland, because I guess it's, it's part, of the, part of the doctrine of the GST to actually uh, relieve taxes on certain businesses and transfer them to the, the smaller income people, and hence that, I guess, is your boost to, the, to that area. And, but the, the, probably the biggest sap on the economy in the last... Uh, 20 years has been inflation and seen misdirected in, uh, investment if there was anything. I would say that the, the offer, the holy grail of an offer of a $20, million, $20 billion boost to the economy is still somewhere back in the old days of McEwen and tariffs and things like that. You're still not prepared to make the business go and get out there and lead. You've still got to give them something to, to, uh, as, as a promise, as a something which they feel that they're getting that no one else is getting. Um, for, just on those, on those brief comments, I would, I would very much like to, to illustrate all of those things as, as I go through the, this morning, sorry, this afternoon. The, I'd just like very briefly to take you through some of the changes that have actually occurred in the economy over, over the last 10 or 20 years, and that is that I guess the, the Labor government has actually gone through the pain of throwing out unnecessary government controls on banks and on trade and on capital and on foreign exchange. And I guess they did straightjacket the economy for the last 10 or 20 years. The Labor government has also cut protection against imports, so our exports are proving to be actually cheaper and our home industries are actually forced to match some of the world's best. And I remember the member for Mayo making a comment this morning on, the, on that business of the of export markets, the, oh, sorry, export uh, the export economy in dollar terms, and that the figures certainly will indicate that we are exporting more, and the export economy is growing, and it's the changes that we're putting in place which will see that uh, grow even stronger in the next five to six years. But probably one of the most important things that the Labor government has done in the last 
five to six years is it has entrenched an accord with representatives of some four million wage earners so that industrial disputes no longer shut down our industries and wage increases no longer force businesses to actually fire workers. We have actually laboured, lowered taxes and we have actually targeted spending so that Australia now spends less on government than most other advanced industrial nations. And uh, We often hear probably more of the senators that seem to have time to get trumpeting around the, the nation through the states saying how much we, uh, <laughs> saying how much we uh, we are a high taxing nation and how the government is taking too much money, but that it's belied by the fact that the that we are a low taxing nation. I think we are not second of the OECD nations, and that's the money that the government has to spend. But more importantly, I feel that by working together Australians have created in this economy want some one and a half billion jobs in the eighties while reforming the economy and opening ourselves to more competition. The government expanded the size of the economy by nearly one third and we increased the average living standards of Australia by one tenth and finished the 80s exporting almost twice as much as we had at the beginning of the, beginning of the 80s. The, the government does not deny that there were some uh, useful lessons to be learned out of the 80s and uh, some of them from our successes and some of them I don't mind admitting from I probably have to say some of our failures. But from our successes, manufacturers have certainly learnt that they can put their products onto world markets and win sales. And I will give examples of that in my, in my own electorate uh, later on. Employees, employees and unions have certainly learnt that they can work together to change the tight old rules which hold back productivity and diminish the, the value of work. And by, I guess, learning that, we that we can work together, they can transform the workplace in, in a way that increases pay and profits and the, in the enjoyment of work. Um, from our failures, I think we could, we could say that uh, the lessons there are equally valuable and from some of them are old lessons and some of them are new. But we have been reminded that we can still be bumped around by changes in the price of our exports and our imports, and both of these beyond our control. We have certainly been reminded that our growth is to some extent influenced by the growth of our trading partners. and We need to take into account not only our opinions but the opinions of foreign leaders in that. Certainly the recession has set us back, but the government will not allow it to stop the clock. In particular in the last two years, Australia has lost some of those gains, probably about one-tenth from the 1980s. We have lost two out of every 17 jobs created in the 1980s and we lost one-fifth of the gains of the average income in that same period. The losses have been severe but we can recover by building on the strong foundations that we have laid down. And The recent One Nation statement has shown that over the next four years we will more than make up for those setbacks. We will create some 800,000 jobs, more than four times as many jobs that we have lost. At the end of the next four-year period the economy is projected to be some 10 per cent bigger than it was before the recession. We'll do it without losing the great gain of low inflation. And probably nothing saps the business confidence. Nothing could give the economy or business people a greater boost than to keep that inflation rate down low. And it's, it's an honest boost, not a, it's an honest boost to the economy. It's not a, an artificial boost by a transfer of taxes from one section of the economy to the other. The keys to the sustainable growth in the economy over the next four years will be workplace reform and the accord between the government and the trade unions will entrench inflation to a rate equal to or less than our trading partners. That is the economic imperative and we shouldn't lose sight of it. Certainly the introduction of a GST puts all those gains at risk and in actual fact sees them go out the door. The Keating statement is one of economic logic. It is a strategy of spending on substantial and necessary public investment now while private investment is weak and bringing the federal budget back into surplus when that private investment is strong. And the, the far-sighted, the, the projects that were, on, that were offered up in the, in the uh, One Nation statement are all about that. And so the government's economic strategy in the 90s is, to des is designed to actually maximise our strengths and remedy the weaknesses there. Let me also add that we're not throwing tradition away. We're not throwing those traditional little, uh, industries to the to the uh, to the wall. We will still remain an important producer of iron ore, coal, wool, beef, and other traditional commodities. And we have enormous potential in processing raw materials such as aluminium and food. 
We can export high quality services, which, as we are doing successfully, and with education as well. And our tourism potential is enormous, as the uh, shadow minister at the table will uh, no doubt agree. The Australia will still be a world leader in commodities by the year 2000. We retain a fundamental comparative advantage in those areas. It would be stupid to squander that, that advantage by not recognising it or by not exploiting it. The Keating's government's goal is an international competitive economy that continually strives for world best performance and an economy that provides equal opportunity for all. Mr Deputy Speaker, <coughs> there are a number of issues which I'd like to canvas in the, in the One Nation statement, which, which will go a long way towards providing uh, support for export industries and these government policies, I feel, need reiterating. The, the economy and business people certainly need, need educating on, the, on these. And I would like to commend the, an organisation in my electorate for doing their part on that, and that is the Moorlambar Business Enterprise Centre for what they've done in, in holding seminars to, for uh, some of the industries in my area, in the electorate, which have taken up the, the challenge and are looking to export and in some cases are already exporting uh, into Asia and providing uh, much needed export dollars. But some of the, the new initiatives we announced in the, in the 90s and, and have been built on by the Keating Statement are those that are helping business to invest. The, the recently announced Special Investment Allowance will help internationally competitive major projects to start in the near future, and that allowance will be available to benefit individual development projects worth some $50 million, worth more than $50 million. The pool development funds which were announced, these new pool development funds will improve the availability of capital for small and, be and uh, medium-sized Australian firms to develop their ideas into commercial products and processes. And the PDFs will also provide the opportunities for investors across the broad spectrum to actually participate in the development of Australian ideas <coughs> and thereby revitalising industry. The Australian Technology Group also announced in the, in the One Nation statement too, too few of our research success, successes, as everyone knows, have been kept in Australia. Too often they have been let, uh, let go. And to help us reap the commercial reward of these ideas, an Australian technology group will be especially created to bid for the rights to publicly funded research projects and to help them into business. And I commend the, the government for this, this particular project. Essentially, the ATG is, uh, is linked or aimed to link between good research ideas and good business. And it's in addition to the 125% uh, reduction for the cost of research and development, which is a permanent feature of the taxation system, by the way. To encourage new investment, uh, foreign investment guidelines will be streamlined somewhat, leading to a start of new projects, especially in the resource sector. And in particular, with helping large projects to get started, the environment heritage reviews, which are often involved in uh, big projects, will be simplified somewhat, though it does not mean that the Commonwealth and state reviews will lead to a, a single assessment for uh, big projects. Certainly the, the idea of the small unit to help people uh, go through the morass of paperwork which is involved, again, is, is another idea which will get projects started and, and get, him, get them moving. The member for Gippsland, amongst others, I think, uh, have commented on the, on the need for the, for the boost of the economy, and I did mention that probably the biggest thing was the maintenance of low inflation, which sees di investment directed into those particular, those particular industries which will return a steady and productive in, e income to Australia. Unlike the good old days of high inflation, the rip-roaring inflation, the new uh, investment in uh, quick returns, the quick buck, which sooner than build office blocks and uh, joint holiday towers not far from my electorate, all that sort of thing hopefully will, will uh, wash out of the system and we, as we mature and, uh, and move through the 90s into the 21st century. But the maintenance of low inflation is it's a fundamental economic requirement because it will encourage investment into, into productive industries. One has only to glance back, as I mentioned, at the 70s and the 80s to see where, the, where much of that investment went, went to. And I guess it, those businesses or buildings and enterprises which did benefit from that investment, I guess benefited from, benefited from support and misdirected investment as much as anything else. And I have used this description before, but I think the investors in, in that type of uh, industry, I feel, are somewhat shell-shocked, as they uh, may now be, 
but they can no longer re uh, they can no longer re um, rely on the quick return or, or marry their ta taxation investment um, portfolios to a quick return from in from inflation. They've now got to look for the steady, productive uh, enterprises in which to invest, and I believe it is the cautiousness of those businesses which has seen investment decline. And as soon as they are either re-educated or regain confidence, then we'll see an investment surge. I agree with the member for Gippsland on his comments that export uh, confidence is essential to uh, economic recovery. Uh, and, it's, and that is why we, triple, we have triple money available for, for performance bombs from some $50 million to $150 million. It will provide a form of uh, insurance for firms undertaking contract work overseas, and we'll do this by helping, the, helping them meet uh, performance bond requirements where banks are unwilling to actually advance bonds without some formal security. As well, there was an extra $18 million provided in the 90, for 92-93 under the Development Import Finance Facility, which will uh, enable Australian exporters to become more competitive. And in particular, the Austrade International Network will also be extending its program, and that's the, uh, <coughs> the Export Access Program, which is uh, proving to be so much of a benefit and a boost to industries right around Australia. And that, ex that uh, boost has been from $4 million to $12 million over, the, over four, three years, I should say, to assist those small to medium uh, businesses into the export market. Again, it's, it's an accepted fact on, I think on both sides of the House that it's the small to medium enterprises which have the vital role in actually improving Australia's export performance. They're the ones that are particularly well placed to contribute to new areas of export activity in the high value added ex, ex, uh, goods and services sector. In fact, I think it was back in the budget of 1991, if I recall, when the support for this particular program was first announced. And it's, I guess, specifically targeted those assisting the export and international businesses. But the funding increases there will boost participants to around some 700 for the life of the program, from the present around 200. We'll also see improved access to the program by businesses in all states and regions of Australia, and this will enable additional markets, particularly Asia, to be, marketed, to be targeted. And the Access Program provides participants with a comprehensive package of training and uh, practical uh, assistance in developing successful export activities, and includes such things as assistance with preparing an export plan, identifying potential overseas buyers, and preparing an, under an undertaking through an overseas uh, market visit. And I commend the, the Minister for the initiative and the work uh, that's been undertaken there. The, the supply bills themselves bring into this House, that have been brought into the House, uh, for the appropriation of uh, some $12 billion or more of money. And the, it's uh, an incredible amount of money, but I know it's to tide the, the government spending over from, uh, from July through to November 1992. It also takes into effect some of the extra initiatives that have been accounted for in the, uh, in the uh, One Nation Statement. In particular, I'd like to mention the employment, education and training portfolio and the extra money that's gone into there in the labour market programs, the $166 million, for the assistance to job seekers and industry flowing from initiatives previously announced in that 91-92 budget. In particular, the, <coughs> the labour market programs are proving most beneficial in my electorate. I would like to mention the, the Skillshares, Skillshare program itself, uh, targeted at the long-term unemployed. A tremendous assistance there. I've, only, I, I've been to Skillshares in Mullumbimby, I've been to Skillshares in Mwollombar and Ballina and Warren Bay, and the picking up, taking on people that have been unemployed for quite some time, they're getting success rates of around about 50 to 60 per cent. It probably doesn't sound a great deal, but when you consider the, the numbers that are going through the Skillshare and the fact that these people without this particular government assistance would, uh, would stay on the unemployment benefits. Um, I just only hope that the, the government, sorry, the opposition can change its mind about uh, dissolving Skillshare because it's, it's the, one of the, a great success in the sense that it does pick up those people that have been unemployed for quite some time and get them back into useful uh, productive employment. The, another aspect out of the, out of coming from these bills is the uh, is the uh, $73 million which is going to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Commission um, to assist with the Commonwealth employment uh, education training, particularly the Commonwealth development projects, 
the CEPs, they, they have been a great success also in, in my electorate or just out of my electorate where some of the people have gone to work. Again, a tremendous uh, benefit to, uh, to helping people's esteem and, and making them, uh, or helping them take, take a productive role in the, uh, in the economy, in the society, I should say, more to the point. The, with the minister at the table, I'd be remiss not to mention the, the, uh, the Minister for Veterans Affairs at the table. I'd be very remiss not to mention the, the, the calls of the, uh, the uh, veterans in my community, which have had uh, come to my office thanking him for the, for the changes that he's, he's put into the portfolio and allowing um, veterans to actually get uh, private hospital treatment and first-grade hospital treatment within the, within the community. Rather than have to travel all the way down to Sydney or Brisbane, they can stay with their family and get that assistance uh, in their local town. I uh, thank the Minister for myself for that. The other issue that I'd very likely uh, to, in the little time that I've got left, is the, is the uh, primary, and industry, primary industries and energy portfolio and the money that's gone into the infrastructure support there for the Rural Adjustment Scheme. The, the assistance, I think, is, is timely and I know it did uh, did come about as a result of, or not so much as a result of a lot of publicity, but did gain a lot of publicity at the time. But it certainly has been a, uh, well received. The other aspect of spending within the CSIRO and, and where they're helping my uh, my area. Order. The honourable member's time has expired. The question is that Thank the you. bill be read a second time. The honourable member for Parks. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, at the next federal election, uh, Australia is going to have a very clear choice between uh, the Labor government and between the coalition. I doubt if since Federation there has been such a clear choice between the uh, two major party groups. We will be presenting our GST fightback package, uh, offering an exciting vision for Australia, which has had a remarkable acceptance already within the community. On the other hand, it appears the government will be offering little more than their One Nation statement which I believe is their fourth statement they've made within a year. Uh, it indicates to me that they're becoming increasingly desperate and incapable of making any real changes that are needed to turn Australia around. They're only fiddling at the edges. I think the most extraordinary thing about the One Nation statement is that it was totally unfunded. There wasn't a cent of funding in it. And if you, uh, if you think the government had learnt anything uh, in recent times they would have learnt that you have to fund uh, uh, expenditure because that only blows out the current account deficit and uh, adds to our economic woes which have been foisted upon us uh, during the term of this government. We, have the, we will have uh, the leaders of the Liberal and National Party, uh, John Euston and Tim Fisher, showing character and strength against the leader of uh, the Labor Party, Paul Keating who seems to be shifting position uh, on many issues. Uh, he sh already shifted position uh, remarkably on Coronation Hill, uh, told a few fibs, if you like, apparently before the, uh, the, uh, the vote to depose uh, Bob Hawke. He told half the party that he'd support uh, the mining of Coronation Hill if they would uh, support him. Told the other half that uh, he, he wouldn't allow Coronation Hill to go ahead if they support him. Of course, they, uh, they voted for him in the majority, and uh, uh, he's, he's, let, uh, he's let half of them down. Uh, we've seen in recent days a 180-degree uh, shift on tariff protection, uh, which I'll talk about uh, later, but there was uh, one analysis in one of the newspapers this morning which said uh, if you paid every textile, clothing and footwear uh, person who loses the job $100,000, it would be cheaper for Australia to do that than to, uh, than to stall the program of reductions, as the uh, Prime Minister has announced in recent days, just so he can uh, gain some supposed kudos during the wills by-election. We have also had the Prime Minister misleading the Australian people on the economy uh, on numerous occasions. He's on the record of saying we, we would have no chance of a recession when he knew apparently from Treasury advice all along that that was to come. His track record, as far as results go, is uh, the worst of all time. I think uh, nothing epitomises this more than the overseas debt, uh, which in net terms has blown out from about $23 million when he assumed the Treasury benches in 1983. 
to a net debt today of $145 billion, a six-fold increase. What a shocking indictment it is on the policies that he's thrust upon Australia. And now, of course, he's telling us that uh, the recession is over. Well, uh, uh, if he would come out to country areas of New South Wales, certainly where I represent people, uh, they would tell him that uh, they're not in a recession that's over. They are in a depression which is worsening and will continue worsening, certainly in financial terms, probably for the next 12 months or so. It's interesting to look at some of the figures. Private sector investment, I note, for the December quarter was down to 5.5 per cent of GDP, which is the lowest uh, on record. Uh, and uh, on top of that, uh, we have the One Nation statement based on totally unrealistic assumptions of growth and productivity. No one believes uh, these assumptions, and uh, Senator Walsh himself has only confirmed that uh, over the last day or so, the government's previous uh, finance minister. The One Nation statement is little more nor less than a dash for growth policy, with a federal election looming in the next 12 months or so, if not sooner. And there are many dangers in such a policy. Uh, there are dangers that it could stimulate areas that won't be particularly useful to Australia in the situation we find ourselves in, uh, such as overstimulating housing. And uh, this dash for growth policy will have undoubted effects on the exchange rate and inflation. It will aggravate the current account deficit, the overseas debt, and that will lead to upward pressure on interest rates again. The bond markets themselves are already indicating this, and surely this is the last thing we need for Australia. But what is the Prime Minister doing about our economic situation? All he seems to do is shift ground further as uh, political pressure mounts in, in different areas. And the Wills by-election has been a classic example of this. We have had the unedifying spect spectacle of the Prime Minister preaching to this chamber the exact opposite to what he believes in. Uh, I mean, does anybody in this chamber really <coughs> believe uh, that uh, he, he uh, he thinks what he's saying is true on the shift on tariffs. Uh, we, of course, had this sh have had uh, similar shifts many times in the past. Uh, I don't think there's been any greater shift than the, uh, the shift he made when he supported GST back in 1985 to the shift today where he's supposedly opposing uh, a goods and services tax. And he has uh, dozens and dozens of quotes on the record uh, that he made back in 1985 when he was Australia's strongest advocate to it. I'd just like to, to quote uh, one in a speech he made to the National Press Club on the 5th of June 1985. And uh, I'll, I'll read some of these quotes in length because you'd probably think it was John Euston or Tim Fisher making some of these quotes. He says, there are three main advantages uh, for the consumption tax. First, it will allow a more rational indirect tax system than the current anomaly ridden wholesale tax, which has multiple rates, numerous exemptions, and fails to tax the services sector. <coughs> Second, it will enable us to generate tax revenues to provide for a major reduction in the marginal rates of income tax. No other tax has the same potential for this purpose. Third, it generates tax from those who will continue to evade or avoid income tax. That provides a useful net dividend for distribution to the rest of the community. And later in the speech he says, the virtually zero exemption single rate structure of the tax is a crucial design feature. It will assist both administration and compliance. And later on he says, for, for business this is a simple tax. They will also benefit from no longer carrying the cost of the wholesale tax which they pay and have to finance on their stocks. And later still, for too long the politically unpalatable decisions have been put off in this country because our politicians have not had the strength of purpose to tackle the hard issues. When it comes to the crunch, short-term political interests have always come first. But I think it is fair to say that, at least to some extent, the community as a whole has been prepared to let its politicians get away with that attitude. And lastly, the result has been across a whole range of areas that Australia's economic performance has been below par. The country has not been working to the peak of its achievable capacity because we, as a community, have not been prepared to let it do so. There is no more glaring example of this than our existing tax system. It is decrepit 
and in a state of virtual decay. Well, there it is, the Prime Minister of Australia talking about the need to adopt a goods and services tax back in 1985. John Newsom himself could not have said it better. But here we have another shift uh, in recent days on tariffs. Only a few months ago he was telling John Laws on, on radio of the necessity to cut tariffs, all tariffs, to zero per cent. And when we query him about that in the parliament, what does he say? Oh, oh that was only on radio. It, I was only using generic terms on a Jordan Laws radio. Uh, you can't, in effect, take a show like that seriously. You know, the fact that he was saying tariffs uh, has been saying throughout the, the, the decade of the 1980s that tariffs are poison, uh, and made many, many gung-ho statements to that effect. And then comes into the chamber and announces a totally 180 degree uh, shift in policy. I mean, he has lost his credibility in this parliament entirely. He's lost his respect. He's lost his dignity. And I say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this is a sad situation for Australia. His principles bend like a reed in the wind. If the political wind blows in one direction, he structures his rhetoric uh, for that. And uh, if it blows in another direction, he crafts his rhetoric for that situation. If you compare that with the previous Prime Minister, Bob Hawke, uh, I wasn't a great fan of his, I'm the first to admit, but uh, at least he commanded much more respect with the Australian people and a greater rapport and wouldn't have sunk to this sort of level. I believe the present Prime Minister's logic, uh, even in his shift on tariffs, is quite defective and inadequate. Now, if he wants to change his mind on tariffs, well, I think he should do so and come in, come in here and openly say so. Instead of inventing obviously false and concocted reasons uh, that he uh, expects us to swallow, I think it only makes him look foolish and demeans his position. And indeed, I believe it uh, reflects badly on all politicians. We're all dragged down by this type of operation. I mean, he comes in here and he says tariffs in one area are at 270 per cent, and we've reduced them to 15 to 25 per cent, and that's okay, that's beneficial, and I'd agree with that. But to reduce them from the 20 odd per cent down to zero is suddenly wrong. You know, to bring them from 270 down to, down to 20 is okay, but to bring them from 20 to zero is going to be disastrous. I mean, that is not only economically illiterate, it is mathematically illiterate. He, he also says that uh, if we keep these tariffs for these industries at 15 to 25 per cent, it's going to preserve these industries. You know. Well, you know, if it's going to preserve these industries, why, why have uh, companies like Nissan you know, suddenly closed their doors and gone back to Japan when they're holding a tariff much higher than this? You know? If a 20 per cent tariff is going to uh, keep these industries in Australia, why not double it to 40 or 50 per cent and keep a few more industries in Australia and start a few more up? You know, surely we've been down that path, that argument. And all of us seen how fallacious it is. And I believe the Prime Minister knows this. He knows this. And uh, why he doesn't uh, be honest with us is, uh, is quite beyond me. I mean, other factors are much more important as to whether an industry uh, stays in Australia or not. I mean, exchange rate shifts that we've seen many times over the last few years have a far greater effect on an, on an industry's profitability. And of course the industrial relations rigidities that we have in this country are far more important to industry's profitabilities. If, if the Prime Minister wants to do something genuine, genuine about keeping industries in Australia, he'll free up some of these rigidities. We've seen the classic example at Shepparton in Victoria with the SPC canning factory. I mean, there, because of these ridiculous industrial relations practices, they were going broke. There were bad management decisions as well. But what happened? The management went to the workers and said, you know, if we continue on this way, none of us will have a job with, uh, in a few months. And the workers, being common sense people that they are, uh, negotiated with the management and they came to a sensible enterprise agreement which would save that factory. John Halfpenny, bless his heart, heard about it watered down that agreement, but even with that watered down enterprise agreement, within a short few months, the productivity of that plant has been lifted 35 per cent and more. Uh, it is back in the black. It is distributing, as I understand, profits to workers, and uh, it has a future, which it had none 
of last year. That's the sort of thing that's got to be put in place if you want to, uh, if you want to keep industry in Australia, not shifting positions on tariffs as the Prime Minister has done. I mean, if we look at the uh, textile, clothing and footwear industries, there is in effect now a 40 per cent equivalent consumption tax on these industries because of tariff protection. Now, who's that hurting? Is it hurting Kerry Packer? Is it hurting uh, Bond uh, over in Perth? I, I think it's hurting the poor of Australia more uh, than it's hurting the rich, uh, the average man in the street, if you like. What are we going to do about this? Well, on the coalition side, we're going to remove these taxes. Customs duties will phase out by the end of the decade because we believe that the poor in this country are today paying more in tariff taxes than they are in income taxes, and that is totally inequitable. Uh, and these consumption taxes uh, that the uh, Prime Minister supports uh, only hurts exports. Uh, if, uh, if you've got tariff protection on your industry, it builds in inefficiencies, it uh, ultimately and inevitably raises your costs, and that means that uh, it puts you at a disadvantage on the world export uh, market where it's very competitive, and uh, of course that lowers your economy of scale. Uh, restrict your vision to the domestic market, which is quite small in Australia because of our low uh, population. As well as that, tariffs are inflationary because they, uh, they lift prices higher than they otherwise would be. That has an upward pressure on the exchange rate, which in itself is detrimental to exports in this country. And tariffs, uh, I think everybody admits, even the Prime Minister, lead to inefficiency, inefficiencies for Australia and a lower standard of living for us all. I mean, all tariffs do is shift jobs and resources from one industry to another, from one occupation to another, and from one region to another. And the export industries of this country, which we need so badly to turn the country round, are hurt the most because they ultimately carry the cost burden of, uh, of the high tariff protection. There is no net gain of jobs from tariff protection, but there is a net loss of wealth. It is clear from the debate about the mess that we are in and I believe that the government should adopt many of the coalition policies in this country. I've already mentioned uh, the need to uh, have a large shift on industrial relations. I believe the government should come out now and adopt the GST fightback package. They were virtually wanting it back in 1985. The, uh, the government's own Treasury analysis uh, tells us that. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would seek permission to incorporate uh, this table in, in Hansard from the uh, Treasury briefing papers. It's leave granted. Uh, subject to its suitability for publication, leave is granted. I thank the House. This, uh, this table clearly, uh, clearly indicates that uh, every sector almost uh, will benefit from the GST fightback package. Agriculture will benefit to the tune of $1,025 million. And that only takes into account the payroll tax, the excise uh, changes and the wholesale tax abolition. I mean, that works out at $160 per farmer per week just from taking in, in, uh, into account these things. I mean, our package uh, will even offer much more than that. Uh, mining benefits to the tune of $677 million, manufacturing $5,370 million, and the service industries, the big winner of all, $7,722 million benefit from adopting the uh, GST fightback package. The Treasury own, the Treasury's own figures, uh, the most illuminating document indeed. It's all about jobs, as the, uh, as the uh, Shadow Minister for Tourism says and knows only too well. I guess if we went out of this place and asked the Australian people what is wrong with the tax system today, uh, they'd say three things. They'd say the taxes in this country are too high, the taxation system in this country that we have is far too complex, and I have accountants in my electorate, uh, old accountants who are retiring prematurely because they themselves can't even understand the Tax Act, which is about three foot high now. 
And the other thing wrong with the tax system is the, uh, the tax mix is wrong. We pay far too many indirect taxes vis-a-vis -vis direct taxes, and that has to be changed. And the GST fightback package addresses all those things and corrects those things. I mean, if you take the wholesale sales tax system alone, we've got five scales in this country today. Five. We have zero taxes on some items, 10 per cent on others, 15 per cent on, on, uh, on passenger cars, 20 per cent on other items, and 30 per cent. And there's no rhyme nor reason or logic why, why one item is taxed at one level or exempted at another. All that's doing is distorting uh, consumption patterns and distorting investment patterns. And what we want to do is abolish all those scales and, and replace it with a flat one level tax right across the board, simple, visible, honest, uh, an open system. Of course, to collect the same amount of money from abolishing our sales tax, we would bring that level in at 7 per cent. But we intend to bring the level in at a higher level, 15 per cent, so that we can do other things, so that we can simplify the system even more and change the tax mix even more. And uh, by doing this, we are able to uh, abolish seven taxes in total, sales tax, uh, fuel excise, uh, payroll tax. Um, uh, customs duties and so on, as well as uh, lowering other taxes such as fringe benefits tax and making the greatest slash in income tax in this country's history uh, by 30 per cent. We have compensation measures uh, in place uh, for pensioners and families and uh, we are lifting $20,000 million of taxes off the back of business and that will be the greatest kickstart to jobs in Australia today. The GST fightback package offers a vision for Australia. It's a bold initiative. It's something that's well overdue to be done. And uh, because of its simplicity and because it gets incentive back into the system and because it rewards production, it will be the greatest thing that Order. this country has ever seen. The honourable member's time has expired. It being 12.45 p.m., the debate is interrupted in accordance with Sessional Order 101A. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. The chair will be resumed at 2 p.m. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the National Party. Mr. Speaker, my question without notice is directed to the Prime Minister. Why did the Prime Minister claim yesterday in Parliament that he had done no deals on Coronation Hill when the member for Kalgoorlie has stated, and I quote, what he, Mr. Keating, said was that his preferred option was option B, to allow mining, and that if it was in his power, that is what he would go for? Who is misleading the Australian people, the member for Kalgoorlie or the Prime Minister? And why won't the Prime Minister get on with facilitating the mine 
which would provide some 630 jobs. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Uh, that, that quotation uh, from Mr Campbell is cons totally consistent with what, what I said yesterday and what he has reported or said yesterday. Yes. The Honourable Member for Perth. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is directed to the Treasurer. And I ask the Treasurer, has the Treasurer seen the February balance of payments figures published today by the Australian Bureau of Statistics? And is the February balance on current account consistent with, with the budget time estimates? The Honourable the Treasurer. Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for uh, Perth for his uh, question. And I think uh, he draws, us, uh, draws our attention to what uh, all Australians are entitled to believe is uh, very good news for the economy. Of course, one has to be somewhat circumspect about uh, relying entirely on one month's figures, but now we are so far into the year that we are, un we are now able to make, I think, fairly confident predictions about the uh, reliability of the estimates that were made at the time of the budget last year, when uh, it was uh, forecast that there would be a current account deficit of $14 billion and there would be a surplus in the balance on goods and services for the first time since 1979-1980. And on the basis of the figures that have been released uh, today, Mr Speaker, I think we are uh, entitled to be confident that we will meet both of those uh, forecasts. It's uh, in the area of the goods and services balance that there has been a dramatic turnaround in Australia's performance over the last year, and I think uh, all of us on this side of the House at least are very gratified about that performance, even if the, uh, the prospect of good news sends, um, sends long faces onto the visages of those uh, opposite, because of course they have, uh, they have uh, they have always been wanting to predict more doom and gloom for Australia, and every time there's some, uh, every time some statistics come in which, uh, which confound them, then of course uh, they are sent into a mood of depression. But um, in the first eight months of the present financial year, the goods and services balance has recorded a surplus of $1.2 billion. And uh, of course, the uh, co constant refrain from those opposite, of course, well, what would you expect in, uh, in, at the time of a recession? And what, of course, they mean by that is that uh, imports would uh, go down in the context of a recession. But what we have actually seen, the real reason why these figures are better, is uh, because of the strong growth in exports. Exports up by nearly 10 per cent. And uh, therefore, you can now, I think, confidently say that this is not a better trade performance because of the recession, but rather because of the structural improvement which is occurring in the economy, the kind of structural improvement which I referred to yesterday and before in terms of the better export performance of our manufacturing uh, industries uh, particularly. Mr. Mr Speaker, I think um, we only need to remind ourselves of the dramatic improvement that we have seen in terms of uh, manufactured exports, uh, up 111 per cent in our last five years, compared with 47 per cent in the last five years of the Fraser government. And if we look at the area of sophisticated manufacturers, we find the comparison even more stark, where in our last five years we find export growth of 145 per cent compared to just 47 per cent in the last uh, five years of Fraser. And in this context, it is even more astonishing that we should have from the, uh, the Honourable Member for Barker, the uh, Shadow Minister for Industry, indicating that he is about to scuttle those programs which have been so important in encouraging an improved export performance. What he has said, what he has said in this parliament is that uh, over the years ahead, if he had a chance, he would actually demolish see, the export programs which have been so important in terms of turning Australia's export performance round. Austrade would be scuttled, the export market development program would be scuttled, DIFF would go, EFIC would be scuttled, and so it goes. And yet these are just the programs valued at something like value. Oh well, of course you, of course you have. Hardly a day, hardly a, hardly a day goes by. Oh, listen. If the member for Mayo interjects again, I'll name him. Listen to little Bo Peep over here. Little Bo Peep has been saying 
on a order. daily basis. On a daily basis. Order. The minister will refer to the member by his title. Oh, the member for Mayo. Everyone knows who I'm talking about. I think. The uh, the uh, the uh, every order. There's no on a daily basis, he has an unrelenting, savage attack on uh, Austrade, which of course uh, has been through an important. Uh, transformation in terms of its uh, structure and in terms of its uh, performance. But of course, once again, we find shadow minister after shadow minister just trying to drag down the institutions, public and private, of Australia, which in their own way are making an Relates important contribution order, the to the country. Relates to standing order 145, the question from the member from Perth was very specific. It related to budget expectations and figures that have just recently been released. The minister is not addressing that issue at all, Mr. Speaker, and I'd ask you Order. to get him to either get back to the question Order. or resume his seat. Order. The minister is answering the question. The minister will come back. The minister has completed his answer. The honourable member for Mayor. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker. I'm glad to hear the treasurer supports Austrade rorts. By the, the way, for Mayor my question is directed. Question. My question is directed to the uh, prime Order. minister. The minister on, on a point of order. Of the kind. And it's just, just again, or, Mr. Speaker, on the point of order. It is just a. It is just the point order. of order is this: that you, that you, order. that order. Mr. Minister Mr. Speaker, the point of order. Mr. Speaker, order. the House will come to order. The Minister will get to the point of order. The, the appalling performance of the Leader of the Opposition is now Order. being emulated the minister, the minister might where, they, to his point. where they come to the dispatch box not to ask a question at all, but to make some, 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 Order. some Order. attack. I thought you were going to speak, Mr Speaker. They come to the dispatch box not to ask a question at all. Order. But but the, minute, make... the minister is taking a point of order. Members on my left will cease in a check. The Honourable Minister, but to make to some scurrilous accusation of the kind which the member for Mayo just made, he should be required Order. to withdraw. Order. The, the Minister has found the remark that was made to be offensive. I asked the member for Mayo to withdraw it. Uh, I withdraw, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I address my question to the Prime Minister. Is the government's new protectionism set in cement to the year 2000 and beyond, as you stated? in Parliament last week? Or will tariff levels be, quote, matters for assessment when the current tariff program has co been completed, as stated by Senator Button? Did Senator Button accidentally confuse the post-wills policy with the Prime Minister's wills by-election protectionist policy rhetoric? And did the Prime Minister say he meant what he meant last week or merely mean what he said? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. A week ago, the opposition said that I was supposed to have a private agenda to reduce all protection to zero by the year 2000. That is untrue. That was untrue. That's the simple point. That was untrue. The Order. government's position on tariffs is totally clear. Totally clear. The government, the government has fixed the current phase down to end at 25, 15, and 5 and zero, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, I might also while I've got the opportunity, on this, in relation to this same issue, quote uh, Michael Stutchbury from today's Financial Review. He said, oh, there's a good source, says the Leader of the Opposition. He doesn't like Stutchbury, he's too analytical for him. <laughs> in contrast, uh, he said, Mr Speaker, in contrast, the last car plan, the last car plan announced by the Fraser government envisaged a 125 per cent tariff on imported cars by 1992. He says, yes, now, compared to the current 35 per cent under Keating and John Button. As a result, a new car now costs about 20000 rather than perhaps 30000 as, as a result of these changes. Having broken the back of protectionism, Keating has galled to see Hewson claim the high ground by promising neg negligible protection by the year 2000. Well, I'm not galled, Mr Speaker, but I, I have remarked on the, on the arid opportunism of it, on the grant opportunism of it. Having Order. broken the back of protectionism, which is a correct description of the government's work, the cheap one-upping to go to zero without any effort, 
After seven years of advising a Member government and Moore. never once advising it to reduce protection and never seeking to have the Treasurer of the day reduce protection, to talk about a zero level is just what it is, looks like what it is, cheap one-up, one-upmanship. And he went on to say this. There must be major doubts over whether a Houston government would have the political nerve to follow through with a 5 per cent tariff for the highly protected car and TCF sectors. And he went on to say, but Keating is justified in pointing out the areas of disagreement by not overdoing the pace of structural adjustment imposed upon the heavily protected car and TCF industries and electorates such as Wills. The March 1991 program raises the chance that the wider dismantling of protection will stick politically. And that's exactly right, Mr Speaker. That is, the government's taken from 1988 to the end of the century to phase down industrial protection and at the same time give the car industry uh, also incentives to export, at the same time picked up adjustment programs in TCF to give them a chance to adjust so that the reforms will stick. But none of that conscientious, close judgment, looking at issues, seeing how industries can survive, watching them rationalise, was ever contemplated by the opposition. No, what they said is, oh, we'll have zero. We'll have, uh, oh, they're now, now they're running back from that, saying they'll have negligible levels. Negligible levels. Negligible levels. In other words, instead of saying, Mr Speaker, we'll adopt, we'll adopt the government's policy, it's obviously they're the only people who have been able to break the tariff wall down. They're going to take it to very low levels by 1997 and 2000. We'll go there and we'll take our chance then, the option to review the tariffs beyond that time. No, no, none of that. Just cheap one up and ship. We'll go to zero. We'll go to negligible levels. Well, Mr. Mr. Stutfrey makes it quite clear, quite clear where that sort of policy would lead. The honourable the member for Mayo will cease interjecting. The honourable member for Canning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is directed to the Prime Minister. Will the government be advising the statistician to reweight the ABS household expenditure survey? in the light of reports that representative households have now changed their consumption habits? The Honourable the Prime Minister. So that question is no, we won't be, notwithstanding the fact that we're now seeing many and varied uh, uh, descriptions of what constitutes household expenditure, uh, which varies, at, varies obviously and is at odds with uh, the official collections and the official data. And uh, we've seen no greater example of that, Mr Speaker, than uh, that, uh, the attempt by, uh, by people to establish a survey by the Foodlink Group Limited, independent food retailers, as being a representative basket of Australian goods. Now, Mr. Speaker, we've heard a lot of, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, claims and counterclaims in this house. Yesterday, we saw the leader of the opposition whip himself into a frenzy and move a frivolous censure motion, talking about deceit, talking about deceit, but. Uh, but today, but, but Mr. Speaker, but, but there is no end to where the leader of the opposition duplicity begins or ends in relation to this question. And as uh, Mr. Seckham and the Sydney Morning Herald pointed out today, he said he tried to pull a swifty with his grocery bas basket. And uh, what we found is that the Foodlink Group issued a press statement yesterday, saying, "At no time was it stated by Foodlink that this was a total of food purchase for a family for two weeks." At no stage did we say this was representative of a food basket. Now, Mr. Speaker, no, no. I tell you, I tell you what the leader of the opposition Order. said. What he said was, he called it a representative basket of groceries. That's what he called it, a representative basket of groceries, knowing, of course, that people would quite reasonably infer that such a basket would be certain to contain the food they needed to feed themselves and their families. Mr Speaker, in other words, what the, what the Leader of the Opposition did was embrace this basket as though it was a basket of household groceries. He actually identi identified himself with, it with, a t with, a, with a TV appearance, appearance for the cameras with the Food Link manager, and then published a statement saying another, another Labor lie exposed when people dare criticise the composition of this basket. And what we find is that he hides behind, head behind the words a representative basket of groceries which have now been exposed as, as uh, not including food. No stage we say a representative of food. What Foodlink said, it was a $150 basket of goods purchased at a supermarket from our statistical data. That's all. That's all. 
Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Second said today, if, if he'll play fast and loose on something so basic as food, the suspicion in the public mind must be that he could equally have done uh, that, that he could equally have done it in those more uh, arcane areas. In other words, Mr. Speaker, if for his for grubby political purposes, well, deceit does. Deceit gets up my nose. Here he is. He's in the house talking. Here he is, Mr. Speaker. He's up moving censure motions about deceit. He's up accusing the government of all sorts of things. And what's he done in something as serious? As the introduction of a goods and services tax on foods, he has been part of a, of a callous misrepresentation of that basket, which has now been exposed by the Foodlink Group. He was out there trying to suggest to people that their food will only go up by 4.8 per cent when the Treasury indicated that the balance of his policies would take it up by nearly 10, by nearly 10 per cent. So, Mr. Speaker, there's no end to the duplicity of the Leader of the Opposition. There's no no low trick he will not stoop to. No low trick he will not stoop to to mislead the Australian public. To mislead the Australian public about, uh, about his policies. So he gets this food link group to produce a basket of goods which have got, as the, as the Minister for Community Service and Health said yesterday, order, pet food, order, the member detergents. For Mr. Speaker, order. sit down. Order the member for Menzies. Well, I'm right, Mr. Speaker. The member, the member for Menzies right. and members of he is right. Yes, he's on a point of order. Order. The member for Menzies and members on both sides will only get get the call, and then then they can take a point of order if they wish to take a point of order. The the, the member for Menzies, who is a new member, might realise and realise now that those sort of actions that he's just indulged in will not be tolerated by the chair. The Honourable Member for Menzies. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I was trying to raise on a point of order. My point is, understanding Order 145, when the Prime Minister is asked a question about the official collection of data by the ABS, which he answered in the first sentence, how anything he's now saying can be relevant to that question. Order. The, the, the Prime Minister was asked a question about the ABS survey and he's saying why he won't be including such things in the ABS survey. Now, None Mr. of all the Prime Minister's in order. That's right, Mr Speaker. And if the ABS were to actually change their household expenditure surveys and their data and conclusions on the basis of a, rep, of, of a sample of groceries are so unrepresentative as this one, then, uh, then uh, of course we'd have no sensible data on which government policies, on which government policy be formed. Now, Mr. Order. Speaker, I've never known, Mr. Speaker, the leader a leader of a major political party. Now we can all have arguments about public, public issues and public affairs. I have never known a leader of a major political party to arrange a television appearance with a group like this to arrange for what he, uh, identification of what he called of what he called of what he called a, uh, a representative basket Order. of groceries, knowing knowing that I he was he, that he was in fact completing a deception of the Australian people, knowing that on the basis of a set of policies for which he hopes to form a government that he would go and maliciously misrepresent those policies as having only a benign effect on prices for a sample of groceries he knew to be totally unrepresentative. I have never known a leader of a major party to stoop to that kind of duplicity. Never. Never. Now, Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker the government is, not, the government is not about wasting the time of the House, but that does deserve a censure. It does deserve a censure of him, and the government could just as well if it, wanted to, uh, if it wanted to use the forms of the House, suspend question time and censure the Leader of the Opposition for this behaviour. Because it's behaviour, if you will, order. if you will, will come to order. if you will deceive, if you will order. deceive the House will Mr. Speaker. Order. The House will come to order. Order. Mr Speaker, if you remember for foul of if, if, if he will cheat the public on a order. matter like this, he will cheat them on a something which is far more substantial and arcane. And arcane. Mr Speaker, on a point of order, order the, the honourable member the honourable oppose, member for Hume. The, the opposition won't oppose the moving of such a The Honourable yeah. Member for Hume will resume his seat. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, Mr order. Speaker, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker. Food, the food link order. company has turned the opposition leader into a cheat, a fraud, a cheat and a fraud. Order. Order. Mr. Speaker, order. The I, Prime Minister I, I ask you to moment. ask the Prime Minister to withdraw those remarks. Of the press statement by 
That's a fraudulent, that was a fraudulent exercise. Order, order. And order. to what depths will the Leader of the order. Opposition sink? If the Prime Minister said the matter was a fraud, fraud has been used frequently. Right. Order, order. The House will come to order. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will cease interjecting. Members, members on my right and my left might cease interjecting. If the Prime Minister used the word fraud, fraud is in order. If the Prime Minister used another word that might not be in order, he should withdraw. But, but order! That if members on my left continue to interject, it is very difficult to hear anybody. The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the government Order. is watching now every single thing this man says. <coughs> Order. The Honourable Member you, for Order. You. The Member for Hume will resume his seat. Mr. Speaker, the member for on, on the, thank you. On the point of order, earlier today you told the member for Mayo that if the minister, the treasurer, was offended by a remark, he should withdraw. That was your ruling, and I ask you to apply it again. The people on this side are clearly offended by the prime minister's remarks. You've asked him to withdraw. He should order, do you at least that courtesy. Order, order. With all the noise, with all the noise. The chair never heard. Order! Order! If the member for Gippsland interjects again, I'll name him. With all the noise, the chair never heard the remarks, and it would help the chair if members on my left would cease catcalling, and then the chair can hear what is said by members on both sides. The Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, I'll conclude on this point. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that's not good enough. This is a day. Order! Order! This is a day this, order, is a day, this is a day when a point of order. This, this is a day when apparently anything goes if it comes the to member the government. For Hume will resume I his ask seat. that you require the prime minister to withdraw and apologise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Order, order. I have said on three occasions now that I did not hear the words that the prime minister said. If and 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 if it does not matter how much members yell, that will make it just even harder. The Honourable the Prime Minister. I conclude on this point, and that is that no point of order by the point of by order. The order. <laughs> you, you have, the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, you have been told that the Prime Minister used offensive language. You, at the very least, should ask him whether he did, and then require him order. to withdraw. Order. I, I did just that. I said to the Prime Minister, the, it was said that the Prime Minister used the word fraud. I said fraud. Order. Order. I said that fraud was not unparliamentary. I said if the Prime Minister had used other words that were, he should withdraw them. The Prime Minister said he hadn't, and he continued. Now, that's the end of it. And if members on my left cease interjecting... <laughs> members on my left will cease interjecting. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the, Order. the, the opposition should ponder what Order. it's like being led by such a Order. deceiver, Mr. Mr. such a deceiver. Mr. Speaker, Mr. The Speaker. Mem members on my left will cease it, Chief. Mr. Speaker, you have the, the member for Hume does not have the call. The honourable member for Hume, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, you have the responsibility to uphold the dignity of this house. You repeatedly, for you, you repeatedly recall, call on other members of the house on both sides to withdraw language which is unparliamentary. The Prime Minister used a word that is unparliamentary and offensive to all of us on the opposition benches, and I ask that you require him to withdraw. Order. Well, the Honourable Member for Hume, I have now told three times. Three times. Order. And I, I asked the Prime Minister did he use language that was unparliamentary. The Prime Minister said he didn't, and he continued. Now, now if If members on my left continue to interject, then one can't hear anything. Now, if members on my left ceased interjecting, it would make the whole process easier. The Honourable Prime Minister. I'll complete the answer on this and say no, no, no amount of process, points of order, will protect the Leader of the Opposition from such a serious and malicious duplicity and deception of the Australian people. The, the Honourable Member for McKellar on a point, uh, point of Mr. order. Mr Speaker, uh, with regard to what the Prime Minister said when he called the Leader of the Opposition a fraud and a cheat, I am about the same distance away as you are. I distinctly heard the word cheat. I believe that that is totally unparliamentary and a reflection on the Leader of the Opposition and should be withdrawn. Yeah.
The, we have got to the stage where this is passed on. Is there, are there any further questions? The Honourable Deputy Leader of the, of the National Party. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Is it a fact that the ex-Labor Premier of Tasmania, Mr Michael Field, gave evidence to a Senate committee yesterday about the government's resource security legislation, and I quote, what I see is that the left of the Labor Party has grave, grave reservations about the principle of resource security, and there are some in the right who think that it would be politically expedient if it did not succeed, end of quote. When will the Prime Minister show some leadership over his factions and resolve this issue by accepting the opposition's amendments, which are fully supported by the forest industry and unions, and which would protect 80,000 jobs. The Honourable Mr. Prime Minister. Speaker, the Tasmanian, existing Tasmanian pre Premier has condemned the opposition parties for not supporting the government's bill. For not supporting the government's bill. The, government's, the government has introduced, introduced legislation providing resource security, uh, resource Order. security legislation, which will apply, in amongst other places, to, the, to a, uh, a pulp mill development in Tasmania. Uh, a development on which the existing, uh, the present uh, Tasmanian Premier campaigned, and it is a matter of astonishment to the Premier that his coalition partners will not support the legislation. Will not support the legislation. The point of order. The point of order is that I asked a specific question in relation to what Michael order. Field said. Order. Order. The honourable deputy leader resume his seat. The Prime Minister. Uh, Michael Field also asked me to continue to support the legislation when he was Premier, and I did. I gave him that undertaking. I said we'd present it to the Senate and we'd leave it, uh, leave it there for the Senate to pass the legislation and that uh, we would see uh, this uh, legislation, this generic legislation, come into place. Now, the fact is, Mr Speaker, for specious political reasons, the opposition have decided now to move a set of amendments to it, and if the government doesn't accept their amendments, the fault lies with us. The fact is, we put the legislation up. Order. Your Premier is asking you to carry it. And again, for lousy political reasons, you're not doing it. And you've got a terrible gall to get up and ask us a question, ask me a question, about wh whether why we ought to accommodate your amendments, where in, fact, where in fact the bill is entirely reasonable. You should vote for it. And all you're doing is voting against development. The coalition's simply voting against development in the Senate. You're voting against Tasmania. You're voting against the Tasmanian Premier. You're voting against Tasmanian development. You're voting against development of forest industries in this country for shabby political reasons. The honourable member for Lilly. Speaker, I direct my question to the Minister for Social Security. Has the Minister's attention been drawn to criticisms of major banks and financial institutions in the Australian Pensioners and Superannuants Federation report, Older People and Their Banks. If so, what action will you take, Minister, in response to the findings of this report? The Honourable Minister for Social Security. Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for her question. and uh, I am aware of the report, uh, Older People and Their Banks. Uh, and, uh, I recognise that uh, while I don't agree with uh, all of the substance of that report, it does reflect a very real concern amongst uh, older Australians, particularly pensioners, uh, with uh, the services they're receiving from the major banks. The report did find that uh, many pensioners were foregoing considerable income because the savings uh, accounts in which they had their monies were paying less than the maximum rates of interest. Moreover. The report points out uh, that uh, while these things have to be set against risk, against convenience and availability of services, it still does appear that many pensioners are getting less than they could get from other similar secure financial institutions. And the report made a plea for the institutions to make publications to pensioners and older people easier to understand, so that the account uh, charges the conditions and rates of interest would be fully understood by existing and potential, potential older customers. And this, I would have thought, is simply a prerequisite for an efficient, competitive uh, market offering good services at reasonable cost. The report makes clear that the pensioners uh, don't want fancy images and glossy, bro glossy brochures, what they, or peppered with terms which often they can't understand. What they want is simple, straightforward information provided by polite, sympathetic and helpful staff. The report also goes on to criticise some of the fee structures 
especially for customers who make uh, frequent small, who have frequent small transactions with their banks. Now, it is clear, I think, from this report, from all those who are sufficiently interested to have read the views of the pensioners in this report, that the financial sector is under some challenge to improve its services, and I think in some cases to improve the perception of those services amongst uh, older Australians. And as a result, I took these concerns to the executives of the, the chief executives of each of the major trading banks last week in a series of conversations with them Member and asked Connor. them to re review their services to older Australians to see if they could uh, provide a better deal for senior citizens. I urged the banks uh, to become more pensioner friendly in their provisions, in the design of their accounts, uh, in their publications, in the rates offered and the charges made. And I put the proposals to each of the executives suggesting the possibility of uh, dedicated services for pensioners through the banks for cooperative development both with the pensioner organisations and with my own department in the provision of information and for wider consultation between the individual banks and the pensioner community. I've got to say that uh, while the banks pointed out they needed time to consider these proposals, I very much welcome their very positive response uh, to these ideas, their very genuine commitment to developing better services for their pensioner clients, and I look forward very much to receiving their responses prior to Easter. But certainly, the result of these conversa conversations with the leading executive in the banks does encourage me very much to believe that some uh, very worthwhile initiatives will emerge uh, from the banks to meet the particular needs reflected in the report mentioned by the Honourable Member for Lilly uh, to improve uh, their services uh, to what is a very valued group of their clients. The Honourable Member for Hawker. My question without notice is to the Minister assisting the Prime Minister on the status of women. Would the Minister inform the House why Australian women including those on low incomes should pay $18.50 for a bra with tariff protection, which would only cost about $12 without tariffs, $90 for a knitted jumper with protection, when she would pay about $50 without tariff Order. protection, and $30 for a knitted shirt with protection, for which she would pay only about $18 without tariff protection. Can the minister also inform the House why tariff protection on textiles, clothing and footwear has been found to be so regressive by the Industry Commission. The Honourable Minister. Order. For women in the industry under you, uh, Mr Speaker. Order. Oh, come on. Oh, oh, the Honourable Minister has the call. <laughs> Women in the industry under you are going to be paying a GST of 15 per cent on everything they buy. Women in the industry under you are not going to be employed in the jobs that they would have today. Women in the industry Order. Women in the industries, women in Australia are not going to have childcare so that they can be in the jobs that they have today. Order. Women in, the House women, will come to order. Women in the industry are going to have families that are not going to be able to access childcare. Women in industry... Okay. Order. Members on my left will cease interjecting. Mr Speaker, on a point of order. The Minister might resume her seat for a moment. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member for Menzies on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, could you explain to the House how um, the answer being provided by the Minister is in any way relevant to the question which was asked or by the Order. Order. There is far too much interjection. The Minister was asked a question. The Minister will answer the question. Order. The Honourable Minister. Let me tell you what's going to happen to women who are in employment under the program that you propose for this country. The, Order. the question will be answered in the process of me doing that. Women who have jobs today under 
under your programs will not have the jobs will not have jobs when you are the member for La Trobe on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I fail to see any relevance of the answer of this minister to the question that was asked. The order. minister continues to refer order. There is to what no... will be. How about what's now? Order. There is no point of order. The honourable minister, the leader of the house, on the Second point of order. Point of order. Order. Point of... order. Order. Mr. Speaker, the the question directed at the. Uh, the minister dealt directly with the issues related to tariff and other imposts on industry and the position of which women will find themselves financially. Order. Order. The point members of order on, is minister, this. The minister might resume his seat for a moment. Members on my left will cease interjecting. The honourable minister on the point of order. The point of order is this. That we have now had two points of order against a clearly in order answer, the second following a specific ruling by yourself. And I would ask you to consider that this, particularly the second of those points of order is disruptive. The, the honourable minister. Does the member for Hume have a further point of order? The honourable minister. Order. Women. The honourable minister. Yeah. Yeah. One of the interesting things in all the years that I have been in this house. You have never asked a question until approximately two weeks ago about issues which relate to women. Never have you, never have you, never have you considered in any of your policies or any of, of your any of your policies prior to elections or at any Remember other time concerned yourself about 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 women. When you were preparing your fight back package and when you went out there and did your advertising and when the, when the material went into the bulletin, not once did you mention the whole issue of women. When you brought down your fight back package here, yet it is not wrong. When you Order. brought back down your fight the back package here, you made references in, a, in, in all of those 700 pages, you made references in about five areas alone uh, relating to women. Yes, you did. Women. Order. Women in, wills, women in wills to get work are not going to have work under zero tariff. They are not going to have any jobs under zero tariffs. If they, if they work in any industries at all, you are going to destroy their childcare that is going to enable them to go to work. You are going to, enable, you are going to destroy any opportunities of childcare when they, when they go to work. Order. In the whole area of enterprise bargaining, you are going, you are going when they are in the workforce, and your spokesman, your spokesperson the the says, Party. you're going to enable women to negotiate the, for themselves the packages which suit them personally and give them better opportunities for care for the elderly as well as for their children. You are going to attempt to destroy the unions. You are going to. You are going to attempt to order. The minister will resume her seat. The honourable leader, Mr. Member for Hume. Speaker, on a point of order. Whilst the answer that's been given by the minister is entertaining, it doesn't go to order. the substance of the question. Would order. You, the would, member for would, Hume will resume his seat. Would you ask the minister to answer the question? The member for Hume will resume his seat. The minister is answering the question. The honourable minister. Members on my left will cease interjecting. I warn the member for O'Connor. The honourable minister. The women and I warn in the member for Hume for, for uh, Lowe. Order. Women Order. The honourable member for Lowe, who, who 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 is the architect for the for the health care program under the Fight Back program, is going to it, is, is going to impose on women in this country and their families a far greater cost when they access medical care than they did before. Oh yes, it is. You are going to, you are going to increase Order. the cost of Medicare. You are going to increase the cost of food in the homes. You are going to co increase the cost of the member for low if they again, can access it. You are going to attempt to destroy the protection that women in the workforce today have. And, and you are also going with your with your tariff policy, with your tariff policy, to to destroy the industries that employ many women today, many women, migrant women and other women. And it is your policies that are going to result in those women and their families being seriously affected 
seriously affected. So not only will they not be paying more for their bras, they won't be buying bras because they won't be able to afford to under your order. It was you who order the childish heckling on my left will cease. Order. Your, your policies under fight back are going, are going to be detrimental on families of this country. Your policies I under, the under fight back are going to mean that, that women have less, less opportunity in the workforce, le less opportunity to enter the workforce and less opportunity to care for their families and for themselves. The Honourable Member for Robertson. Order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health, Housing and Community Services. And I ask the Minister, can the Minister inform the House Order. of the Government's approach regarding the size and location of public hospitals in metropolitan areas? Is the Minister aware of alternate responses to this issue? The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in reply to the Honourable Member for Robertson's uh, question, issues paper uh, number two of the National Health Strategy does provide uh, a comprehensive analysis of access and financing of uh, public hospitals in Australia. Its key findings are that Australia needs no more hospital beds, that we have far too many beds in our inner suburbs and have too few in outer urban areas. A good example is a comparison of Sydney's inner west and growth uh, corridors such as that uh, represented by the Honourable Member for Robertson's electorate in the Gosford Wyong area or in the South West. Indeed, everyone involved in healthcare planning understands that we should aim to match uh, hospital resources with the needs of people who live near them. We will therefore ensure the core reforms in the National Health uh, Strategy Hospitals paper to ensure better quality and more secure health care. We are also in the process uh, Mr. Speaker, of negotiating the integration of uh, the uh, Concord Repatriation General Hospital into the New South Wales hospital system. This will enable a redirection of resources to Sydney's South West, where they're critically needed. I've noted uh, with some interest, uh, Mr. Speaker, that the Honourable Member for Lowe seems to have a somewhat different attitude, uh, even a cavalier attitude, to the allocation of hospital resources. A recent uh, article which uh, may have uh, escaped some members' attention but certainly didn't escape mine, uh, appeared in the Des Moines Five Dock and District News. And uh, I have a copy uh, here. Uh, it's got a photograph of the uh, Concord uh, complex, a very large uh, uh, high-tech uh, hospital complex, very late, uh, very, uh, very well equipped in terms of uh, capital expenditure. The article that I uh, refer to, uh, Mr Speaker, is headed uh, uh, High Tech Health. And there's a quotation here, we must have new hospital, says Woods. Sin Sydney's inner west must have a new high tech hospital to cope with the health demands of the coming decades, used not to replace existing hospitals but to integrate present services into a strong feeder system. This is the basis of a major campaign by a federal shadow minister for health and federal MP for Lowe, Mr Bob Woods, a leading doctor in his own right. He gave details in an exclusive interview with the District News. Dr Woods believes that the federal government can easily find between $60 million and $100 million the price of the Sydney Opera House nearly 20 years ago to build a new hospital. This, uh, the honourable member for Lowe, says is peanuts. <laughs> The fact that the hospital would uh, be built uh, in his own electorate, uh, I think, gives us some insight uh, into the motives uh, of the honourable member for Lowe. The inner west of uh, Sydney, as I think almost everyone knows, doesn't need a new hospital. A fact clearly recognised by the New South Wales government and all others involved in the delivery of health services to the region. Indeed, it would seem that the member for Lowe is preoccupied with his own electorate at the expense of the broader needs of people in, for example, Sydney's West. Mr Speaker, what an incredible example of pork barrelling. What a blatant example of pandering to special interest. The member uh, also, it might be said, displays a novel attitude to spending. 
public money, the 60, the 60 million to 100 million he estimates is needed, is, in his words, peanuts. The price of the Sydney Opera House, he says. Does this mean that all health expenditure decisions we base on whether the cost is more or less than the Sydney Opera House? Or perhaps will health be financed by a lottery? I should also point out that the honourable member is hopelessly ignorant of the true costs of building his hospital. The latest high-tech hospital to be built in New South Wales was the John Hunter in Newcastle, which cost $250 million. The operating cost for this hospital last year was $34 million, certainly a lot more than peanuts. The member for Lowe's attitude is even more remarkable when one considers the opposition's health policy under which hospital funding to the states would be reduced by a massive $1.3 billion. So that, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, what we've got uh, is a rerun in terms of the opposition of why they should be in opposition and what they did when they were in government. Because when they were in government, uh, rather than the development of uh, capital resources in terms of health, on any kind of rational basis, on any kind of rational basis, what we had uh, essentially were members who either prepared to uh, candor to the interests of their profession, the good doctor, or were prepared to candor to the special interest, in this case, to the interests of the electorate. I mean, uh, the honourable member for Farrer is really, when he talks about roads, uh, only uh, a pygmy when it gets into these kind of stakes. The honourable member for Lowe, uh, there in his own area, in the inner west, already uh, a, a tremendous problem in terms of planning for the New South Wales government, in terms of dealing with the beds that are there, uh, simply because it will get him a headline in what was it, the Dremoyne something or other news, simply because it will get him a headline, he's prepared to go out and say, we'll get, uh, you'll get uh, this uh, new hospital 60 or is it 100 or is it $350 million? Does it matter if this is going to earn me a vote, if this is going to endear me to the special interests and terms of my profession? Mr Speaker, uh, that's what it's all about. And that's the reason Order. that they're over there, because when it comes to dealing with complex policy issues, what we get is the member for Lowe, the supposed uh, spokesperson, the aspiring minister, a fact indicating that in terms of uh, any policy he's likely to develop, he'll look after himself, then he'll look after his electorate, then he'll look after the doctors, and if there's a few hundred million over, well, perhaps he might look after someone else's need. But his priorities are very, very clear, clear in that little article. The Honourable Member for Barker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, during your recession you've lost 12,600 jobs in the TCF industries despite average effective protection of more than 170 per cent for clothing and footwear and around 70 per cent for textiles. Are you still claiming that you won't lose more jobs in those industries by the year 2000 when the rates under your current plan will be less than a third of these? And how do you explain if low tariffs, tariffs are now so bad that the food and beverage industry has employed an extra 12,500 people in the, exactly the same time during your recession, with an, a 3 per cent effective protection rate, in fact with negligible protection? Yeah. The Honourable the Prime what's Minister. The, uh, I mean, what's the Honourable Gentleman on about? He's the one that's arguing for zero tariffs. He's the one who's arguing that these tariff levels should be taken away. So, therefore, if he's trying to imply that the reductions in protections to date, in protection to date, in the TCF industries has 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 produced some st structural uh, decline in employment in that area, then that decline would be be enormous under a zero tariff level. Now, the fact is, uh, Mr. Speaker, that. Uh, these industries have become a part of the employment base of this country, particularly in rural Victoria, uh, in uh, rural New South Wales and some other places. And they have become so under, a, under a, a policy of very high levels of protection, in the main, in the main with quotas, in the main with quotas where the effective level of protection is infinity, is infinity. Now the government's got rid of quotas, we've removed quotas. And we're now on a, 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 on a reduction, a phase reduction in protection for these industries. But so, and with the work of the TCFDA, the, the, the Textile Clothing and Footwear Development Authority, that uh, 
restructuring, funds for restructuring can occur, which will, uh, can occur which will leave segments of the industry in a competitive position, but not in a pos position competitive as a zero tariff level. And so what we will end up with is nothing, a, a, a decline in protection from the 250 odd percents to uh, 25 or 15 per cent uh, tariffs, uh, so that um, what we will see then is uh, cheaper products for the Australian consumers, but still the maintenance of segments of these industries, the maintenance of segments of these industries, the ones which can never be competitive, will have gone, and uh, possibly and probably in areas of rural Australia where people rely upon these companies for their employment. Now, I don't see any problem with that, Mr Speaker, and I'm very amused at the shadow, uh, the shadow minister referring to the, to, the, to the modern tourist industry which was created by this government. Created by this government. The fact is it, 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 it occurs. It, uh, food, well, food and beverage. Food and beverage is, is also part, is part of, uh, is part of uh, the tourism industry, obviously. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, well, I, well, I mean, well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, if um, order, Mr. Speaker, I, I mean, uh, I don't know who you think uh, walk around the Sydney quayside and see who you think's in the restaurants. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the fact is, of course, there are industries here without protection. I warn the member for of course, there are industries here without protection. That's the very essence of the government taking this poison out of the economy. But who put the poison in there? The Liberal and National parties. Who kept it in there? The Liberal and National parties. And who did nothing in the years when they had the opportunity to bring it down? The Liberal and National parties. They left it as usual to the Labor to do the dirty work. And now they're complaining that we haven't done it quickly enough. Well, we haven't gone far enough, and what we ought to do is go to zero. And you now give it—that's right, he says. Well, I mean, what—I mean, what sort of general hypocrisy is that? Generally, I mean, you did nothing about it for 40 years. We've had to do it all, and now you're asking me questions about about the growth of uh, of economic opportunities in industries which are without protection. Of course, the industries—all the ones that were internationally competitive and carrying the fat for Australia out there. The primary export sector have the monkey of protection put on their backs by John McEwen, Doug Anthony, and all the National Party in cahoots with the Liberal Party over a 20 or 30 year period. As anyone, I mean, you'd go to the, we'd have these, uh, the sort of the agrarian socialists, the National Party, going to country meetings saying, you know, crocodile tears for farmers, while at the same time they're turning up to the industrial uh, dinners, picking up the cheques from the people they handed the industrial protection out to trying to run a scam, a duplicitous policy, kidding country people while you're taking the money through the back door from, uh, from manufacturing industry, trying to suggest that uh, and trying to make the claim that, um, that uh, the exchange rate, which was of course hugely overvalued in the 1970s, robbed Australian farmers of, ma of, many, of much of the wealth they should have otherwise enjoyed because you believed again in a managed exchange rate. I mean, you had the competitiveness down on, our, on its knees, you had a managed exchange rate, you had a high tariff protection regime, we're the only party which has taken it away. And what have we got? These nitpicking questions by people, by people who have done nothing, nothing about any of this. The Honourable Member for Stirling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I direct a question without notice to the Treasurer. In the light of the inflow of large numbers of New Zealand shearers into Australia, um, I might add fleeing Prime Minister Bolger's GST and privatisation. Um, and, will get to his question. and they're taking the jobs of Australian shearers and the reports of tax rorts. Order! And the reports of tax rorts involving some New Zealand shearers. Will the Treasurer act to ensure that any tax evasion by New Zealand shearers and their Australian employers is immediately dealt with? The Honourable Treasurer. Order. Mr Speaker, I am uh, indebted to the uh, question from that well-known rural member, the uh, member for Stirling, uh, in his <coughs> question about um, the impact of New Zealand uh, shearers in Australia. And uh, I am, of course, uh, aware in this uh, wool week that uh, this is a matter of uh, great concern to uh, some of those in the shearing industry in Australia. 
I would, um, I would say to the honourable member for Stirling that under the provisions of Australia's double tax agreement with New Zealand, where a New Zealand resident shearer comes to work in Australia for a period of less than six months, Australia does not tax the income. The income is taxable in New Zealand. Where a New Zealand resident shearer works in Australia for a period exceeding six months, Australia taxes the income at non-resident rates. The, tax the taxation treatment is similar. In other words, it's reversed in cases where Australian residents go to work in New Zealand. The residency of the individual is determined by the treaty. The government is aware of the problems uh, in the shearing industry, and we wish to make sure that tax issues do not add to these problems. In the context of the CER review, the Australian and New Zealand governments are going to renegotiate the Australian-New Zealand double tax agreement, which of course is now quite dated. The appropriate treatment of New Zealand residents that come to work in Australia and Australian residents that go to work in New Zealand will be considered in those negotiations. And I think this uh, is a particularly important issue, as we have seen emerge as a result of the CER arrangements, essentially a common labour market stretching across the Tasman. And therefore, I think uh, the, the reality of that common labour market needs to be reflected in the taxation treatment of individuals working in either country. And it's a matter which uh, I will, with great pleasure, take up with my uh, New Zealand counterparts in the context of reviewing the uh, double tax agreement. The Honourable Leader of the National Party. My question without notice is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister know that both the National Bank and the Commonwealth Bank refuse to accept the Prime Minister's February statement forecast of economic growth? Does he know that these major banks claim the Prime Minister's forecast is wrong by up to 100 per cent? And does the Prime Minister know that he's getting a reputation in all of this for inaccuracy constant flexibility and violent mood swings. <laughs> the Honourable <laughs> Prime Minister. I don't think there'll be much... And now tell us, Tim, what, what you, you think you meant by that. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr Speaker, I think it was Business Review Weekly this week or last week published a, a, a series of forecasts by the country's leading uh, economists and econometricians in their own right and representing some of the organisations they work with, including banks, which showed overwhelmingly that the group of people surveyed thought that the government's forecasts were either in the middle of the range uh, or thereabouts of their own forecasts. In other words, uh, if one takes a representative group of people studying the economy and forecasting and commenting on the economy, they thought the government's uh, forecasts over the period were entirely plausible. And it does the leader of the National Party no credit to take uh, references from a particular institution who might disagree. Now, I've never, uh, I've never, I don't even know whether that, uh, they are an accurate reflection, as the leader of the National Party claims them to be. But the fact is, on a, on a sweep of uh, references across the board, we have the support, in terms of those forecasts, of the economics profession in general. The Honourable Member for, for Corbyn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and it re uh, relates to the, the plight of the Kurdish people. Is the Minister aware that the Federal Republic of Germany has placed an arms embargo on Turkey as a result of that country's attacks on the Kurdish people? What independent information do we have as to the number of people killed and wounded as a result of these attacks? Has Australia protested to the Turkish government about this matter? And do we intend to take any further action in relation to this matter, and especially to help secure the rights of the Kurdish people in Turkey and indeed also in Iraq? The Honourable Minister. Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Cornwall for my maiden foreign affairs question. I would assure the Leader of the National Party that this doesn't reflect a violent mood swing. Um, <laughs> to the Honourable Gentleman, the Government is aware that the German government has announced a suspension of arms deliveries and uh, military systems of Turkey on the grounds of its belief that German origin weapons were being used against the Kurds. And uh, I'm not aware that any other country uh, has taken similar action. And of course, Mr. Speaker, the government is concerned at the escalating level of violence in Kurdish areas of Turkey since the 20th of March. Uh, no official figures have been released, but various reports indicate that up to 80 people have been killed and up to 200 wounded in the course of actions by the Turkish Armed Forces against terrorist actions by the Kurdish Workers' Party, the PKK. 
Uh, Turkish government measures to date include uh, the imposition of curfews and large numbers of arrests, and the Australian Embassy in Ankara is continuing to closely monitor the situation. On 30 March, we directed our ambassador in Ankara to convey Australian concerns to the Turkish government, including urging the Turkish authorities to exercise restraint in any anti-terrorist action against the PKK and to ensure that the human rights of the Kurdish people are protected. Australia has closely monitored over a long period the treatment of the Kurds, not just by Turkey but uh, of course also by Iraq. And the government is very concerned about reports in today's press that Iraqi troops have been deployed once again against Kurds in northern Iraq. Uh, we do recognise the strain placed on Turkish resources in providing a safe haven for Kurds fleeing Iraq from attacks by Saddam Hussein in the aftermath of the Gulf War. And we appreciate the support provided by Turkey for Australia's contribution uh, to the release, relief effort. The government has raised the question of human rights in regard to the Kurds both publicly and privately during the visit to Australia last year by the Turkish President Özal. And our representations reflect our firm commitment to the universal application of internationally accepted standards of human rights. Our current representations to the Turkish government should therefore be seen within this context in the hope that the Kurdish people will receive and have protected their basic human rights. And as we all well know, the honourable member for Cornwall takes a very strong interest in that, and I thank him for his question. The honourable the Prime Minister. Ask a further question to be placed in the the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Yes, I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders. Order. I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended, as would prevent the Prime Minister forthwith giving the House a full account of his assessment of the price effects of the Coalition's fight back package. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker, in the course of the uh, question time this afternoon, we've had another, a another example of what has been a continuing Order. example of misrepresentation by the Prime Minister. Opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question is that the Leader of the Opposition be no longer heard. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Canning and Fowler tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Riverina, Darling and Wakefield tell us for the noes. <laughs> oh, she <she's> <laughs> Huh? 
Order. The result of the division is ayes 69, noes 62. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Is the motion seconded? I second the motion, <coughs> Deputy Mr. Of the Speaker. Uh, he is squibbing this the debate, is, and if he wants to know who's a fraud order. and a cheat, order. then we ought to have this the debate here and now. The question is that the Deputy Leader be no longer heard. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. For one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the Deputy Leader of the Opposition be no longer heard. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Canning and Fowler tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Riverina, Darling and Wakefield tell us for the noes. <coughs> Order. The result of the division is ayes 69, noes 62. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Mr. Speaker, the question is that standing Hawke would have taken this debate. He would not have cheated order. out on the matter. Order. The leader of the National Party didn't have the call and shan't come to the dispatch box without it. The leader of the House. Since uh, Mr. Speaker, I move the motion be put. The question is that the motion be now put. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Order, there's far too much noise. Lock the doors. The question is that the question be now put. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I put the honourable members for Canning and Fowler tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Riverina, Darling and Wakefield tell us for the nose. Order. The result of the division is ayes 69, noes 62. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that standing orders be suspended. All those of that opinion please say aye. aye. Those against no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Division requ required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that standing orders be suspended. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I put the honourable members for Wakefield and Riverina Darling tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Fowler and, Can and uh, Canning tell us for the nose. The honourable members quickly take their seats.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 61, noes 70. The division is therefore resolved in a negative. Would honourable members quickly resume their seats? <coughs> the, the Leader of the House with papers. I think our uh, papers are tabled as listed on the schedule uh, circulated to honourable members earlier today. Details of the papers will be recorded in Hansard and the votes in proceedings. Right. Will honourable members please resume their seats? I think the, the honourable leader of the opposition had a personal explanation. Mr. Mr. Speaker. I seek leave to make a personal explanation. Does the honourable member claim to be misrepresented? Uh, yes, I do. Mr. The honourable member may proceed. Will other, other members either resume their seats or leave the chamber? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, today, in the course of question time, the Prime Minister uh, went out of his way to misrepresent my position in relation to the impact of the goods and services tax as part of and our fightback package on the prices of, uh, of groceries and food. And uh, to quote him, he said uh, that I maliciously misrepresented those policies. And, and then that they would only have a benign effect on prices for a sample of groceries that I knew to be totally unrepresentative. Mr Speaker, in response to that, uh, that um, totally unjustified statement, I refer the Prime Minister to a number of things, one of which he quoted from himself today in the Parliament, which is the Food Link uh, press release of yesterday, in which it is said that at no time did they state that it would be the total food purchase for a family for two weeks. It was exactly... Hang on. Order. It was exactly Order. representing what our statistics showed would be an approximate $150 basket of goods purchased at an average supermarket at any one time. I also refer the Prime Minister to my press release, my press release on that occasion where I said a similar thing and indeed Order. drew attention to the fact that other, other information from the Supermarket Institute had put the price effect as between 3 and 5 uh, per cent. Uh, I also refer the Prime Minister to the doorstop I did on that occasion at the supermarket where I specifically identified how that basket was, was uh, calculated by the Foodlink Group some six months before I visited that uh, supermarket. And finally, I refer the Prime Minister to his own Treasury Department and their estimate of the price effect of the goods and services tax at 3.6%. The Honourable Member, member is shown where he's misrepresented. On the, the, so does the Prime Minister claim to have order? Order. Does the Prime Minister claim to have been misrepresented? I do, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the opposition. The honourable Prime Minister. The leader, the leader, I'm relying upon the leader of the opposition quote where he called, where he called the basket. A, order. A representative order. basket of groceries, which he knew to be untrue, and that's uh, order. Mr. Speaker. Order. Mr. Speaker, I did not misrepresent him when I quoted I've the two the paragraphs from Foodlink. And I can only say that the Leader of the Opposition's personal explanation has dug him in even deeper. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ministerial statements. Are there any ministerial statements? Order. Are there any ministerial statements? The Honourable the Prime Minister. 
Mr Speaker, I, I ask Leave of the House to move a motion relating to Cambodia peacekeeping and the terms are circulated honourable members. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The Honourable Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I move the motion in relation to Cambodia peacekeeping and the terms as circulated. Hmm. The Honourable Prime Minister may proceed. Mr Speaker, it is appropriate that the House focus today on the subject of Cambodia and on the prospects for lasting peace in that long-suffering country. Great crimes have been committed against the Cambodian people. The tragedy of the conflict has been brought home to us all through the personal witness of many Cambodian Australians. On 28 February, the United Nations Security Council passed a resolution formally creating the United Nations Transitional Authority in Cambodia, or UNTAC, the body responsible for implementation of the historic comprehensive political settlement of the Cambodia conflict. In response to the United Nations General Secretary's request for contributions to UNTAC's operations, Australia has agreed to provide 495 Defence Force personnel to form the Force Communications Unit. This total includes 65 communicators already deployed as part of the UN advance mission in Cambodia. If conditions are right in Cambodia, the government expects that the main Australian contingent will begin deploying during this month. They will be joined in the field by 40 signallers from the New Zealand Defence Force. Furthermore, Australia has provided UNTAC's military commander, Lieutenant General John Sanderson, who, co who commenced duty in Cambodia on 15 March. Australia will contribute six staff to his headquarters unit. The government also expects to contribute to UNTAC's civilian component, whose composition is still under consideration by the United Nations. As part of this, we have decided to provide 10 police officers. In addition, Mr Michael Maley, an officer of the Australian Electoral Commission, has taken up duty in Phnom Penh as Deputy Electoral Commissioner for UNTAC. Mr Speaker, the creation of UNTAC is the culmination of years of complex and difficult negotiation. The peace plan embodied in the remarkable agreement signed in Paris on 23 October 1991 provides a way of ending the nightmare of Cambodia's recent past. The main objectives of the settlement are to end the civil war and to allow the Cambodian people to choose a new government through genuinely free and fair elections. Reflecting the complexity of the Cambodian conflict, the Paris Agreements provide for an unprecedented and, and ambitious role for the United Nations in the implementation of the peace plan. ONTAC will have a peacekeeping role supervising, monitoring and verifying the ceasefire, partial demobilisation of armed forces and the cessation of external military assistance. ONTAC most definitely will not have a role in forcing or imposing the peace if hostilities break out. In the civilian sphere, not only will UNTAC have a role in organising and conducting the elections, it will also play a role in monitoring and supervising the interim administration of the country to ensure a neutral political environment for the elections. In addition, the United Nations will be responsible for coordinating and assisting the repatriation and resettlement of some hundreds of thousands of Cambodian refugees and displaced persons. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Cambodia peace settlement is a striking demonstration of the fundamental changes that have occurred in the international system. Unprecedented cooperation between the permanent five members of the Security Council has greatly enhanced the scope for resolving regional conflicts. The UN system has been able to harness broad-based support for its peacekeeping role. The subtle and dynamic balance of interests in the Cambodia peace agreements reflects the close involvement and cooperation of the permanent five members of the Security Council in the negotiating process. The efforts of the Indonesian and French government deserve special mention. Their initiative, courage and persistence were essential to the success of the peace plan. Great credit must also go also, of course, to the Cambodians themselves. Those of us who have not known their suffering or seen the evil that they have seen can only wonder what human qualities it takes to sit down and talk about the future, about peace and about national reconciliation. Mr Deputy Speaker, Australia played a significant role in the long process leading up to the Paris Agreements. In the mid-1980s, former Foreign Minister Hayden 
was active in regional diplomacy, which sought to identify a basis for dialogue between the parties to the Cambodian conflict. In late 1989, Senator Evans played a key role in breaking the impasse following the first Paris Conference on Cambodia in July and August 1989. The core of Senator Evans' proposals, which was taken up by the permanent five members of the Security Council, was an enhanced role for the United Nations in the transitional pr period preceding elections in Cambodia. Senator Evans's resourceful and energetic pursuit of peace in Cambodia has earned him nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize. It's also earned international respect for Australia. Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, in moving this motion today, I pay regard to the achievement of Senator Evans and his department. In light of our diplomatic uh, contribution, it was appropriate that Australia was the first country to establish accreditation to the Supreme National Council, the interim body in which Cambodian sovereignty has been vested during the transitional period. Australia was also among the first to supply troops to carry out the vital task of establishing communications and infrastructure in preparation for the deployment of the main ONTAC force. It is appropriate that we now help to see the process through. The return of Australian soldiers to Indochina and the cause of peace is a matter for us to reflect on with justifiable pride. Yeah, yeah. With peace secured in Cambodia, we shall be able to welcome the countries of Indochina back into the mainstream of regional activity. We can confidently expect them to become part of the dynamism of Asia. Vietnam will now be able to emerge from its isolation and, with Cambodia, play its part in regional and international affairs. In parallel with the improved prospects for peace in Cambodia, Australia will resume direct bilateral aid. The Minister for Trade and Overseas Development announced today that, over the next four years, Australia will provide approximately 49 million Australian dollars in development assistance to Cambodia. This total includes $23 million for new bilateral aid. In addition, during this financial year, we are providing approximately 7.7 .7 million Australian dollars in disaster relief and assistance to displaced Cambodians. Mr. Deputy Speaker, aspects of the comprehensive settlement have been criticised by some observers. It is suggested that it would somehow have been better to exclude the Khmer Rouge from the peace process because of their responsibilities for the atrocities committed by the former Pol Pot regime. Involvement of the Khmer Rouge in the process does not reflect the judgment by the Australian or other governments that the Khmer Rouge can now be trusted. Rather, it reflects a realistic assessment that the only available effective way of containing the military threat they pose and of ending the civil war was to involve them and their main backers, China, as parties to the agreement. Put simply, a peace settlement without the Khmer Rouge and China would not be a peace settlement at all. It's also been suggested that the settlement could have been improved by providing for 100 per cent rather than for 70 per cent demobilisation of the armed forces of the Cambodian parties. Obviously, such a provision would have been preferable. But the outcome <coughs> set out in the Paris Agreements is the best that could be negotiated. It is the judgment of the United States, Russia, China, France, Britain, all significant Asian states and Australia that the Paris settlement represents the best available realistic basis for a just and durable peace in Cambodia. Mr Speaker, Deputy Speaker, UNTAC will be the costliest as well as the most comprehensive peacekeeping operation yet undertaken by the United Nations. It is expected to involve approximately 15,900 military personnel, 3,600 civilian police and 3,300 civilian administrators. More than 50 countries have been requested to contribute to this complex undertaking. The initial United Nations estimate of the cost for a duration of 18 months is $1.9 billion. US dollars. Australia's share of assessed contributions for this amount is 1.51 per cent, or $28.7 million. US dollars. I should also advise the House that Cabinet agreed in October 1991 to provide supplementation to the defence budget of $49 million Australian dollars to fund the estimated costs involved in making our contribution to UNTAC and the United Nations Advanced Mission in Cambodia. This is separate from our assessed contribution to UNTAC's budget described above. 
We expect this will eventually be partially offset by a reimbursement from the United Nations, United Nations of some $19.7 million Australian dollars, but this will take some time to materialise. The final UNTAC plan and budget are now being scrutinised in New York by representatives of major donors, including Australia. It will be some weeks before the final budget is approved. Along with other donors, Australia hopes that, as implementation of the settlement proceeds, an increasing habit of cooperation among the Cambodian parties will allow savings in UNTAC personnel and costs. Mr Deputy Speaker, generally speaking, the settlement is working. In the five months since it was signed, the remarkable thing has been not the number of violations or the number of disputes, but the way in which the Paris agreements have held firm and the way in which the parties have repeatedly reaffirmed their commitment to the settlement in all its detail. Of course, there have been incidents which threaten the whole process, and the government has viewed with particular concern the recent fighting in Kong Tom province, but we must look beyond those hurdles without any sense in any sense trivialising them. Implementation of the peace plan may well prove more difficult than its negotiation. There are bound to be further setbacks. We should expect them and not be disheartened when they occur. The government's decision to commit Australian forces to the Cambodian peacekeeping operation was not taken lightly. The UN forces will face risks from mines, from disease, from banditry and possibly from fresh outbreaks of fighting. The government has assessed these risks and has weighed them carefully. It does not underestimate them or the need to take every prudent precaution to protect our troops. We have made this commitment, however, because the opportunity to help restore peace to Cambodia is one which the international community cannot lightly let go. The UN commitment to help Cambodia also serves Australia's direct interests and those of our neighbours by helping to create a more peaceful and prosperous region. But it is important to emphasise again that Australian forces will not be participating in the UN operation in order to enforce or impose the peace in Cambodia. That's a task beyond the United Nations mandate. Rather, the Australian forces will be in Cambodia to help keep a peace on which the Cambodian parties themselves have agreed. That is the condition under which UNTAC is being deployed. It is the whole basis of the Paris Peace Accords. It is the condition under which Australian troops have been offered to the United Nations. If we conclude that there is no longer a peace to keep in Cambodia, the Australian and other UN forces will have to be withdrawn. But we do not expect that to happen. All sides in the conflict have invested so much effort in the peace process and the Cambodian people have so much to gain from its success that we think the prospects for a successful outcome remain promising. If we turn our backs on this opportunity to help consolidate the hard work of the peacemakers, we shall be sentencing the Cambodian people to further years of cruelty and suffering. Yeah, yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, as I mentioned earlier, UNTAC's primary military functions will be supervising and verifying the ceasefire partial demobilisation of armed forces and the cessation of external military assistance. UNTAC will also assist in the clearance of hundreds of thousands of mines. Australia's contingent will provide the crucial communications network for the UNTAC military operation. Our service men and women will be operating in a difficult and sometimes dangerous environment. Already Lieutenant Colonel Russell Stewart has been wounded in the course of his duty with the United Nations Advanced Mission in Cambodia. That incident underlines the, rich, the risks which the peacekeeping personnel face. But Australians can be proud of the skill and professionalism which the Australian Defence Force units have brought to UN peacekeeping and other operations around the world, from the Sinai, Iraq and the Red Sea, to the Western Sahara and the Afghan border. Their reputation is reflected in the United Nations Secretary General's decision to appoint Lieutenant General Sanderson commander of UNTAC's military force. I am sure all members of this House will join me in extending congratulations to General Sanderson on his appointment and in wishing him well in his assignment. Yeah. I am equally sure members will want to express their confidence in and support for the Australian Defence Force men and women deployed in Cambodia. Yeah. There is no more honourable duty than the one they will, be, they will go to perform to preserve the peace. 
We know they will serve Australia in the cause of peace with distinction, and we look forward to their safe return. Mr Deputy Speaker, we hope that return will not be long delayed. The aim of the United Nations' presence in Cambodia is not to oversee developments there indefinitely, but to manage the transition from war to peace, from factional distrust to national reconciliation. May 1993 has been set as the target date for the United Nations' organised elections. The UN Secretary-General intends withdrawing UNTAC about six months after that date. I know it is the earnest desire of all members of this House that the Cambodian people will seize this opportunity to establish a just and lasting peace in their country. And I commend the motion to the House. The question is the motion is moved by the Prime Minister be agreed to. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Opposition supports the resolution before the House. We do so because the Cambodian people have suffered far too much for far too long and because they deserve to have every chance to secure a genuine and lasting peace in their country. A nation that has been racked by war, genocide and anarchy for decades deserves every opportunity for a better future. The Cambodian people have a basic right to live free from the fear of persecution and free from the horror of war. That is a right that has been denied them for over a generation. It is a right which needs to be restored in a real and enduring way. The opposition also supports this resolution because our defence force deserves it. They are called on to perform a professional job in the service of their country, and they should know that in doing so, they have the support and respect and best wishes of this House. We know that the professionalism and dedication to duty shown by the Australian Defence Force throughout its history will once more be demonstrated as it undertakes its work as part of the United Nations Force in Cambodia. Mr Deputy Speaker, might I, might I also take this opportunity to add uh, the, the best wishes of the coalition parties uh, to uh, General Sanderson, an Australian, on his appointment as the UN Commander. We wish him well, of course, in this very difficult and very challenging post. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Opposition has consistently supported the peace process, process in Cambodia over recent years. That support has been genuine, constructive and positive in its purpose, but it has not been uncritical. It is that spirit of genuine and constructive but not uncritical support that motivates our response to this resolution today. Mr, Speaker, it is, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is important, I believe, to set this resolution and the Opposition's response to it in a proper historical context. Only by reference to how the situation has evolved can the real forces of change be identified, the real threats to progress recognised and the consistency of the opposition's approach demonstrated. From the days of the Paris Conference on Cambodia in July 1989, the federal opposition has welcomed a process that brought together the four Cambodian factions, namely the Hun Sen government, Prince Sihanouk's faction, Son Sam's non-communist faction and the Khmer Rouge, as well as the United Nations Permanent Five, the ASEAN nations and Australia. But in welcoming this process of dialogue and negotiation, we have consistently highlighted particular concerns. We have emphasised that an enduring peace would only be achieved if there was a settlement of the external factors, such as the withdrawal of Vietnamese forces from Cambodia, as well as internal factors especially the civil war between the Cambodian factions. We have also emphasised that under no circumstances would we support the return to dominance of the Khmer Rouge, and in particular its leaders, who inflicted such crimes against humanity on their own people in the 1970s. In fact, in November 1989, we called on the Australian government to take the lead in supporting action in the International Court of Justice against Pol Pot and his associates for the crime of genocide. It is a matter of regret that the government has never given that proposal its wholehearted support. The 1989 Paris Conference ultimately failed because the Cambodian factions could not agree on a power-sharing arrangement, but a process had begun that at least held out a chance for a settlement that might endure. In February 1990, the peace process entered a new phase when Senator Evans produced his so-called Red Book a proposal for an enhanced UN role in Cambodia. Mr Deputy Speaker, this signalled the beginning of a high-profile activist role by Senator Evans in the Cambodian peace process. I should make it very clear that although we on this side of the House 
have sometimes seriously questioned Senator Evans's judgment, we have recognised the positive contribution that Senator Evans has made on this issue. I have, for example, personally supported his role in many meetings that I have had with the leaders in Asia and in the United States. But we have not, as I have said, been uncritical of Senator Evans, and there are some aspects of criticism to which I refer in my comments today. But I should also make it clear here and now that in our view Senator Evans has contributed positively to the search for peace in Cambodia and that we have supported him in that general endeavour. A role for the United Nations in brokering a Cambodian peace was an option that had been canvassed over years before Senator Evans produced his proposals. He broadened it to include a role for the United Nations in the interim functioning of the government of Cambodia because the factions were unable to settle on an appropriate formula. The Cambodian factions failed to agree on the Red Book proposals, but those proposals remained the basis for future negotiations. From the outset, the federal opposition was supportive of an activist and constructive Australian role in that peace process. But we emphasise that without the involvement of the major powers and without pressure from them on individual Cambodian factions, Australia's efforts would always be of little effect. Throughout 1990, our concerns about the Khmer Rouge were reinforced. Their gains on the battlefield and their intransigence at the negotiating table during a series of failed conferences raised very serious doubts about their commitment to a negotiated political settlement. More than that, we were deeply concerned at the prospect that the Khmer Rouge might be using the peace process to strengthen its own position on the ground and enhance its own prospects for a return to dominance. The United Nations Permanent Five reinvigorated the peace process in August 1990 with a plan for a comprehensive settlement. The critical shift reflected in this initiative was a new United States activism on the issue and a new spirit of United States-Soviet cooperation. We welcomed the comprehensive peace plan but emphasised our continuing fears of a Khmer Rouge resurgence, our concerns at escalating fighting throughout Cambodia and our reservations about about the practicality of the role envisaged for the United Nations. For almost a year, from August 1990 to June 1991, the peace process stalled. We expressed concern that Australian policy was showing signs of substituting unwarranted optimism for necessary realism. We attempted to offer constructive criticism and suggestions, including the exploring of other options for the Cambodian peace in the face of the increasing complexity of the situation on the ground and the inability of the four Cambodian factions and their backers to reach common ground. The easing of tensions between China and Vietnam, China's decision to end its military support of the Khmer Rouge and the development of a greater spirit of cooperation among the Cambodian factions led to the critical breakthrough in mid-1991. Meetings in Thailand, New York and Paris towards the end of last year laid the basis for a negotiated settlement based on interim power sharing, a central supervisory and peacekeeping role for the United Nations, demobilisation of the factions and national elections. The federal opposition welcomed the signing of the agreement on a comprehensive peace settlement in Paris in October last year. We recognised the scale of what had been achieved on paper, but we cautioned realism about the difficulties of achieving fundamental changes in practice. Our call for realism was focused on the role of the Khmer Rouge in that peace plan. The only guarantee which the international community has ever had that the intentions of the Khmer Rouge are consistent with the terms of the peace settlement are the professions of good faith made by the Khmer Rouge negotiators themselves. Our fundamental concern has been the fact that such professions of good faith in the past have never been genuine guarantees about anything at all. It has been on these dangerous and shifting sands that the various ASEAN and Western plans to bring peace to Cambodia have been built. Mr Deputy Speaker, I have reviewed at some length the evolution of the Cambodian peace process. I have done so to emphasise the consistency of the opposition's general support for that peace process. As much as anyone else, we have wanted to see a genuine, lasting peace brought to Cambodia. As much as anyone else, we want this current phase of the peace process to work. But our support has always been with our eyes open. In addressing a tragedy on the scale of Cambodia, it is easier to let one's heart overrule one's head, to let good intentions be a substitute for good policy and to be distracted 
from what is often harsh and unforgiving reality in Cambodia. We have tried to guard against those delusions. The record of recent years shows that the consistency of our support for the Cambodian peace process is matched by the consistency of our concern about particular aspects of it. And so we have come over recent months to the implementation of the comprehensive settlement and to this resolution before the House today. Late last year, the Australian government contributed 65 Defence Force personnel to the United Nations Advanced Mission in Cambodia. We regretted the fact that the government failed to consult us, the opposition parties, in the traditional way prior to the announcement of that decision. But nonetheless, we supported the Australian involvement in the peacekeeping force, consistent with the support we have given to the Australian participation in similar UN forces in the past. Over recent months, planning for the main peacekeeping force, the UN Transitional Authority in Cambodia, UNTAC, has been taking place. A prime ministerial statement on Australian involvement was promised by the Minister for Defence almost five months ago on 5 November last year. Today such a statement has finally been made. Mr. Speaker, the Mr Deputy Speaker, the opposition has re-emphasised specific concerns over recent days about the situation inside Cambodia and about the future of the peace process. It is against those concerns that the opposition has assessed today's statement by the Prime Minister. First, we have been concerned about the recent serious violations of the ceasefire by the Khmer Rouge and the dangers which those violations create for Australian defence personnel in Cambodia. The seriousness of those violations has been attested to by various observers, including the commander of the UN Advance Mission, the International Committee of the Red Cross, senior US administration officials and the Australian Minister for Defence Science and Personnel. The head of the Supreme National Council, Prince Norodom Sihanouk, himself described developments this week as very, very serious situation. In the light of these realities, the opposition has reiterated its concern about the intentions of the Khmer Rouge, its intimidation of civilians and its attacks on UN personnel. The government's statement today attempts to address that concern. We welcome the Prime Minister's recognition in his statement that the recent fighting in Cambodia has been serious, that it has threatened the whole peace process and that the Khmer Rouge cannot be trusted. We welcome his acknowledgement that, and I quote, implementation of the peace plan may well prove more difficult than its negotiation. But there are other aspects of his statement in regard to this issue which we believe are ambiguous and incomplete. The Prime Minister has stated that the deployment of Australian troops to Cambodia will begin this month and I quote, if conditions are right in Cambodia. But he fails to spell out what those conditions are. He also says that, and I quote, there are bound to be further setbacks without specifying the level of danger that they will pose to Australian and other UN troops. But of course, there is an intrinsic difficulty for any government here. No statement of policy can be categorical, one way or the other about the genuineness of the Khmer Rouge's commitment to the peace process. It is an issue which the United Nations will need to monitor closely and deliberately. It is an issue on which the Australian government should exchange information, including classified information, more regularly with the opposition than it has in the past. And I put that request directly to the Prime Minister today. I also ask him to reconsider his government's approach to our long-standing view that Pol Pot and his associates need to be brought to justice for their crimes. We have always believed that such action is necessary and appropriate, that it need not compromise a comprehensive settlement and that the Australian government should promote it. A second concern we have reiterated over recent days relates to the precise role of the UN peacekeeping force in general and the Australian contingent in particular. We have emphasised that its role should be one of genuine peacekeeping, not peacemaking and not peace enforcement. Peacekeeping works when the parties to a conflict are genuinely ready to make peace and when a ceasefire is genuinely in place. We have emphasised that both conditions need to apply when UN peacekeeping forces are involved. We welcome the assurances in today's statement on this issue and the recognition of the dangers our troops will face. In particular, we note the government's firm statement uh, that, and I quote, if we conclude that there is no longer a peace to keep in Cambodia, the Australian and other UN forces will have to be withdrawn. 
End of quotes. But I have to say that today's statement also leaves many critical questions unanswered. What is the government's understanding of the line between peacemaking and peacekeeping? Given that the role of Australian forces will include, and I quote, supervising and verifying the ceasefire, partial demobilisation of the armed forces, and the cessation of external military assistance, what are the rules of engagement for our forces, and will they be made public? What discretionary authority does the Australian commander have, and what matters must he refer to the government for final decision? These are important operational issues which define the limits of conduct for the United Nations and Australian troops. They are similar questions to those that were raised in the early days of the Australian involvement in the Gulf War. On that occasion, the questions were settled by the government taking us into their confidence, keeping us informed and consulting with us prior to further decision-making. The Honourable Member's time has expired. The Honourable Leader of Opposition Business. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the Leader of the Opposition's time be extended. The question is the Opposition Leader's time be extended. Those of that opinion, please say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. We sincerely hope that similar questions now can be addressed in a similar way. And I ask the Prime Minister today to undertake the same level of exchanges of information and consultation as his predecessor. Such interaction is the lifeblood of bipartisanship on these issues, and we hope that our continuing concern about the role of Australian forces can be the subject of further bipartisan discussions. If the role which the government has defined in its statement today for the Australian forces in Cambodia is to change in the future, we believe that any final decision should be on the basis of consultation between the government and the opposition and should be the subject of a separate statement in this House. A third concern we have, uh, <coughs> we have had relates to the period of deployment of Australian forces and the need to avoid an open-ended commitment. The Prime Minister has expressed today his hope, and it's just a hope, that the return of our forces will not be delayed. But no firm indication on timing is given beyond the fact that the UN Secretary-General intends withdrawing UNTAC about six months after the planned election in May next year. Many people are, of course, questioning the realism of this UN timetable. If objectives take longer to achieve than planned, will our forces be deployed for longer than we currently expect? We look forward to close consultations with the government on the implementation of the UN plan. We also expect that any extension of deployment by our troops will be the subject of a separate statement to this House. Fourth, we have sought clarification about the level of commitments of personnel made by other countries to the UN peacekeeping force. The only information provided on this point in the statement is that, and I quote, more than 50 countries have been requested to contribute to this complex undertaking. We understand that, to date, the only major commitments of forces have been made by Indonesia, Malaysia, Australia and, to a lesser extent, New Zealand. We look forward to clarification of the situation by the government and to regular consultations with it on developments. There may be particular reasons why a more genuinely representative international force is not yet in place, but the government needs to explain why this is the case. Fifth, we have had concerns about the demobilisation of the Cambodian factions. In particular, we have sought clarification of whether full demobilisation of the 200,000 regular forces and the 250 thousand militia attached to the factions will be pursued, as recommended by the UN Security Council. We have also sought details on the arrangements for cantonment, <coughs> if there is not full demobilisation, and what guarantees exist with that the factions and the Khmer Rouge in particular will not keep hidden military stores. The statement today acknowledges that only 70 per cent demobilisation of the Cambodian armed forces is possible. The security implications of this decision and the arrangements for cantonment and na that now arise are complex and difficult issues on which we look forward to further information and consultations with the government. Sixth, we have had concerns about the level of funding actually committed to the UN operation in Cambodia. The statement estimates the total cost of the UN operation at US dollar 1.9 billion, but it does not indicate what proportion of that cost has yet been fully committed or formally committed. Our understanding is that only 35 million has been contributed to date. Again, we look forward to the clarification from the government on that issue 
and to continuing consultations on it. And finally, Mr. Speaker, we have made <coughs> We've had genuine concerns about the practicality of the responsibilities of government assigned to the United Nations and the detailed planning for, for that has, uh, has been made. There is little in today's statement, for example, about how the United Nations plans to take over particular functions of the government in Cambodia, including foreign affairs, defence, finance, public security and information. There also seems a certain unreality about the timetable which envisages fair and free elections by May next year and the resettlement of 350,000 Cambodian refugees and 150,000 internally displaced persons by the same time. That means that refugees and others will need to be resettled at a rate of over 10,000 per week even during the coming wet season. Once again, our concerns on these issues will need to be followed up with the government in an open and a cooperative way. The problem is, of course, that if the timetable is an unreal one, the cost of the UN operation will escalate significantly. The period of time in which Australian forces are to be deployed will be longer than is currently envisaged, and the dangers to those forces may increase. Again, Mr Speaker, we ask the government to take us into its confidence on this matter and to provide us with regular and detailed briefings on the implementation of the UN timetable, on the level of funds formally committed to the operation and on the period of deployment for the Australian forces. If the situation changes in terms of the nature of the engagement of our forces, the level of Australian funding and the number of Australian personnel, we expect full consultations with the government prior to any such decision and a separate statement uh, by it to the parliament. In conclusion, Mr Speaker, I wish to indicate the opposition's support for this important resolution. The concerns we have raised over recent days on this issue and to which I have referred today are consistent with our long-standing support for the peace process and with our long-standing reservations about particular aspects of it. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Acting Speaker, I should also note that we welcome the government's announcement today of a resumption of direct bilateral aid to Cambodia. We judge that the changed political situation inside Cambodia warrants such an initiative. Moreover, the human need is painfully obvious, with all the infrastructure, training and humanitarian needs of hundreds of thousands of Cambodian citizens returning to their country. We hope that Australian non-government aid agencies will play a central role in this enhanced aid program. I have seen at first hand some of the suffering and indignity of life in the refugee camps. Anything that the government can constructively do to alleviate that human tragedy is to be welcomed. Mr Acting Speaker, we support the resolution because of the critical importance of the issues it addresses. Peace in Cambodia, freedom for its citizens and stability in our region. I have referred to specific issues on which I consider that the Australian people are entitled to further information. I believe that the Prime Minister should report back to the Parliament as soon as possible on the issues where clarification is needed. I accept that security concerns may limit the dissemination of some information, but in those circumstances I believe the government needs to take the opposition into its confidence so that legitimate ongoing concerns can be addressed. Finally, Mr Acting Speaker, may I endorse wholeheartedly what the Prime Minister said about our Defence Force personnel who will serve in Cambodia. They are serving in the great tradition of our Defence Force. They have our best wishes for the success of their mission and a safe return to their family and friends. Mr Acting Speaker, I commend the resolution to the House. The question is the motion be agreed to. The Honourable the Minister for Defence Science Personnel. Thank you, Mr Acting Speaker. Deputy Speaker. Uh, uh, may, in, in welcoming the remarks which have just been made by the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition and his support of the resolution moved by the Prime Minister, I, I need to say uh, uh, that um, while in principle obviously the government would be uh, anxious to take the uh, opposition into its confidence on this extremely important deployment, uh, it is the case that um, I have not been asked by my uh, opposite number for any briefings on this deployment, for any information which has not been publicly available, and I signal my own uh, willingness to cooperate in that regard. Uh, but the fact is that I haven't, haven't uh, been asked for any of that so far. Some of the points uh, which um, were the subject of the, of the uh, leader's concluding remarks, uh, the rules of engagement, uh, the period of deployment, uh, the levels of commitment of other countries. Some of this is freely available. But I might add that um, uh, we're talking here about an, an operation which is not uh, 
uh, just as simple as it might be if it were planned on the mainland of Australia by forces entirely under, con under our control. It is a difficult, a messy, uh, a, a complex situation on the ground, and uh, as I've just recently spent some days touring uh, uh, and having uh, visiting our forces in Cambodia, I can attest to the difficulties that uh, will be involved. Uh, the, the leader asks about um, uh, what arrangements are being made for demobilisation and cantonment and concedes that they're difficult and complex. They are. We, we have uh, something like 200,000 people under arms in Cambodia, uh, under the control of five separate groups and even more if you count local warlords. It would be odd indeed if this process should go entirely without hitch. And so I do want to uh, say to uh, to this House and to the Opposition that um, some of these matters, the levels of funding, the timetable for the UN's operations and so forth, are by their nature uh, ones uh, which, we can't, which one can't give uh, a completely accurate picture at this time. But may I repeat, uh, uh, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, that um, uh, for my own part and for the part of the government, I undertake uh, that um, in a commitment of this kind there will be no unwillingness to provide uh, uh, information to the uh, to the opposition uh, on uh, what is a major deployment, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, of course, um, wholeheartedly support the Prime Minister's remarks. I, I uh, first went to Cambodia in 1968 uh, uh, and um, returned there recent, recently, some 20, almost 25 years later. Uh, to a lot of people, Cambodia has really only entered their consciousness. Uh, uh, in recent times, but remember 1975. Remember the horror of the killing fields. Remember the genocide of Pol Pot. Remember the tragic legacy of the Cold War, of, of uh, the decision uh, in 1969 uh, by the then American president to involve Cambodia. Remember the unforgiving struggle which has brought tragedy and death to this tiny country, uh, a tragedy which, for a time at least, attracted the sympathy of the whole world. And Australia has not forgotten that tragedy. We regard ourselves as having a mission in Cambodia, a humanitarian mission to bring peace to that uh, tragic country. But that obligation is also a political obligation which arises from two sources. First, a moral obligation and an expression of our determination to fulfil what we see as our international duty, a duty as a good citizen of the new international community which has followed the conclusion of the Cold War. And secondly, a duty to our fellow Australians in the interests of Australia to contribute to security in our own region. As to the first, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the international duty, uh, it's not for 14 months ago that this House supported the principles of common security which are enshrined in the United Nations Charter when we agreed unanimously to the participation of Australian forces in the United, action, United Nations action against Iraqi forces uh, who'd invaded Kuwait. And once, upon, uh, once again, this House is called upon to commit Australia to that principle. We're a middle power. We're not in the front rank in enforcing international peace in terms of the relative number of troops we provide to peacekeeping operations. But I can say, having uh, visited uh, our peacekeeping forces and having discussed uh, recently in New York with the United Nations officials, uh, that um, Australia has a, a reputation second to none in our willingness to work in a number of ways, military and non-military, to secure peace. And uh, we have participated in the majority of United Nations peacekeeping operations uh, since uh, the UN process uh, began and have contributed uh, to uh, Australian troops to those. Mr Deputy Speaker, the changing uh, international circumstances which allowed the United Nations to take the action it did to liberate Kuwait has also allowed the building of a consensus on a peace settlement for Cambodia, and the Prime Minister has dealt with those in his statement. Uh, but for the United Nations to act as a facilitator to achieve peace in any zone as troubled as Cambodia has been, the process will be complex and it will be fraught with the possibility of setbacks. Uh, in that regard, uh, it's important to accept that the mechanics of managing a multinational peacekeeping force are very complicated. Uh, and let's recall that from 1978 to 1988, no new peacekeeping operations were launched by the United Nations. But from 1988 to the present time, 10 new peacekeeping operations have been set up without any real increase in the resources devoted to the problem by the United Nations administration. 
uh, and as well as simply the military question of getting the forces to the trouble spot and supporting them, the UN organisation also faces the problems, the, wide, the wider political problems, of balancing the interests of the countries which have provided forces and the interests of the protagonists to a conflict. Australia recognises these problems and indeed no country has done more in trying to bring them to resolution, but it doesn't make us any less committed to the need for United Nations efforts to maintain peace and security. On the question of regional security, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, and on Cambodia, nobody has ever claimed that this operation would be easy or for risk or risk-free. But for the first time in 20 years, this tiny country in the international community now has a chance uh, to bring about more peace and more security. It's a chance for the peace for the people inside Cambodia, just as it is a chance for peace for the countries which border Cambodia. And it's no accident that Indonesia, Australia's neighbour, uh, partner in regional security, was co-chairman of the Paris Conference on Cambodia, which played the main role in bringing the warring parties to the conference table. It's no coincidence that Thailand and Malaysia, as well as Indonesia, uh, are part of the UN peacekeeping force in uh, Cambodia, and indeed, uh, at this moment, uh, Indonesia has contributed the largest number of forces. Uh, so. Um, the, the, the participation by those countries of the region is a, is, a, is a proof, if any were needed, of the importance of peace in Cambodia for regional security. I now want to speak about the tasks of our Australian troops uh, who are there and who will be going there shortly. It will be our largest and our most testing peacekeeping mission as the United Nations moves to put UNTAC, the United Nations Transition Authority uh, in Cambodia, in place. Uh, the selection, as speakers have said, of Lieutenant General Sanderson as commander of the UN force is an honour for Australia, which can, reflects the conviction that Australian troops will play an important role in the restoration of stability in Cambodia. Uh, the, the provision of an Australian contingent of 495 personnel for the UNTAC Force Communications Unit, along with the Force Commander and six other headquarters staff in Cambodia, a total of 502 ADF personnel, will be by far our largest contribution to a UN peacekeeping activity. And some idea of the extent of the task can be gauged from the fact that UNTAC will be required to canton and disarm up to 200,000 soldiers disarm another 220,000 militia, secure their weapons, perhaps as many as half a million uh, pieces of weaponry, ensure the security of borders, repatriate around 350,000 refugees and re provide for their resettlement, participate in the administration of the country to provide a neutral and secure environment in which free and fair elections can take place. Now, the communications unit which we'll be providing will have a vital role to play uh, I can affirm that there is virtually no infrastructure, virtually no communication system available in the country outside that which is provided uh, by the 65 Australian communicators already there. And those 65 are deployed not just in, in uh, Phnom Penh but in Siem Reap and Batambang uh, and uh, are also located forward with all the factions uh, at their headquarters near the Thai border, north of Phnom Penh at Kompong Tom and in recent days at Sisyphon in support of the first repatriation of refugees. They are performing a vital task in keeping uh, all those bodies in touch one with another, uh, and uh, they'll do that uh, in a, on a larger scale once the main force is in place. The um, four and a half month period which has uh, elapsed while waiting for UNTAC to become operational has resulted in uh, considerable volatility in the security situation inside Cambodia, an escalation in ceasefire violations, particularly at Kompong Tom, where, where Russell uh, Stewart was shot, uh, in fact shot on the day that I left Cambodia, uh, in the afternoon of the same day, and in the same helicopter in which I, I myself flew around. Uh, but um, that current fighting appears to represent a last minute push by the rival factions to influence uh, uh, for influence and territory before UNTAC begins uh, its job. Uh, the fighting that's taken place I don't see as signalling that the peace process is about to break down and all parties uh, indicated as recently as a week ago that they remain committed to the settlement process. Uh, Mr Akashi, the Secretary General's Special Representative and the Military Commander, General Sanderson, are in constant touch with the representatives of all factions working towards full impl implementation of the ceasefire and I pay 
very warm tribute, as I know uh, the leader of the National Party opposite will, to the work uh, which has been done by these soldiers, some of whom have already been serving in those difficult and arduous conditions since November last year, setting up the uh, UN communication system. They've earned the respect and admiration of all elements of the UN force in Cambodia for their dedication and efficiency, and not least, I might add, the uh, great appreciation of the Cambodian people, and, we, and I saw that for myself when I was there. Um, present UN uh, planning is to have the additional Australian contribution moved to Cambodia as soon as practical, and those uh, personnel are now uh, undergoing training. Uh, as you've heard, the UN uh, has set May 1993 as the target date for elections in Cambodia, and we, in we imagine that our troops will be involved for around 18 months, that is to say for six months after the uh, 1993 elections. But delays in that process are possible. It's complex, it's difficult. The force is soon going to face the wet season, which will make movement extremely difficult, and we could be called on to stay longer than that 18 months. The Leader of the Opposition referred to the dangers which confront our personnel. We fully recognise them. Uh, UNTAX function is a, is a peacekeeping function, and uh, uh, our forces are there on the basis that all parties have signed a peace accord. It's in Cambodia, indeed, with the assent of all parties. It's not tasked with enforcing the peace. But peacekeeping does involve risks. And in Cambodia, those include risks posed by mines, on some estimates, something like three million mines, the lack of infrastructure, disease, and so forth. But against that, uh, we need to set the fact that our personnel are professionally very well trained and very well equipped. Uh, and as with our soldiers uh, with Unimic, they'll also be armed for self-defence. I'd simply like here to speak uh, to the House about the work of the Australian men and women who actually carry out the will of the government in important peacekeeping undertakings of this sort. In far-flung corners of the world, in the most inhospitable circumstances, over 100 Australian servicemen and servicewomen are right now making their contribution to international peace and security. Uh, and that's apart from the 65 in uh, Cambodia, we have 12 ADF officers in the Middle East serving with UNSO, uh, 13 <coughs> ADF personnel in the mine clearance training program in Pakistan near the Afghanistan border, and 45 at Peshawar, as the leader says, and 45 ADS communicators in the remote territory of Western Sahara on the uh, Atlantic coast of North Africa. We've also got ADF personnel serving with the UN uh, Special Commission in Iraq when they're required, UNSCOM, and Colonel John Wilson, seconded from UNSO, is commanding the observer group in Yugoslavia. Uh, John Coates, the uh, Chief of the General Staff, and I made a personal inspection of uh, all those troops uh, only a month ago uh, in some of the most inhospitable country uh, that Australian peacekeepers have ever served in. Uh, and uh, it occurred, that, and while our troops don't face the same level uh, of actual hostilities as soldiers deployed in recent wars, including in Iraq or in uh, Vietnam or uh, Korea, uh, bear in mind that the visit we made occurred just days after Israeli forces crushed through US positions in, UN positions in southern Lebanon, putting our forces at risk, and so on and so forth. Well, we're very proud of the work that, uh, of the professional work that they're doing, and uh, I found everywhere I went. Uh, that um, uh, they were spoken extremely highly of. Uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, my time's expired, but I wanted to make clear that um, uh, we're making, uh, as usual, provision for special conditions for our services who are forced serving in Cambodia. A special Cambodia allowance of $65 a day is currently being paid in recognition of those difficult conditions. Uh, that will continue to be paid after the ceasefire at the rate of $60 a day. Uh, in accordance with Cabinet's decision, the Income Tax Act will be as, uh, amended. Speak on the is, is the motion agreed to ask Minister Howard? I don't know if the ayes have it. I'm not sure obliged. I thank the House. Um, that uh, in further recognition of the hazards associated with the deployment and in accordance with Cabinet's decision, the Income Tax Assessment Act will be amended during the session of parliamentary sittings to exempt the pay and allowances earned by Defence Force, Force personnel while they're on operational service. And once a formal ceasefire has been recognised, uh, the Section 79B rebate provisions will apply. Similarly, repatriation benefits will be provided, which are appropriate to the tasks and hazards which will be encountered. 
All members also will receive normal Defence First Force transfer, outlay, field and separation allowances, and rations and quarters charges have been waived for those members who will be living in the field. Pre-embarkation leave and removal entitlements within Australia are also available to members, as are provisions to assist in defraying the loss on sale of a privately owned vehicle. As well as that, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, to provide relief from the conditions in Cambodia, uh, members on a 12-month tour will be entitled to return travel uh, at the Commonwealth's expense once to Australia and once to Singapore. Additional leave will also be provided as either war service leave pre-ceasefire or additional recreation leave post-ceasefire. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the additional cost of deployment of our 502 personnel for a period of 18 months is estimated at around $50 million, of which the United Nations is expected to reimburse uh, a little over $20 million. There could be some variation to these figures depending on uh, uh, for example, whether the United Nations provides transport for our personnel and equipment to Cambodia or whether they ask us to transport them and obtain reimbursement. And I mention here that Defence has received an additional supplementation of $20.3 million as a one-time supplementation for the 1991-92 component of Australia's contribution to UNTAC. Mr Deputy Speaker, I conclude my remarks by reiterating that the active contribution by Australia to the UN peacekeeping forces in Cambodia is a duty uh, which uh, serves not only our own security interests, not just the interests of global security, but also one which shows the Australian nation and the Australian Defence Force, which serves it so well, to be worthy heirs of a moral and political tradition that values the security and peace, peace of other peoples uh, as dearly as we value our own. And this House should not forget, and I know those who will follow me in this debate won't forget, uh, that it's ultimately our men and women in uniform to whom we look for the achievement of peace and security. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend the resolution to the House. The question is the most to be agreed to. The Honourable Leader of the National Party. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. There is no more serious task of a government or a parliament than the commitment of troops to a war or a theatre of war in a peacekeeping role. However, I have to say, Mr Deputy Speaker, this parliament here in the cocoon of Canberra as the seat of government is a long way from the desert minefields of Namibia, the theatre of the Gulf War or the killing fields of Cambodia. It is interesting to reflect, Mr Deputy Speaker, that in fact three times in uh, the last three years the parliament has had to consider a matter of this nature. Firstly, it was uh, the Namibia peacekeeping role and the statement given by the then Prime Minister, Mr Hawke, uh, to the Parliament, to the House of Representatives, on the 6th of March 1989, which enjoyed bipartisan support and led to a very successful Australian peacekeeping role in Namibia. And I was pleased to visit uh, that peacekeeping force and observe firsthand the very difficult and excellent work they were carrying out. The second occasion, of course, was a very special sitting of Parliament on the 21st of January 1991, when uh, the then Prime Minister, Mr Hawke, moved a specific motion with regard to the Gulf War and uh, support for Australian forces serving with the US sanctioned multinational the UN sanctioned multinational forces in the Gulf and which led to a two-day debate which I think was one of the most uh, moving and important debates ever taken place in the House of Representatives which has ever taken place in the House of Representatives and which uh, saw uh, massive support for that particular effort and uh, has helped uh, contribute to the liberation of Kuwait. Well, today, on the 1st of April 1992, I'm pleased to follow the Minister for Defence, Science and Personnel and move a motion granting him an extension of the time uh, of time with regard to the peacekeeping role in UNTAC and Cambodia and canvass the issues involved. So doing, I was particularly pleased to give the opportunity for the Minister to detail some very important aspects which are of great interest to those who are directly involved in the armed forces and uh, I must say that I will make sure, as no doubt the Minister will, that the information that he uh, put down on the floor of the House with regard to repatriation and other important related matters is conveyed to uh, those already in Cambodia and those about to go to Cambodia. Ministers of the Government and all members and senators must realise that as an outcome of this debate on the Government's resolution and the Prime Ministerial statement, rests the fate of many Australians and the possible loss of their lives and their limbs. And that's why it is a deadly serious task 
that we address in terms of this uh, important issue as we consider the role of our defence forces as they go about their assigned tasks. The Liberal and National parties support the government's parliamentary resolution and indeed has always supported in principle the commitment of Australia's defence forces to a peacekeeping role in Cambodia, as indeed we have supported the peace process in uh, Cambodia and the work by and large of the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Gareth Evans, on this matter and the work of many others on this matter as well. Although I have to say, Mr Speaker, it is quite correct, as the Leader of the Opposition pointed out, that certain aspects need to be fleshed out further, certain proper criticisms and comments made, uh, and focus particularly on the exact role of our forces in Cambodia. This is a must for this parliament before this imprimatur is given today. Having been to Cambodia in January of this year, I feel strongly about the tragedy which has befallen the Cambodian people. And I know my colleagues, the member for New England and the member for Kuyong, the member for Dundas, the member for Perth, amongst others, have also made the effort to go to Cambodia over the years and see firsthand the extent of agony which has befallen these uh, wonderful people, the Cambodians, in their beautiful country. I have to say uh, to you that, uh, having been to Cambodia, it's perhaps uh, useful that I briefly paint a picture of the scene in Cambodia circa 1992. On one hand, you have a bustling Phnom Penh emerging from a deep sleep, the capital of uh, Cambodia on the Mekong River. On the other hand, you have upcountry areas which are still very isolated, which are still uh, untouched by any form of major economic development and which are still on a war footing for all intents and purposes. You have a bevy of expatriates and diplomats now swarming into Phnom Penh and occupying the Cambodiana Hotel, the hotel in respect of uh, Cambodia, which the Singaporeans were smart enough to put in place in time for all this uh, effort uh, because it's booked out and contains several uh, embassies uh, on each floor, let alone uh, a wait list every night for uh, their rooms. On the other hand, you have the role of the non-government officers, the NGOs, gradually being squeezed off the map as part of this inevitable process. I want to take this opportunity to salute the work of the non-government officers who, in many years throughout the 80s, carried an enormous burden uh, in providing a degree of relief with little resource to uh, the people of Cambodia who had been battered and belted by the Khmer Rouge and by the Pol Pot regime in the uh, second half of the 70s. There are many still there, still carrying on with their work, with little uh, uh, focus upon them, but I take this opportunity to salute all of those non-government officers, including many Australians, many Italians, many others, who uh, carried uh, that burden in, uh, under great pressure. Mm -hmm. Mr Deputy Speaker, on the uh, transport front, there is, of course, an operational airport at Phnom Penh of reasonable standard. Some other operational airports, such as at Siem Reb, uh, where we landed near Angkor Wat and elsewhere. There is a uh, road and rail infrastructure, which is in many cases almost beyond repair. I think I was the first foreigner in 15 years to indeed be given special permission to catch a train out of Phnom Penh uh, in January and see firsthand the uh, state of disrepair of that rail system. Many of the bridges, of course, have been blown. Uh, many of the bridges have been washed out by the huge floods uh, in recent times, uh, last year and previously. And indeed, Australia is assisting in that right now with the Bailey Bridge uh, project uh, and other related projects. Let me say, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are food shortages. There's an increasing level of corruption as inevitably arises. There are uh, other problems associated with life in Cambodia in 1992. I guess the impression you bring back is from the Cambodians themselves, they are just so damn happy to be alive in 1992 with the faint hope that they might just break through to a genuine and lasting peace and a degree of prosperity after the long night ushered in in 1975 with the Khmer Rouge and the Pol Pot regime and all that's uh, followed uh, the ups and downs since that time. In uh, looking at Cambodia, I have to say that uh, Australia has a legitimate interest, the region has a legitimate interest in seeing and helping this peace process uh, along and uh, in terms of that, as I indicated at the outset, we support the parliamentary resolution on this matter. I want to say uh, there's a group of people who could justifiably be permanently embittered by life's experience. It is in many ways the people of Cambodia. But you ex really do note that they are touched 
by their acceptance of all their difficulties and yet their determination to get on and improve their lot, and I salute that. Injustice in Cambodia, injustice by our standards, their injustice has an entirely different meaning, an entirely different perspective in many ways. So this is a truly historic commitment, both in terms of the size of the United Nations force and the Australian contribution, but also in terms of the size of the challenging task ahead. There has been a discussion between the government and the opposition about the nature of the task and the clarification that our force is not going to be a peacemaking or a peace-fighting uh, role in going into head-to-head -head battle, for example, with the Khmer Rouge, but a peacekeeping role. And it was interesting to hear the Prime Minister respond on that particular point in his statement today. I obviously feel very strongly about this issue, just as I feel an immediate unease about the commitment of Australian troops uh, to Indochina because of the level of danger that uh, they do face. It is a difficult area to make an objective assessment on, and I certainly hope that, uh, that the situation does not deteriorate and it does allow for the peace process to go forward. I've noted particularly the Prime Minister's statement that Australian forces will not be participating in the UN operation in order to enforce or impose the peace in Cambodia, and let's hope that that uh, remains to be the case in practicality because uh, some things can happen very quickly in the circumstances as they unfold in Cambodia, difficult communications and the like, and uh, this position needs to be made very clear. I've also noted the Prime Minister's assurance that if the government concludes that there is no longer a peace to keep in Cambodia, the Australia and other UN forces will have to be withdrawn. I must say that if the government had taken the coalition more closely into its confidence, particularly in regard to these assurances, perhaps uh, there would have been a different perspective on the debate of the last week, but a proper debate as we wanted to insist that the government came back to this parliament with a statement before this UNTAC commitment was made. Mr Speaker, there has been a great deal of work which has gone into preparing the ground in Cambodia for the possibility of this large Australian contingent. I'd like to take this opportunity to commend especially the members of the Australian Mission in Phnom Penh, including the Head of Mission, Mr John Holloway, the Deputy Head of Mission, Mr Nick Warner, Colonel Ernie Chamberlain and many others in that very hard-working and dedicated team who could respond to any situation suddenly arising and extremely efficiently at that. And I'm pleased the minister does associate uh, himself because it is a particularly efficient, effective and small mission uh, building on scarce resources. I also salute the work of Colonel Russell Stewart and the UNIMEC forces, uh, 45 now building up to 60 and 65 and beyond, uh, who had to forge their way ahead and have done very well in so doing. I'd like to uh, say also, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I wish General Sanderson well and congratulate him with regard to his uh, role as UN military commander of UNTAC in a separate role, and also wish him well those six officers which are going to be attached to his headquarter element. I also wish well the police force of 10, I think, which are now going. I assume they're from the federal police, uh, and uh, the electoral officer, who, if my memory serves me right, might have had experience in Namibia, who is now also going to Cambodia to assist with the elections when they take place. Might I also add uh, a mention of an Australian, Mr Brian Murta, who has a uh, particular role with regard to the returnees and facilitating the uh, relocation of returnees and refugees from camps in Thailand and elsewhere back into Cambodia and into some villages which have been rebuilt from prefabs and uh, a whole lot of complex arrangements associated, associated with that difficult task. I warn that this is going to probably have some impact on the political process. Because what you're going to do is create uh, some pressures between the returnees, those who cleared out and are now coming back in as part of the peace process and the build-up to the elections, versus those who slogged it out in the country for one reason or another for all the difficulties of the last uh, 15 years. So there are going to be continuing tensions. I'm sure uh, our Australians in Cambodia are very much aware of that. Importantly, this parliament must never forget that in deploying troops overseas, there are families and loved ones left behind. This is a dangerous task. Defence Force spouses, loved ones and, of course, their children are always mindful of the possibility of a commitment to serve overseas in war or in peacekeeping roles and even related roles, such as with diplomatic missions in very dangerous uh, circumstances. Families experience great stress in these circumstances. Spouses feel great loneliness and isolation and the impact on the children can in some ways be permanent. And I just simply say to those families, to those next to kin, to the children, 
I'm very mindful of that as an ex-Vietnam veteran. Our thoughts are with you as well for your related role in supporting your spouses who are participating in this force. I know that the Minister for Defence, Science and Personnel will be sensitive to these issues, the proper entitlements, the proper repatriation and other arrangements, as he has detailed. And I want to say uh, to the House and to the Parliament there is a genuine desire on, I think, both sides of the House to ensure that those who do go to Cambodia are treated with the greatest understanding, recognition and support which can be provided from a parliament who, at the end of the day, sent them on this important mission. And parliament should not forget that it has made that decision in conjunction with the government of the day and given its imprimatur, and therefore the parliament has responsibilities arising, as indeed the government of the day has responsibilities arising from that decision. Finally, Mr Speaker, let me say there is a narrow window of opportunity for the Cambodian peace process to succeed. Cambodia has arrived at that window of opportunity, but the real danger is that the world will move rapidly on if, for one reason or another, or if one of the key factions involved decides to scuttle the peace process and decides to uh, turn up the hostilities and so jeopardise the placement of the UNTAC force and the procedures building towards elections scheduled for 1993 in Cambodia. I hope that the Cambodians, all of them involved, seize this opportunity. I warn, if they do not, that the world will indeed move on and the, night, the dark night will return to Cambodia, and that is not the wish of anybody. So, Mr Speaker, I support the motion before the House on behalf of the National Party Indeed, uh, the coalition supports the motion. We wish our troops well, who are participating in this UNTAC force, and all Australians who are already in Cambodia. We hope peace will obtain, that the elections will take place in reasonable conditions, and that Cambodia will rejoin the ranks of nations respected around the world and a nation of great interest to Australia being in our region. God bless our forces who will be serving there. The question is the motion we agreed to. The Honourable Member for Cornwall. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I um, also rise to support the Australian initiative in this, uh, in this uh, very important matter of the future of Cambodia. And I want to say that I also wish to thank many people who have been uh, involved in the process of bringing us to this particular point. I had. Um, a close association with Cambodia for a number of years, but uh, it was brought to a head in 1987 when I visited as chairman of the Immigration Committee uh, because of the threat at that time of the closure of the Khoi Dung uh, refugee camp in Thailand, where this created a crisis for Australia as a refugee program as well as for the people there. And I also had the opportunity, in addition to visiting Khoi Dung, to visit the other refugee camps including Site 2, and the full tragedy of the Cambodian crisis came home very much with that visit to Site 2, which was one of the most uh, awful refugee camps uh, in the world, I believe, uh, in terms of the way in which uh, uh, people were living and the uh, extremely poor circumstances. Of course, that particular refugee camp was not recognised as a UNHCR camp unlike Khoi Dung. And as a result of that, people could be not, except in very exceptional circumstances, be taken out of that camp. Because the intention was that the people remain there until such time as a solution was found to the Cambodian crisis and then return to Cambodia. That was fine. But of course, what the people told us when we went there was of the agony of waiting for this solution to the crisis. And there were children that had been born in that camp that are now 10 and 11 and 12 years old, um, born in those camps, have seen nothing else but those camps. And they are now in a situation where they are finally able to return to what we hope will be a free, democratic and united Cambodia. So, let me say that all those who have been involved in bringing about this result ought to be congratulated. And in particular, of course, as has been mentioned, Senator Evans, the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs. 
when one thinks of the enormity even of the task that's involved in uh, repatriating what uh, has been estimated as 360,000 people, 360,000 people back into Cambodia. And that's one of the most enormous repatriation efforts of recent times. And this is in a country that is still in a very serious conflict situation between the various factions. So, I mean, the task that the United Nations faces is enormous. And I think that Australia has certainly gained enormously in its international standing for the upfront role which we played, not only in helping to bring about a solution, but in actually coming forward and saying, well, we are prepared to commit money and forces to the United Nations for the achievement of this goal. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is a very worthy goal because if there's ever been a historic opportunity for the people of Cambodia to grasp, it is this moment with this particular goal. Now, the leader of the National Party said earlier on that the people of Cambodia have suffered dramatically from tragedy of the last 20 years. Most of that tragedy was created by the interference in the affairs of Cambodia by a number of governments and powers. As I said in a report that I wrote after my visit to the refugee camp, it, Cambodia has been the victim of big power interplay in that part of Asia for many years. And the people of Cambodia were trapped as they were at the time when I wrote the report in 87. They were still trapped at that time in that big power interplay. You had the interests of the Soviet Union, as it then was, the interests of China, the interests of the United States, the interests of Western powers generally, all in conflict with each other. And the people that were paying the price were the people of Cambodia. And it's a very interesting lesson because we seem to have forgotten about that. Some people in recent times have been harking back and saying, well, you know, there are few problems being created in the world now that we've had the end of the Cold War. They forget that during the period of the Cold War, there were certain nations and certain peoples that were paying a very, very big price for the Cold War, and Cambodia was one of them. Because Cambodia has been in a situation where it's been invaded by both sides, or representatives of both sides. It's had governments that have been uh, brought in or toppled by the three main superpowers in the region. Pol Pot was representative of the Chinese interest. Um, the, the government that came in afterwards, ostensibly from Vietnam, had a lot of uh, links with the, the Soviet, the then Soviet interests. Prior to that, the previous government was very much in the American interests. And so you had big power interplay interfering is the correct term, interfering in the internal affairs of Cambodia. And while we've heard a lot about the dreadful, and it was a dreadful Pol Pot regime, I think it's true to also say that during the period of that regime, until the end at least, there was a lot of quiescence by some countries, including um, a number of Western countries, as to what was happening at, in Cambodia. There wasn't enough discussion, there wasn't enough protest about the killing fields. So this is an appropriate time to do a bit of self-criticism and a bit of reflection about what we have done in terms of the people of Cambodia. It's not just us, as I mentioned, all the main superpowers have been involved in an attempt to divide and separate a people that essentially are wonderful people, the people of Cambodia, with a very rich culture, as we know, because they brought this culture here to Australia, Mr Deputy Speaker, and they have actually contributed very much to Australia's multicultural society, the Cambodians that have come here. And when one goes to a Cambodian function here in Australia and one looks at those wonderful people and their culture, one wonders how could it have happened, this dreadful division this awful separation 
which has resulted in this ongoing struggle and conflict and war. But it, the reality is that it has because of big power intervention. I said in 1987, where, which was a pessimistic time, that in fact the initiatives of the former foreign minister, Mr Hayden, should be pursued. Because Mr Hayden began this process and he was determined to try to bring the various factions together. And I think that it's important that we have managed that result. Now it's true that it may not stick. It's true that there may be problems on the way. But we have to really make a maximum effort, and I don't just mean Australia, I mean the international community, the United Nations, to finally assist the people of Cambodia to achieve that result, to shake off the yoke of the past and to achieve a peace amongst themselves as one nation, as one people going forward in a free and democratic election. I think it can happen. I'm not pessimistic. I'm not unrealistic either. I take on board the comments of the Leader of the Opposition when he said we should not be excessively optimistic. But I'm not pessimistic. And one of the reasons I, I believe that we have a right not to be too pessimistic is the fact that we have finished or ended much of the Cold War. And that some of the factors that were playing in the interventions in Cambodia are no longer present. We have a different situation entirely in the former Soviet Union. We have a Vietnam that is now much more ready to negotiate and discuss with the West, and indeed is even having discussions now with the United States. We should grab, uh, grab that opportunity and hopefully move forward in achieving a government that will be representative of the various groupings in, in, in Cambodia on the basis of the support that they have from the Cambodian people. I think that it is very important that we actually take the patience to show the Cambodian people that they are able to have democratic rights. Because for such a long time they didn't believe it. They didn't believe that it was possible. They didn't believe that anyone had their interests at heart. They suspected their neighbours. If you look at the history of, of Cambodia, you see that even before the big power situation, it's always been a, a, a jealous rivalry between Thailand and Vietnam as to who was going to invade or take control of the Cambodian people. And in fact, if you look at recent events, you see some of that rivalry ar arising again. Now what we should say to all of the immediate neighbours of the people of Cambodia is this. Leave the people of Cambodia alone. Let them have their nation. Let them have their right to self-determination. Let there not be excessive intervention. That's why it's important that the United Nations be present, the overall international community, but not the interests of the immediate powers or the interests of the big powers in any big power play has existed in the past. The repatriation of these people is going to be a very difficult process. For one thing, I am reliably told that there are many, many mines and mine, uh, explosive mines all over Cambodia. And so many people will return to their homes or to places that they'll be given to live and they will be in the field working one day and suddenly, bang, a big explosion. Because there are thousands and thousands and thousands of these explosion, explosives that have been put down by the various forces over the years that have come into Cambodia. And so one of the most urgent tasks will be to find these mines and find these explosives and get rid of them so that the people are able to live something approximating a normal life. Mr Deputy Speaker, anyone who's seen the movie The Killing Fields will know of the horror of the Pol Pot regime. 
Order, please. Order, please. Well, I wasn't here with respect to. Uh, well, I didn't rewrite any history, and I'm, Order, I'm sorry that you've introduced that you've introduced a, uh, a a partisan element into what is a serious discussion. Well, you were foreign. The, 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 the honourable Kuyong member for Kuyong, the honourable member for Kuyong has introduced has introduced an unfortunate partisan element into this discussion. Now, the member for Kuyong, I cease in ejecting. I, the member for Kuyong, I, the member, I, the member well, for Kuyong. I want well, the member for Kuyong. On a point of order, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the honourable member for Kuyong has, uh, has persisted in, in interjecting after he's been requested by the chair to cease. I ask you to extend the protection of the chair to the honourable member for Cornwall. Yes, the, the, the minister has got, a, has got a point of order. The, the member for Cornwall is entitled to be heard in silence, as other members have been able to hear, uh, have been heard in this debate. The honourable member for uh, Cornwall. Well, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is a very unfortunate interjection from the from a series of interjections from the member for Kuyong, who, as he knows, was foreign minister during a critical period in which he did nothing to de-recognise the Pol Pot regime if you want to raise this issue. I didn't want to raise this issue in this, in this House in a, bi in a bipartisan debate. But you can, you can go up and try and justify your own record when you were foreign minister with respect to the, the situation of the Pol Pot regime. I said in my earlier comments, if the member had been here, that both sides of this House at that time had been guilty of far too much quiescence in terms of the activities of the Pol Pot regime. And not only this House, but parliaments and governments around the world ought to be ashamed of themselves for the fact that they did not do anything about the activities of the Pol Pot regime. During most of the period in which the Pol Pot regime was in government, you were the foreign minister and you did nothing. Uh, so the honourable member for Kuyong shouldn't be introducing this element. All I say is this. I agree with those people who have said that we have to be very, very careful about the activities of the, of the Pol Pot regime uh, in the past and of the Khmer Rouge in the government of Order, the, new, the, of the new Cambodia. Expired. And we should be very careful about the that. The question is the most me agreed to the Honourable Member Mayor. Thank you, Mr uh, Acting uh, Deputy Speaker. This um, debate is a debate about uh, the Prime Minister's statement on uh, the Australian involvement in the peacekeeping force in Cambodia, and this is a matter of very great significance to the parliament and one that I think we all ought to give a good deal of thought to. As uh, the Leader of the Opposition and the Leader of the National Party have both said, we support uh, the uh, Prime Minister's um, statement and also the resolution. Although, as far as the statement is concerned, we support that um, insofar as it addresses the issues that we think that the government ought rightly to address. In many respects, the statement by the Prime Minister raises more questions than it answers. It's a statement that comes five months too late, five months after the government first indicated it would make a statement. And as I've suggested, it's a statement that uh, is somewhat incomplete, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, we on this side of the House, and I think all people in Australia, welcome the agreement— The, the member for Corwell might either resume his seat or leave the chamber. I'm ceasing ejecting. Welcome the agreement that was reached in Paris on 23 October to, between all parties um, to the uh, Cambodian dispute. And that agreement, without any doubt, has offered hope to a devastated country. A country which, as the member for Cornwall uh, quite rightly said, has been devastated by a range of international events over many years. And we on this side of the House, I think, proudly can say that we have never given any comfort or succour to the Khmer Rouge. The Khmer Rouge, who are without doubt the most genocidal political movement that has ever taken power in any country since the end of the Second World War and on a proportional basis arguably the most genocidal government that has been in power at any time in any country in this century. And during the 1960s, one of the arguments that was often heard from uh, conservatives, liberals in Australia, was an argument about concern should uh, parties such as the Khmer Rouge come to power in Indochina. And to a very great extent, our concerns were vindicated 
and we take no comfort from this by the behaviour of the Khmer Rouge once they did come to power. One might like to reflect on the fact that Jim Cairns, as the Deputy Prime Minister of this country and Deputy Leader of the Labor Party, described the Khmer Rouge at one stage as agrarian democrats, and the former leader of the Labor Party, Mr Whitlam, said in 1970, wrote in 1979 in an article um, in relation to claims that the Khmer Rouge were responsible for genocide in that country, I make bold to doubt all the stories that appear in the newspapers about the treatment of people in Cambodia. Mr Whitlam went on, I am sufficiently hardened to believe that the last refuge of the patriot in Australia is to blast the regimes in post-war Indochina. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, that is not the sort of statement that you would have ever heard from this side of this parliament. Mr Deputy Speaker, the um, proposals that were agreed to on 23 October in Paris were extremely ambitious. The most ambitious uh, task, I, I suggest, that the United Nations has ever undertaken. And for those who are extremely cynical about President Bush's uh, speeches on the New World Order um, following, the, um, following the United Nations resolutions on the Gulf War, their cynicism should be somewhat dispelled by the fact that subsequent to that New World Order, the, uh, as, as President Bush described it, the United Nations was able to formulate this agreement and uh, to undertake a range of responsibilities which I have to say are uh, very ambitious. It is worth our while reflecting on the fact that the United Nations Transitional Authority in Cambodia, UNCTAC as it will increasingly become known, has uh, a, a range of responsibilities which include disarming and demobilising the various factional armies, the Khmer Rouge, which is the most powerful um, of the armies militarily, the uh, Vietnamese installed government, the uh, Sihanouk loyalists and the Khmer People's National Liberation Front, all of their armies are to be disarmed and demobilised, as the Prime Minister said, to the extent of 70 per cent. The second function of uh, UNTAC is the repatriation of 370,000 refugees by the time the elections are due to take place in Cambodia this time next year. That is a massive task. The um, UNTAC, UNTAC will also have the responsibility of controlling the ceasefire, of veri verifying the withdrawal of foreign forces, of organising the elections by April 1993, and it will also have the enormous role of uh, trying to neutralise the political environment by taking control of five key areas of administration in Cambodia – foreign affairs, uh, defence, internal security, information and finance. And as I said earlier, these roles being undertaken by the United Nations are unprecedented in the history of that uh, organisation. The elections that uh, have been foreshadowed in the Paris Agreement are due around April next year, as I mentioned. But at this stage, we don't know when the structure for those elections is going to be put in place. We don't know how they will be conducted and they, we don't know who will uh, precisely be responsible for a range of the functions that UNTAC has, uh, or the tasks that UNTAC has uh, set itself. And in the Prime Minister's statement, he gives no answers to those questions, presumably because the Australian government does not know what the answers to those questions are, largely because many of those questions have simply yet to be resolved. And there are four questions that I think fundamentally need to be answered by the government in order to give greater comfort to Australians about the likely success of uh, our participation in uh, UNTAC, the uh, success of the expedition by 495 Australian troops and uh, ultimately the successful outcome of the Paris pr uh, peace process. And the four questions I want to go through are these, and I hope that the government will uh, come back to, and the Prime Minister in particular will come back to this House soon and provide answers to these questions. First of all, there is a question as to whether the current timetable, culminating with elections due in April 1993, can actually be met. Already there have been substantial delays in establishing UNTAC, 
and uh, the, uh, it was uh, generally envisaged that the peacekeeping force would be in place well and truly by now, the beginning of April 1992, yet uh, really that process has barely begun. The timetable is a very significant factor because if it is not met, then not only will the costs of this exercise blow out, and that is perhaps one could say merely a financial consideration, but uh, also, more seriously, the prospects of maintaining a secure peace in Cambodia will begin to diminish, because the longer that the United Nations process is delayed, the longer the vac a vacuum will remain in Cambodia and the greater the likelihood that the peace process will break down. Now, these delays have brought us up right against the monsoon season, which will begin at the end of April or in early May and last right through until September. And I have to say, it is a bold person who believes that the 370,000 refugees can be repatriated between now and this time next year, when that process of repatriation has barely started, and yet they have to be repatriated fully repatriated for the democratic process to take its course in Cambodia in April of next year. And it raises very real questions too um, as to whether it will be possible to disarm completely or by a degree of 70 per cent the four um, Cambodian factions, again by uh, uh, some period much closer to now than April next year. There are many signs of ugly incidents taking place in Cambodia today. I don't think uh, it would um, do the cause of uh, peace in Cambodia any good to exaggerate those incidents, but uh, the fact is that they uh, underline the need for the timetable to be met as expeditiously as possible, but the difficulties that we face in ensuring that it is met. Now, the second question is the, that the government hasn't addressed in, this, in the statement is the uh, nature of the administration of government in Cambodia. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier the great task that the United Nations was going to undertake in uh, administering Cambodia in five different areas over the, um, over the next 12, sometime over the next 12-month period. But the fact is the United Nations has not even started the planning process for that uh, interim administration. We don't know who will be involved in it. We don't know when it will be established. We don't know how it will work. And given that the United Nations hasn't even started the planning process, I must say that does raise very real questions as to whether the April 1993 deadline can be met for the election. And the third uh, concern that uh, I certainly have is that the um, commitments of troops to uh, carry out the functions of UNTAC um, are at this stage very, fa very fuzzy. Um, it's claimed in the Prime Minister's statement, or it's said in the Prime Minister's statement, that the objective of UNTAC is to have 15,000 troops. Now, we know that Australia is committing 495, we know that New Zealand is committing 40, Indonesia 800, Malaysia 800, um, I believe France has some troops already on the ground in Cambodia, but uh, in total, there are indications of some 4,000 troops being committed to Cambodia. But we have no idea at all, absolutely no idea, where the uh, other 11,000 troops are coming from. I thought the Prime Minister would say something about that in the statement. After all, 52 invitations have been issued to countries around the world to send troops to fulfil the obligations of UNTAC. And uh, so far, we, don't know, uh, we certainly don't know where the bulk of those troops are going to come from. And given that we are making this commitment, this upfront commitment, uh, right away, given that, well, I'm finding it very hard to make a speech with you talking. Um, given that uh, we um, made, have made that, uh, that commitment, I think it would be useful for the Prime Minister to come back as soon as possible to the House and tell us where uh, the other commitments from other countries are going to come from. And the fourth concern, which wasn't addressed in the Prime Minister's statement, is the question of money. It's said that something like $1.9 billion will be required in order to finance uh, the UNTAC exercise, and so far we know that $35 million have been committed and no more than that. So uh, these are four questions that in the Prime Minister's statement um, are, uh, have simply not been addressed. Now I believe they haven't been addressed 
because the government doesn't have any idea what the answers to those questions happen to be. Um, but, uh, the, so the sooner, uh, the, as soon as uh, the government can establish the answers to those questions, they should come back into the House and uh, make an appropriate statement. Well, the Prime Minister specifically should do that. So, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, they are the priorities for the government at the moment. The statement is good as far as it goes. The resolution is a resolution that we on this side of the House are very happy to support. But there is a great deal more information that we need to have in order to uh, be satisfied that this overall exercise in Cambodia can turn out to be a successful exercise in, it, in terms of achieving the um, objectives of the Paris Peace Conference of October last year. I uh, agree with other members in this debate who have said that uh, we really do very uh, earnestly believe that this is the one chance for Cambodia finally to achieve a, a peaceful uh, government. It is a country which has been through the most horrendous of circumstances, the like of which are not equaled by any country, certainly since the Second World War, and it deserves every opportunity to have a peaceful future. We are right to make a commitment as a country to help Cambodia to achieve that uh, positive future. It's important for us in our region to make a contribution. It is important for us to undertake responsibilities in the Asian and Asia-Pacific region to help to achieve peace, to help to achieve settlements in these disputed cases. If we weren't to do that, then I believe we would be abrogating our responsibilities and not encouraging, I must say, um, the uh, long-term peace of the region. And, uh, in conclusion, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I join with other members in wishing the Australian troops well and uh, a safe return to Australia um, and a re reunification with their families and their friends. The question is the motion be agreed to. All of those opinions say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Speaker has received messages from the Senate retaining the following bills without amendment or request. Primary Industries and Energy Legislation Amendment No. 2, 1991. Poultry Industry Assistance Amendment 1991, Coarse Grains Levy 1992, Coarse Grains Levy Consequential uh, Provisions 1992. The Speaker has received a letter from the Honourable Member for Barker proposing that a definite matter of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the Prime Minister's failure to implement tariff protection policies which are in the long-term interest of all Australians, in particular the one million Australians who are out of work. I call upon those members who approve of the proposed discussion to rise in their places. Yeah. The question is motion be agreed. The Honourable Member for Barker. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to support uh, this matter of public importance. When the Prime Minister went to the electorate of Wills the other day, uh, he suddenly came to believe that uh, a tyre factory down there that produces 26,000 tyres per day required a 15 per cent tariff forever to stay in business. That is the conclusion that he, he has reached after all of the time uh, and all of the occasions on when he, when he has said other things. And you would think that uh, there is some illogicality in that. Uh, we understand why it is, because the tyre industry is part of the auto industry and uh, the government has come to the conclusion that the auto industry forever shall remain at that level of tariff support, as it has come to the conclusion that the textile, clothing and footwear er er areas will have a 15 to 25 per cent tariff support, uh, even though, as I will come to a little later, uh, the Minister for Industry and Commerce does not seem to quite agree with the Prime Minister. But you would think that there was some small illogicality in the fact that tyres, for example, will stay forever at 15 per cent, when refrigerators or freezers or dishwashers or pumps or stainless steel or a myriad of other manufacturers in this country, manufacturers in this country, will come down to 5 per cent. You would think that there is some illogicality that the fruit industry and the sugar industry and the dairy industry is being told that it will take the tariff drops on the chin and, on the other hand, that somebody that is making tyres uh, near and about 
the electorate of Wills will keep a tariff of 15 per cent and that in some other industries those making thongs or t-shirts will have an even higher rate of tariff protection. You would think, Mr Deputy Speaker, that somebody who is making bearings for compressors might have an equivalent level of protection, if protection is going to save anybody, as those people who are making bearings for the, bearings for the auto industry. I mean, you would think that that would be a logical conclusion. So how is it good for manufacturers of electric motors or forklift trucks to lose their protection to 5 per cent, whereas the automotive industry should keep theirs at 15 per cent? How is it logical for people who are making air conditioners or clothes dryers or clothes hoists or cranes or light fittings or pumps? Pumps are a good example. We're very good at making pumps in this country. In fact, we have a pump manufacturing business in this country that is one of 26 all over the world, same, owned by the same ownership. Our unit labour costs, of course, are the second lowest in the world in that, man, in that manufacturing, uh, pump manufacturing industry, and that, of course, is why those, that protective mechanism can come down. But I still ask the question, why is it logical for those people to have certain levels of protection that is lower than only two industries in Australia, only two industries in Australia. So we have made an exception at Wills. We have made an exception at Wills for two industries. Now we understand, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we understand that if in those areas where protection has existed for a long time, that it must come down slowly. We understand that it must be predictable and that people can see what's happening. But we don't understand why 80 per cent of manufacturing why 80 per cent of manufacturing should come down to 5 per cent or lower and two industries only should stay at 15 or even up to 25 per cent. We don't find that very logical. Not only 18 per cent of manufacturing, but if you take it as a proportion of total business activity in Australia, it's probably a maximum of 3 per cent. So what we're saying is that the 200,000 people and their managers that are employed in those two businesses can have special protective arrangements. But all of the other six million that are working in all of the other industry in Australia can't. So by what stretch of genius is it good for those industries to have those special arrangements? But even more so, even more so, by what stretch of great logic is it sensible for those two industries, those two industries, the TCF industry and the auto industry, to come down from a protective arrangement of 250 per cent in both cases effective protection to in one case 15 per cent and in another case 15 to 25 per cent, by what stretch of logic or genius can you reduce the effective tariff rate by that amount and still come up to us and say that the last 15 per cent or the last 25 per cent in those two industries only will save them? I think that you can't. In fact, you can only come to the conclusion that it is a fabulous feat of mathematical dyslexia on the part of, of, the, of the Labor Party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, you know that, it is, that it, as it is so illogical, as it is so illogical, you can only do it if you have another agenda. You can only do it if you have another policy. You can only do it if you have a policy for votes. And, and the principle is no different to the principle that Senator Richardson ran with in the environment industry, in his industry, industry too. For two elections or three, he ran on the principle of votes, and the result will be the same as Richardson has produced. It, it is, the insecurity will be the same. And now what will happen, of course, is that we'll have all of those industries. Many of those industries have already started. All of those agricultural industries have had their protection coming down, and some of those other manufacturing industries, as they've already started knocking on your door, not ours, because we're consistent, they'll be knocking on your door saying, where's our protection? Why are you being inconsistent? You sold it to us on the basis that protection had to come down across the board. So I want everyone in this country to know that your government is going to take away protection from all of those other peoples, 80 per cent of manufacturing, from all of those other people, 80 per cent of manu manufacturing, 
but leave protection in just two chosen industries that simply happen to be occupying various trenches around the, around the electorate of wills. And of course, that's the logic of it. That is the logic of the Labor Party. The illogicality, of course, is that previously, when the Labor Party and everybody else said that protection had to come down, they were right. The illogicality is you won't do one thing for those people in those industries. You will lead them, as protection has done in the past, to a false sense of security. In fact, the question that was asked of the Prime Minister, which he misunderstood earlier today, was why is it that people in the food and beverage industry, the people in the food and beverage manufacturing industry, have managed to put on 12,500 jobs during his recession, whereas the example of the most protected industry, the TCF industry, has lost exactly the same number of jobs. The reason, of course, is that uh, obviously they're doing well. Obviously they're profitable. Because, as Brian Loughton said the other day, profit means jobs. And so what you've done is uh, you've put a, a cloud around the direction that the protection debate was going, the factual, factual direction that protection was going, uh, and you've now uh, started a run for Canberra. Well, they can come to your office, not to ours. They can come to your office. They'll be running up there by the, by the thousand demanding some more protection. And you are selling the people of wills a lie. You are telling them that you are going to protect their jobs forever, in fact. And that, of course, is just nonsense. And, of course, uh, of recent times, uh, we have this confusion, the confusion between the Prime Minister and Senator Button. The Prime Minister has repeatedly said, repeatedly said, no matter what he says here at the dispatch box, that we will see protection go to 5 per cent, he said in April 1991, to see it abolished, to see a free flow of goods as well as a free flow of funds in this country. Frankly, he said we're better off without them, the DCF industries. This was on the 14th of March last year, and having national resources go into something that is competitive and which will employ people. Later he said, we've opened up Australia, and yet they talk about us taking steps in the right direction. He said that this ends, the package last year, ends forever. Australia's sorry association with a tariff as a device for Australia's industrial development. By turning its back on tariffs, he said, Australia will be further propelled in its quest for international trade and efficiency, and so on and so on. And within this decade, Australia will have announced once and for all, he said, the fallacious doctrine that prosperity can be, fall, can be found behind the insular wall of protection. But he hasn't, of course, renounced it. He's renounced it there once, and then when it comes to the electorate of wills, he's put it aside. You can go on. I've got myriads of quotes by the Prime Minister on that very subject. But, of course, on the other hand, we have the good senator, Senator Button, who, when asked whether he agreed that Mr Keating's claims that the program of tariffs, tariff cuts would finish when the current tar targets were achieved, said, Senator Button said that these were matters for assessment when the current tariff reductions had been completed. You cannot, he said, in 1992, make assessments about the state of the world in the year 2001. He was referring to us. He was referring to the fact that we had a set position. But the Prime Minister has said up here in the last four or five days that he has a set position on exactly that matter. So is Button right or is the Prime Minister right? Is the Senator right or is the Prime Minister right? And let's just make sure that we understand exactly what the Prime Minister has said here. On the 30th of March, he said it completes the program, that is, the end points, 25, 15, 5 and 0, with the completion of the program. Now, just briefly, Mr Deputy Speaker, on the subject of protection. The most senior businessman in this country made a statement about it last week. He was asked about it. Can Australia's industry survive with zero tariffs or not? He said, well, industry can live with zero tariffs. This is Mr John Prescott only provided many other things happen as well. 
and there are not clear signs that those other things are happening to the extent that would be required to sustain a zero tariff regime, in my view. What are those things, said the journalist? Well, they include a heightened pace of micro reform. They include more improvement in, improvements in transport, the supporting in, infrastructure, and in particular, they include a removal of some of the taxes on inputs to manufacturing that don't simply exist in other countries. That is our policy. That is exactly correct. And so what are we going to do about this issue? We've got to understand what it causes. Protection costs consumers nearly $11 billion every year or $650 per person. Textile clothing and footwear, $260. Each car costs Australians $4,000 more than it need to cost. In the end, if you get rid of that protection over time, those extra costs should be, limited, should be eliminated. The consumer effect of, of protection, tax effect of protection, is regressive. It falls most heavily on the least advantaged. Cars and textiles and clothing and footwear have fared particularly badly in Mr Keating's recession, far worse than the average for most manufacturers. And as I said earlier, footwear employment has halved in the last uh, two years, in just two years, despite that very high protection. And not only that, protection has turned out over all of this time to be a tax on exports. In 1985, it was found that the, it was to cost the farmers 9,000 a year, probably still six, maybe 7,000 a year. So what are we doing? We are taxing exports, we are taxing manufacturing exports by continuing with protection. The thing to do, Mr Deputy Chairman, is slowly but surely remove it, predictably. Don't change the game. Don't say one minute it's over and one minute we're starting up again. But change the game and get rid of the input taxes on manufacturing that give them a chance to export. If protection is a tax on exports, it must be got rid of like any other tax on exports. Jobs are going to be saved and then made in Australia, not by being defensive, not by being non-aggressive, but by being aggressive and competitive, outward-looking outward -looking and exporting. Business taxes down $20 billion, including tariffs, for a competitive nation. Our Australia ought to be that sort of Australia of the future. The Hon. Minister of Science and Technology. Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to congratulate the Honourable Member for Barker for actually, actually getting to the barrier on this matter of public importance today. Honourable Members might recall that yesterday the, uh, the uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition uh, couldn't get to the barrier to, uh, to even propose his, uh, his matter. I also want to congratulate those 14 courageous souls who, uh, who arrived in time to stand in support of the Honourable Member for Barker and to to hear him uh, tell Australia that we don't need an automotive or a uh, textile clothing and footwear industry, in fact that to keep those industries, he says, would be illogical and inconsistent. I want to congratulate those people for their courage because they will need all of the courage that they can muster as they go out to Wills and other parts of the country and tell, uh, tell some 200,000 people that the opposition is going to kill their industries. I turn to the uh, I turn to the uh, to the uh, the subject of this matter of importance, the Prime Minister's alleged uh, failure on tariff uh, reform, and I point out to the House that the government has a program of reductions in place, firmly in place, to create a climate of certainty for investment. A program of continuing reduction. I remind the House from the enormous levels the enormous levels of protection that applied during the Fraser years the government's program of reductions is allowing and will continue to allow industry to prosper much has been said on this issue uh, during uh, during the week mr deputy speaker uh, the prime minister on monday reminded the house of the record of this government he reminded the house of the uh, of the tariff levels which uh, which obtained in 1983-84, the effective levels of which, with respect to clothing, was 222 per cent, falling to 52 per cent 
as a result of the March 1991 program. For clothing and footwear, it was 227 per cent, down to 50. With respect to motor vehicles, it's fallen from 250 per cent to 36 per cent. The Leader of the Opposition, as an adviser to the former tre Treasurer when the Coalition were in government, did not decrease tariff protection but actually increased it, increased it during their period of office. We brought it down to 25 per cent for textiles, 15 per cent for motor cars, 5 per cent for general manufacturing and zero for developing country preferences. We announced it. We said it was the end of the section. What we've also said is that we will not go on to wipe out the motor vehicle industry. We will not wipe that industry out. We're not going to zero levels by the year 2000. The opposition are saying, let's have zero protection levels by the year 2000. Let's not wonder whether or not we might actually snuff out a state-of-the-art plant that might rebuild the Australian motor vehicle industry. Let's not consider the Falcon replacement by Ford. Let's just, in our, in, in our ideological obsession and our blank laziness, and having never touched those tariffs in the past, let's just cheaply one-up the government by saying zero. Well, we spent 10 years getting those 250 per cent levels down. The opposition offers the cheap one up. Let's turn to the record uh, of, the, of the Fraser years, that dismal record. It was outlined very well by the Treasurer in an excellent speech on the 27th of March. And the Treasurer said, this country has progressed from the stagnation born of economic introspection and political defeatism to the dynamism which has emerged from outward economic orientation and renewed political confidence. When our government took office in 1983, Australia's merchandise exports as a proportion of GDP had failed to grow in nearly 30 years. That's an outstanding tribute to the Liberal and National Party governments of the past. Elsewhere in the developed Thanks. world, exports were growing at one and a half times GDP growth. This government inherited an industrial structure in which tariffs of 30 per cent or higher were common. Imports of cars, textiles, clothing and footwear were rigidly controlled. Vehicle manufacturers were guaranteed 80 per cent of the Australian market by the assurance that imports in excess of 20 per cent of the market would face penalty tariffs of 150 per cent. By July 1st this year, there will be a ceiling on most tariffs of 15 per cent. That ceiling will fall to 5 per cent in a few short years. Tariffs on motor cars will fall from 35 per cent this year to 15 per cent by the end of the century. But the greatest applause should be reserved for the Australian companies which brought Australia back into the club of trading nations in the 80s. Trade growth during our period of government has significantly outstripped GDP growth at a time when GDP growth has been impressive. A comparison between the last five years of the Fraser government and the most recent five-year period is an illuminating one. Total exports in the, five years, in the last five years of the Fraser government uh, to 83 increased by an average of 2 per cent a year. In the last five years, they have grown annually by 7 per cent. Within manufacturing, the contrast is even more sharp. In the five years to 83, exports of the metals iron and steel, aluminium and so on grew by 4.2 per cent per year. The last five years have produced annual growth of 7.2 per cent. Under Fraser, exports of more sophisticated manufacturers grew at an annual rate of 5.5 per cent a year. Under this government, at 15. In each recent year that Australian firms achieved these growth figures, officials from Treasury and other departments have advised the government that such a spectacular rate of growth may not be maintained. In each year, they have been pleased to note that their caution has been misplaced. In the eight Fraser years, the growth in total exports in constant prices was 29 per cent. In the eight years since, total exports rose by 70 per cent. For manufactured exports, growth was 47 per cent under Fraser and 111 per cent under us. Exports of more sophisticated goods and manufactured products have grown by an annualised rate of 16 per cent this financial year. Let's turn to, more de to the manufacturing sector in a little more detail, as since it was referred to by the honourable member for Barker. Exports of, 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 manufactured, uh, of manufacturers have grown at an annual rate of 10.5 per cent since our period, uh, period in, in government. 
Between 82 and 83 and 1991, manufactured export volumes have grown at a rate faster than that, those of Japan, Germany, France, Britain, Italy and Canada. In the past two years, export volume growth of manufacturers has accelerated, growing by more than 20 per cent a year, the fastest rate of any country in the OECD. This strong export growth has been accompanied by a change away from low value added products towards high value added and, and elaborately transformed manufacturers and services. The growth in our exports to Asian markets has also been dramatic. Taken together, the ASEAN nations, Japan, Hong Kong, the Republic of Korea and Taiwan, now take nearly 60 per cent of total Australian merchandise exports, exports compared with 43 per cent in 1980-81. This growth is also broadly based and strengthens the prospects for continued growth. Mr Deputy Speaker, the March 1991 industry statement and the 92 One Nation statement are milestones within the, uh, showing the progress of the, uh, of the government's program. The March statement, Building a Competitive Australia, set out a comprehensive package that ends forever Australia's sorry association with the tariff as a device for industrial development. Tariffs for general manufacturing will be reduced by 5 per cent to 5 per cent by 1996, and those for TCF industries will be a maximum of 25 by the year 2000, and for motor vehicles, 15 per cent. This program builds on the reforms already introduced by the Labor government that have worked to better integrate the Australian economy into the world. The success of these reforms has been reflected in the strong growth of, of, uh, of manufactured goods to which I have referred earlier. At the same time, the government recognises that industry needs certainty in order to plan and to invest. Therefore, the government will not be changing its program. It believes that it is already providing the environment where investment decisions will ensure the long-term viability of the TCF and the motor vehicle industries. We will certainly not be adopting the opposition's policies of zero tariffs by the year 2000. If the opposition policies were to be adopted, there would be no TCF and no motor vehicle industries in the wake of their zero tariffs. Our position is quite clear, and Senator Button and the Prime Minister are in agreement. The government has fixed the current phase to end, as I've mentioned, to end at 25, 15, and five. In return, the opposition proposes zero, zero and zero, the triple zero plan for industry destruction, the plan that will destroy TCF and destroy the motor vehicle industry. I point also to initiatives announced, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the One Nation statement, the improved depreciation regime for business assets, the pool development funds and the infrastructure bonds. Our policy, as I've pointed out, is clear and rock solid. On the opposition side, we see a history of lost opportunities and, in the current period, a state of confusion and of conflict, illustrated no better, might I say, by the question from the honourable member for Hawker in this House today on the, uh, on the price impact of tariffs on, uh, on certain articles of women's clothing. I mean, the question failed to uh, failed to recognise the opposition's policy of zero tariffs. It failed to recognise that uh, this policy would destroy the Australian TCF industry, in which the majority of workers, I point out, are women. It fails to recognise, of course, that it would also be women paying a GST on those items. But I turn to the, uh, I turn to the current state of conflict within the opposition, Mr Deputy Speaker. Conflict between the honourable member for Barker and the Opposition Structural Reform Task Force, as reported in the, uh, in the Australian of the 25th of March. And the Australian reports, one senior opposition figure said last night that resistance to the tariff windback wind back was white hot among manufacturers and coalition leaders were battling to hold their ground in meeting with business. There's a view within the Opposition's Industry and Structural Reform Task Force that Mr McLaughlin, a leading economic dry, has approached the issue in a purist and abstract fashion, rather than with a practical view to the needs of recession-strapped industry. Despite the grievances dating back to December, 
It's understood that Mr McLaughlin is still no closer to producing any detailed micro-reform agenda. The concern within the opposition over aspects of Mr McLaughlin's performance has spread to the shadow cabinet. While his front bench colleagues say Mr McLaughlin faces a difficult task in a complex area, some would have preferred him to, to provide more policy detail than he has to date. That's the Australian of the 25th of March. I note that in the wake of that report, the honourable member for Barker is unrepentant. Reported in the Herald of the following day, he's quoted as saying, there will be no change of policy, but there will be better explanation. There will be no change of policy, but there will be better explanation. We didn't hear it today, I must say. There's also conflict between the honourable member for Barker and his state colleagues. I quote Mr uh, Rob Borbridge, the, uh, the opposition leader in Queensland, in the Courier Mail of the 26th of March. And he said that uh, for far too long, economic rationalities had excelled in destroying industries and jobs to justify a philosophy which had been rejected by every successful Western economy, the opposition leader in Queensland. There's conflict uh, between the honourable member for Barker and the leader of the National Party in the Senate, a very significant person in the, oppo in the, in the opposition. This is what Senator Boswell said in Queensland Country Life on the 26th of March. Senator Boswell supporting the retention of the sugar tariff and of, and of QSC's single death selling status, he said, they're expected to be major planks in the National Party's forthcoming sugar industry policy. That's Senator Boswell. Order. More, of, uh, more of Senator Boswell, Mr Deputy Speaker, seeing that members of the National Party enjoy hearing him so much. Senator Boswell on Radio 4 QR on the 27th of March. He was answering a question. The question was, but your own federal coalition is going to reduce those, that's tariffs, to zero by the year 2000, isn't it? Senator Boswell said, well, well I hope that they won't, because what they're saying is that we'll have to rely on anti-dumping. We'll remove tariffs and then have to rely on anti-dumping. Now, that is just not being realistic. Senator Boswell, also in, in conflict uh, with the, uh, the honourable member for Barker. But at least all is well with his leader. At least the honourable member for Barker continue, can continue to happily play Robin to, uh, to Captain Zero. Can I, uh, Mr Speaker, in, in closing, say that the proposition which has been put before us by the opposition today is an absolute nonsense. The government has the record of achievement on tariffs. The opposition does not. The opposition has a clear program on tariffs. The opposition does not. The government has created a climate of certainty, the climate of certainty that industry needs for investment. It has. Uh, it the minister's time has expired. I call the honourable member for Guaida. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, I've listened with some interest to the previous minister's uh, uh, outbursts on uh, his explanation of uh, the better performance of manufacturing exports in recent e years. And I can't help wondering why, if this is largely, as he says, attributable to uh, the winding back of uh, tariff protections, we've suddenly seen the backflip. Why back away from a position which is supposedly producing such magnificent results? I must also observe that manufacturing remains, even now, still only a very small part of the total economy and of our total exports. Mining and agriculture are still suffering from tariff burdens, and they are still sectors which could enormously benefit from and provide a better export performance on the basis of further reforms in tariff regimes. And thirdly, I'd like to note that you said that you haven't changed your long-term plans and to make the observation that you are about the only people who seem to believe that, and I'll come to uh, some of the, uh, the media comment on that matter in a moment. But, Mr Acting Speaker, I wanted to address three essential themes here in the ten minutes available to me. The first is that the Prime Minister's uh, policy dexterity, I think it's called, is having a damaging effect on the credibility of the office, and it is eating like a cancer at the confidence of the Australian people in their national leadership. That matter of confidence is a very important one in the context of the need to push firmly ahead building the new national attitudes that are so vital in underpinning the rebuilding of this nation's economy. Confidence is an absolutely necessary prerequisite for investment. If investment is the engine house of economic growth and job creation, as we're so often told, it should be remembered that it is necessary to understand that investment decisions will be determined 
by the degree of confidence felt by investors. Now that won't be found in the textbooks, and although Senator Button seems to understand it, unfortunately very few opposite do. Button, of course, Senator Button commented in today's Financial Review that investors are aided by a degree of certainty in terms of future plans when it comes to making investment decisions. That's a very important principle that he underlined. Now, given the sort of policy dexterity that we've seen in recent times, the policy dexterity that has surrounded the Prime Minister's commitment to, for example, a goods and services tax, to mining, Coronation Hill, to interest rates, to exchange rate uh, volatility and so forth, that lack of confidence has become something of a hallmark of the Australian community. And my second point this afternoon is that that lack of confidence has now been dramatically escalated by the Prime Minister's sudden backflip on tariffs. And despite what the Minister at the table said, that is the way that it is perceived. Consider the headlines. The Australian Keating backflip on tariffs. The Canberra Times. Tariffs. PM caught out. Keating stand, same as opposition. The Australian, Paul turns on himself and the nation. <laughs> the Australian, tariff wall about face, no protection for Paul. The Sydney Morning Herald, tariff blunders hurt Keating. The age, Keating's past leaves him with no protection. The Australian, Mr Keating's risky politicking. The Australian, tariff switch puts Labor on back foot. The age, tariffs, what are we to believe? The age, Keating whips up by-election fear. The Financial Review, quoted at length, I might add, this article by the Prime Minister himself today, Keating's sleight of hand on protection. Alan Wood, Keating's dangerous tariff trick. So uh, it would appear that there's only a few people in this place, and certainly none outside, who really believe that there hasn't been a backflip. He doesn't believe it himself. This is tragic in a nation whose time to mend its ways, our time to mend our ways, are ticking away. We haven't got long. Our capacity to offer to our young people the sort of chances that we took for granted are fast evaporating. Now, after years of telling Australians that we're going backwards in the world because we have a protectionist mentality, a culture that must be broken, the Prime Minister risks plunging us into the very trap that Garneau actually warned us of. He said the danger is that Australians will think too soon that they have changed enough, that it is enough to weaken the pillars of protectionist minds and policies without bringing the great monuments to past mistakes crashing to the ground. Predictably, the protectionist lobby was very quick to see the opening in the door and is now working overtime to undermine the reform process, which has progressed largely, I might add, by virtue of bipartisan support. The Prime Minister was happy enough to say that that support, to rely on that support when it suited him, now he recklessly throws it away, throws it to the wind in pursuit of a handful of votes in the Victorian heartland of protectionism. Now, tragically, in the end, all this is probably really only a question of rhetoric, as one of the uh, headlines that I just referred to said. Essentially, there's no difference. The Prime Minister's past statements clearly indicate his, uh, his commitment to abolishing protection. And, uh, in any case, there really can't be uh, said to be a great deal of difference between his 5 per cent uh, general uh, manufacturing tariff rates and our commitment to negligible tariffs. The Prime Minister's loudest cries of difference, it seems, are reserved for those areas where we are, in fact, closest. Alan Wood observed in The Australian that even as a short-term political polloi, this is dishonest and deceitful reminiscent of the words, actually, that we heard used uh, in this place today at question time. Wood also observed that the Prime Minister's aims may be short-term, but the political consequences could well extend into the future with a highly detrimental effect on Australia's development in the second half of the 90s. He also used the words ill-judged and contemptible efforts to describe the Prime Minister's actions in this matter. And that brings me to my third theme for the afternoon, the potential for long-term damage to our economic development and therefore future job opportunities for our young people. The immediate financial cost to consumers of protection is easily illustrated and has been done so in this House today in several rather colourful ways. But not so easily illustrated 
but of greater long-term importance is the distortionary impact on investment decisions and therefore prosperities and jobs. Now, Sutsbury, and again that article referred to uh, by Keating today, he didn't refer to the headline simply because it said Keating's sleight of hand. Like uh, yeah, understandably. Records the cost of protection to the consumer in today's, uh, today's edition of the Financial Review. He says, in fact, that the remaining import protection costs to the average Australian amount to hundreds of dollars per year, and goes on to say that it would be cheaper to end protection and give a direct tax funded subsidy of $20,000 to every voter in Wills. But, Mr Acting Speaker, what must never be forgotten, as I mentioned a moment ago, is this other more serious long-term impact of protection, which can be summarised uh, in, in two uh, essential points. Firstly, it diverts labour, capital and management into activities which are less competitive than the alternatives. And secondly, the cost is ultimately borne by the efficient export and import competing industries, the very sectors that I thought we all understood now, we must encourage, we must promote. And it might be added that they need not just the removal of tariffs but also a more efficient and cooperative workplace environment, cheaper money, in other words more sensible interest rates, a more stable investment uh, environment and a more sensible approach to currency management. More efficient infrastructure. Now, the other problem with, uh, with this sort of uh, tariff burden is that it fragments economic activity in such a way that individual sectors are precluded from building up the volume, if you like, the critical mass necessary for them to gain the competitive edge necessary to compete effectively in international markets, which I would have thought was another great need for us to address in this nation. And turning briefly to agriculture, it in particular has suffered badly at the hands of these distortions. In the late 1970s, it was estimated that every Australian farm was paying an average burden of $11,000 as its share of the cost of protection. That's come down a little, but it remains a significant cost. The removal of that burden, plus the implementation of fightbacks reforms, which would, by Treasury's estimates, reduce average farm costs by over $8,000, would greatly aid the rebuilding of the rural sector, which is known as a very efficient export performer. The benefits would range from better export performance, increased employment, better environmental care as farmers were better able to tend to land and soil degradation, and, as the leader of the National Party puts it, it would put the big D back into decentralisation. These are the sorts of potential benefits arising from the removal of distortionary subsidies, protectionist policies, policies and the maintenance of tariffs. The Prime Minister knows it. He must know it. He's spoken about it often enough. His attempt as a Labor leader knowing what is clearly needed to regenerate prosperity and jobs today Order. surely the constitutes a disaster for Australia. Yeah. The Honourable yeah. Member for Burke. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's interesting that there's such a uh, solid contingent from the National Party in here this afternoon to hear this uh, little presentation. It's intended to be symbolic because we well understand on this side of the House that the show over here is falling apart, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's falling apart, and the Nationals are starting to understand what the fight back mix really holds for country people. And I might remind those in the House, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we on this side of the House actually represent more country people than they do. And we, act and we also represent more country people involved in genuine value-adding industries in country areas. And, uh, and so let's have a look at this. Why is there this obsession? Why is there this obsession with tariffs? And I'll tell you why there's an obsession, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because there is this there has been a long history, particularly within the National Party, of clouding decades and decades of protection and support for the farm sector by continually looking at the protection walls that were built around manufacturing and pointing the finger there and saying, look, you get it too. And now, of course, because agriculture has been exposed to uh, international markets and the levels of protection, the levels of subsidy, the rorting of the tax system that went on in agriculture for all those wasted years between 1945 and 1980, now that those things have been wound back, of course what these people have done is said, well, what about you? 
Well, let's have a look at what about you. And I repeat the statistics that were read in the chamber by the minister, Mr Free, earlier. It's all very well, as one of the opposition members said to me before. Why is it that you keep pointing back to the Fraser years? And why is it that you keep referring to this? Well, I'll tell you why. Because that was when you were in <coughs> government. That was when the same people and the same policies were being put forward, and that's when you had the opportunity, and the elector is entitled to ask, well, if you got the chance, what's your credibility on this? Well, let's have a look at your credibility. As the minister said, the clothing, textile, footwear tariff barrier when we came to office was 251 per cent. That's the barrier that was in place in this country. And you have said that. I agree that you've said that. And I'll come to you in a minute, because I've got a little one here for you in a minute. Reduced under the years of, uh, of Paul Keating I'm as Treasurer, eventually. reduced under those years to 50 per cent. Now, in the motor vehicle industry, under the Button car plan, reduced from 250 to 36 and a managed trade-off. And something you lot never talk about. I heard the member for Guida talking about the contribution that agriculture and mining make in our export program, in our export revenue. Yes, of course, they have been the major contributors over time. No one on this side of the House ever though talks about the fact that tourism is now in fact not only labour intensive but is also now the nation's biggest export earner. What's your little dose for tourism? Slap 15 per cent on top of the whole game. Because that's a particular area, the major area of Australia's export earnings that you're not interested in and in fact you would take a real big whip to it because it isn't in your, in your perspective. What's your attitude towards a manufacturing sector that has actually got out and started to chase markets and has produced a 32 per cent increase in manufactured exports out of Australia in 12 months? Never mentioned, never talked about, don't even want to know about it. Well, the fact of the matter is the formula has been working. This nation had to go through a, changed, a process of change. We are seeing the results coming from that change. You never ever talk about the other ingredients of the package that were involved in managing down tariffs in Australia. You never talk about the freeing up of the currency, the exposing of the economy to international deregulation. All the nationals did during those eight years that Australia went through the pain of that financial deregulation was scream that we should let the dollar fall lower. You didn't give a stuff about the rest of Australia. You wanted a 55 per cent dollar. Oh, I'm Mr. sorry. Mr. Could we have better language, language, please? Point of order? Yes, could we have better language, please? Well, the <laughs> language is parliamentary to date. I would have thought so, and I thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. If if the honourable member is, uh, is sensitive, then I'll repeat it. What I said was, you never at any stage concerned yourself about the pain happening in the rest of Australia with a massive increase in the cost of imports that came through deregulation and a 40 per cent devaluation. All you did was march in here into this chamber and complain that the Reserve Bank wasn't letting the dollar fall further. You wanted a 55 per cent dollar, an absolutely selfish motivated position for the farm sector only and the mining sector only. And that was your position right through those seven years. Now we have a uh, freed currency floating freely in the world. Our manufacturing exporters are doing well in that world, and you don't like it. Let's have a look also, Mr Deputy Speaker, at the ingredients. When I raise this question of credibility, when I raise this question of why do we keep comparing the Fraser years, it isn't all that long ago, and the key ingredients of value-adding, the things that the nation had to actually do to start improving the value-adding process, were first of all skills and education. Where were we on that? Your, uh, your interest in skills and education was to give farmers a, uh, a tax deduction for private school fees while the rest of Australia was kicked out of school at year, six, at year, at year uh, 16 years of age, year 10. At an absolute national disgrace that in 1983 less than 30 per cent of Australian students stayed at school to year 12. And what did you ever care about it? Not one scrap. The other side of it, technology and, and advancement. What did you ever do to stimulate 
the investment in technology that took place in this country in the 1980s? And what did you ever do to stimulate the capital base that we are now forcing through the economy with national superannuation? All you did was, was grow a country uh, that was absolutely dependent on foreign borrowings, a country that now has to pay $600 million a month in, uh, in, in repayment of interest and debt. And who were the major borrowers? The mining companies and big agribusiness. And Mr McLaughlin, you know the story of big agribusiness. We had many discussions with you about the problems of, of the overinvestment and the speculators in agribusiness. And let me go now, let me go now to the member for Barker in particular, because I can remember the days when I was on the country task force, the Prime Minister's country task force, and we had many meetings with you across the table. And you complained to us. You complained to us that Australian manufacturers were not up to the game, and that you preferred to get your farm products out into the world as base bulk raw products. You never, at any stage, wanted to encourage value adding in this country. No, it's not rubbish. I can remember. I can remember the NFF putting to us, "We'll export the bales of wool. We'll export the shiploads of wheat and iron ore and coal." and you make sure that the labour force doesn't mess it up. Now, in fact, we have a different approach. We have a different approach. Our Minister Simon Crean has played the role of bringing the farm sector together with manufacturers. We've now actually got the NFF. It now knows how to spell value adding and it now knows, knows that we need to do it in this country. So what I'm saying to you is that we are the ones managing the change. And as I, as I started to allude to earlier, Mr Deputy Speaker, can I go to the final aspect of this debate? Because the member for Gwida brought it up in his uh, contribution, and that was the benefits that he thinks the economy will derive from, uh, from the GST and the fight back package. Well, let me say this. I regard, it, I regard it as a nonsense issue. Quite frankly, we are going to go through an enormous, uh, an enormous political debate in this country in the next uh, six or eight months uh, as the nation decides that it's not interested in whether tax is collected at the point of spending compared to the point of earning. The consumption tax is, as, as the Prime Minister has said many times, a tenth order issue. But you've put it up the top there because you're not prepared to tell small business proprietors that you want them all to become the whole million of them to become tax collectors for the nation. You've not, you've not told anybody that while you're talking about cutting administrative costs, you're actually going to add this cost burden across our whole economy. You keep on wandering in here talking about making us more competitive while you're loading us up with, with a, or proposing to load us up with a tax system that will, will, will Create the work for the forest, uh, the forest, the, t the resource guarantees that you say you need. The fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, GST and fight back has nothing to add to the competitive model of this country. We are making the change. We are succeeding in growing manufacturing exports. Order. We have the now got other export industries, and we're doing it well. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The uh, Mr. Speaker has received the following message from the Senate. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to amend legislation relating to the arts, sport, the environment and territories, and acquaints the House that the Senate has agreed to the bill with the amendment indicated by the next schedule, in which amendment the Senate requests the concurrence of the House of Representatives. Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the amendment be taken into consideration in committee of the whole of the House forthwith. Question is the motion be agreed to those that have been side of the contrary. No, I think the ayes have it. Chairman. Minister. Mr. Mr. Deputy Chairman, I move that the amendment be agreed to. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary. Do you wish to speak? I wish to speak, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Honourable Member for Wannan. Jesus. Mr. Chairman, I just want to very briefly say that. Uh, um, I, the opposition is pleased to note that the government has accepted our amendment that we moved here by my colleague, the member for Pearce, that uh, the minister should have to go into consultation with an appropriate member of the ACT executive government before the National uh, uh, Capital Planning Authority uh, was to make uh, major recommendations in the ACT. But uh, with regard to this amendment, which the Senate has approved, uh, the opposition has no difficulty and uh, 
as uh, all honourable members would uh, no doubt be aware, that uh, this amendment requires that after consultation, uh, written direction to the National Capital Planning Authority should be made available to the public through the Commonwealth of Australia Gazette and, of course, to the Parliament. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that I report a resolution to the House. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Deputy Speaker, I have to report that the committee has agreed to a resolution. Thank you. Minister? Deputy Speaker, I think it would be a good idea if the House uh, was to uh, ad re adopt a report. The question of the motion be agreed to. Those that have been to say aye to the contrary, no, I think the ayes have it. Mr Speaker has received uh, another message from the Senate. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to amend various acts related to law and justice and for related purposes, and acquaints the House that the Senate has agreed to amendment number one made by the House and has agreed to, disagreed to amendment number two, but in place thereof has amended the bill as indicated by the next schedule. The Senate desires the reconsideration by the House of the bill in respect of the amendments disagreed to and the concurrence of the House in the amendment made by the Senate. Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the amendment be taken into consideration in Committee of the Whole. The question is the motion be agreed, I'm sorry, be agreed to. Those who have been to say aye to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Chairman. Minister. The House of Representatives does not insist on its amendment number two disagreed to by the Senate and agrees to the amendment made by the Senate in place thereof. The question is that the uh, motion be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Kuyong. Ah, Mr Chairman, for those uh, uh, who are uninformed in the House as to what this is about, may I simply say this is the saga of the Solicitor General. Uh, the Solicitor General, who uh, on full pay $160,000, was able, with the consent of the Attorney General, to go into the workforce and cream it off uh, for hundreds of thousands of dollars without telling this parliament why. And uh, it should never have occurred. And uh, I, as you may recall, Mr Chairman, uh, sought under the Freedom of Information Act for the reasons for this. I then made all that I had got under that act available uh, to the media. And as a consequence, the Attorney General at last relented and called the Solicitor General back to work. What we are doing by agreeing with what my colleagues in the opposition and the Democrats have insisted upon in the Senate is that henceforth, when the Attorney General does give, if he is so inclined, consent to the Solicitor General to work in private practice, he will, within 15 sitting days, advise both houses of the reasons for this. And uh, we should have got to this point months ago. I won't delay the House. Uh, henceforth, uh, we'll learn of the reasons, and the nice little lurk and deal that was entered into won't happen again. The Sister General, I'm happy to tell you, is back at work, and as I understand it, is earning solely the money for which the public purse pays him, and is not down at Owen Dixon Chambers uh, seeing other clients in private practice. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable the Minister. Uh, Mr Deputy Chairman, I table the explanatory memorandum. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that I report a resolution to the House. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have to report that the committee has agreed to a resolution. Well, Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the report be adopted. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that have been say aye to the contrary, and I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Government business, order of the day number six, supply bill number one, 1992-93, resumption of the debate on second reading. The Honourable Member for Oxley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, 
Before the debate is resumed this bill, I remind the House that it has been agreed that a general debate be allowed covering this bill and orders of the day, numbers seven and eight. I now call the member for Oxford. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm pleased to rise in support of supply bills numbers one and two in the Supply Parliamentary um, Department's bill for 1992-93. Three bills are of a fairly routine nature, and I think it's probably a good thing that we have a wide range of debate on it. But as they seek to provide Commonwealth departments with the necessary finance to continue uh, their, their, their duties up, up until the end of November this year, by which time the budget for 1992-93 will have come into effect. Under the provisions of Supply Bill No. 1, an amount of $12.383 billion, uh, an increase of 2.7 per cent on the previous financial, financial year will be provided for the routine services of government in the areas of defence, employment, education, training, health, housing and community services, veterans affairs, social security and the treasury. The reasons for the increase in expenditure, the increase in costs and prices over the past 12 months, the inclusion of expenditure which uh, appeared in supply bill number two last financial year and the expenditure on programs which have commenced since the introduction of the last supply bill. The Supply Parliamentary Departments Bill provides bridging finance to the Parliamentary Departments until the budget for 1992-93 uh, takes effect. Um, Supply Bill No. 2 makes allowances for payments to the territories and states and expenditure on, on capital works and services for the period from the beginning of, of July through until the end of November this year. This expenditure is in the, in the order of uh, uh, $4,037 million, 17.3 per cent more than, the, than that had been provided in Supply Act No. 2 last year. Out of this increase, $480 million is a result of initiatives not previously included in the annual appropriation bills. Included in the equity injections into the National Rail Network and the $412 million for increased spending on transport infrastructure, spending that was announced in the Prime Minister's One Nation Statement. These bills will complement measures announced in the Prime Minister's One Nation Statement, which outlines the government's economic uh, outlook for the 90s. It's an outlook based on the fundamental belief that it is the duty of government to take an active role in the economy so that business is pr provided with the necessary infrastructure to ensure profitability. The Prime Minister showed that the government is committed to getting, that, to getting the economy going again by taking measures to increase the level of private spending and to increase the, the level of spending on public investment projects. Despite the present economic downturn, the government has achieved much in, performing this, in reforming the Australian economy by means of consultation rather than confrontation. Over 1.6 uh, million jobs were actually created through this process during the 80s. While the present levels of unemployment are unacceptable to all members of this House, the overwhelming number of these jobs still exist. One only, only one out of every nine jobs that this government helped create during the 90s has been lost during the current downturn. The gains that were made during the during the 80s provide a much more solid foundation for recovery than was the case during the previous recession of a decade ago. This government has shown that an increase in economic efficiency can be combined with the goal of a more just society quite successfully. It has done this through its targeting of social security benefits to those most in need, low income earners. The introduction of the Family Allowance Supplement by the government in 1987 has done much to provide financial assistance to low income, to low income earners and, of course, their families. One of the proudest achievements of this Labor government would surely be the introduction of Medicare, which introduced universal health care for all Australians, regardless of their income. These achievements took place in the spirit of cooperation between the government, the business community and the workforce, as represented by the trade union movement. The spirit of cooperation has been exemplified by the accord, which was made to deliver something which no Conservative government has ever been able to achieve, real wage restraint and jobs growth. The threat posed to the gains of the last decade by the opposition's GST package cannot be overstated. Dr Houston is the leader of the most radically extreme right-wing political movement in our, in our country's history. He has made it quite clear that he wants to lead this nation down the path of social division instead of the path of reconciliation. He has wholeheartedly embraced the social and um, Darwinist policies of Thatcher's Britain under which the weak um, get crushed as the strong grow stronger. In his pursuit of economic rationalism, he would dismantle both Medicare and social welfare systems. This would leave many Australians in the situation of being unable to secure adequate finances in which to live, as well as being able to ensure that they receive adequate medical care. Through the application of 
of the Houston model to Australia, the coalition would seek to destroy one of this nation's most enduring institutions, the industrial relations system. Instead of trying to work through the present system to increase the flexibility in, in the bargaining process, as the government has, Dr Houston would leave overwhelming majority of Australian workers at the mercy of the market. This return to confrontation in industrial relations would set us back decades, with many of the gains in productivity which have been made in <coughs> recent years through cooperation between workers and employers being lost. The policies on which the coalition's fight back package are based were to ever be implemented in this country. It would result in a, a ripping apart of the social fabric, the likes of which this country has, has never seen. The difference in the approach of the government and opposition on the issue of how to get this country back on the road to recovery could not be greater. The Prime Minister and his senior ministers consulted with leaders, right. representing a wide cross-section of the society in preparation of the One Nation Statement. The government recognises that the cooperation of all Australians will be required if we are to solve our economic problems. And Dr Houston was quick to condemn the business leaders involved in, in this process, saying the business community should not be talking to the government. He is obviously annoyed that the business community is prepared to talk to the government about the e economic problems faced by Australia and are not prepared to be turned into lackeys of the coalition. The result of this consultative process was, of course, the economic statement delivered by the Prime Minister. This document represents a blueprint for economic recovery. It grants tax relief to, to both small business and ordinary taxpayers, while at the same time ensuring that low-income earners receive relief through an increased increase in the family allowance supplements, which have been paid this week, of course. It reaffirms the government's commitment to vocational education and training, continues with the government's agenda of microeconomic reform and announces significant infrastructure projects which will aid our national development. It achieves all this without seeking to impose on the backs of the poor a 15 per cent consumption tax on the, base, on, on the basis of everyday life. Infrastructure projects announced will promote recovery by providing the private sector with the road, rail and port networks necessary to ensure we do not fall behind our trading partners. The program is designed to get the basic machinery of trade going again, machinery which, is, which was neglected by two generations of conservative governments. The projects of of, of works on a national rail system announced by the Prime Minister will greatly benefit the people of my electorate of Oxley, in particular, should provide a boost to the rail, railway workshops situated in my electorate at Red Bank and, and North Ipswich. The completion of the standard gauge rail network from Brisbane to Perth will result in the fulfilment of a, of a goal which has been talked about uh, for, for, many, for many generations and certainly since Federation. Mr Deputy Speaker, the city of Ipswich has a strong historical association with the coal mining industry, and I notice that the, 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 the secretary at the table too certainly has a keen interest in the coal mining industry, um, as he reminds us uh, regularly. But the various mines in the West Morton region have made a tremendous contribution to our national income through exports to countries such as Japan. Australia's competitive advantage means that the price of our electricity should be amongst the cheapest in the world. Unfortunately, this is not the case. The state-by-state -state base of our electricity generation industry means that Australia has not been able to fully exploit our comparative advantage in coal. The establishment of a national grid for electricity production, as announced in the statement, will result in the development of a national outlook for the supply of electricity. This should be a major boost to the economy of the Ipswich region, and that's because I've got a particular interest there, of course, but containing, as it does, not only a number of highly productive coal mines, but also one of the country's most efficient power generation stations in Swan Bank Power Station. And I think a lot of people have heard of the Swan Bank Power Station because it was a, uh, a lot of uh, uh, electricity workers would remember it well from the days of the uh, Bajelki Peterson regime. Uh, but one area of the economy which will receive substantial relief from the measures announced in the One Nation Statement is the small business sector. The measures came about a result of the consultation process undertaken by the Prime Minister and, and the Minister for Small Business, uh, the Honourable David Bettle, uh, the member for Rankin, who of course is in the neighbouring electorate to me, and of course but the, also with the Small Business Coalition. The relief includes changes to the capital gains tax provisions to increase the exemption on, on, on goodwill realised when the small business is sold to 50% with the ceiling on the, on the net value of businesses qualifying for the relief being doubled to, one, to, two billion, to $2 million. The ceiling will be indexed annually from the beginning of 1993-94 financial year, ensuring that the effects of the measures are not eroded by inflation. 
This change was in response to the concerns of many in the small business community that the introduction of the tax on capital gains had reduced the mobility of capital for small and medium-sized businesses. Another measure designed to ease the tax burden on small business contained in the Prime Minister's economic statement was the deferral of company tax payments for many small businesses. The introduction of the 12-week deferral period is, re is recognition of the impact of the current downturn in slowing down small business receipt of income and restricting their cash flow. This will be a welcome relief for many financially stretched small businesses and will reduce the uncertainty of having to, esti to estimate company tax liabilities within a month of the end of the financial year. Underpinning these moves to simplify the tax system for small business people is the desire on behalf of the federal government to ensure that these measures are administratively uncomplicated and do not impose an expensive compliance burden on small business people. In comparison, small, small businesses would have to cope with an infinitely more complex taxation system under a Houston government, particularly with the GST. But a goods and services tax of the type proposed by the opposition leader would mean that every transaction handled by every business, with, with every cash receipt, every payment being subject to the GST. Small business would be forced to spend an increasing amount of their time and resources on coping with the administrative nightmare that would be presented to them by such a tax. Gross efficiency would, would result, gross inefficiency, I should say, would result as every small business in the country would be forced to become unpaid tax collecting agents for the federal government. Over 20 times the number of businesses presently in, included in the wholesale sales tax system would be caught up in the web of the GST. The introduction of a GST would require accounting for both the GST charged on sales to customers as well as that required in order to claim a rebate on GST paid out by the business on purchases of goods and supplies of services. Many small businesses currently do, do not have any accounting system of the, of the same detailed type used by larger businesses. Currently, their obligation, as far as taxation is concerned, is to lodge an income tax return once a year and to comply with the requirements about tax deductions from wages which can be incorporated into the wages system with minimal difficulty. These businesses would be forced to introduce a whole range of new systems to, to cover the accounting requirements of a GST. Apart from the economic cost, the tax would, be, would also have a tremendous social cost. The small business people, who we all know spend, spend many hours as it is in their business as it is, they would, be, they, would now be, they would now be forced to give up their weekend leisure time in order to cope with their, GS, their, their GST returns. Their Sundays will clearly be spent. Uh, do, doing um, tax returns for the taxation department. Coalition policies would damage the very businesses whose performance is necessary to further stimulate our recovery. The Keating government's willingness to assist small business is evidenced by the decision to establish pool development funds, which will greatly improve capital viability for companies with assets of less than $30 million. The, move, the moves means that firms with a reasonable chance of success will now find it much easier to find the capital they need to expand as there will be a significant tax incentive to invest in Australian businesses and Australian, and, and Australian ideas. This decision gives me a great deal of personal satisfaction so I've, uh, as I have been pushing for such funds uh, to be established for some time. It is regrettable that many ideas and, and inventions have been lost to this country through a lack of capital adequate for their development needs. The establishment of pool development funds will go a long way to, increasing, to, uh, to addressing this problem. In order to ensure the stimulation of the business sector is efficient, it is necessary that the business community has an adequately trained workforce. The government has taken action to establish a national system of TAPE through its offer to the states to take full funding responsibility for the vocational education training system. The new system will, will, be, will be built on the foundations of the existing TAPE system with existing institutions undergoing a significant process of expansion. The extra $720 million being provided by the federal government for the next three years uh, on vocational education and training will be, wel will be, will be welcome used in the Danbeth uh, Tape College in my electorate of Oxley, which has done much to increase the skills levels of the Ipswich workforce over recent years. The announcement of that government, uh, the, the announcement that the government will fund an extra 1,000 tape places next financial year at a cost of $49 million will, I'm sure, be likewise welcomed by the Ipswich community. The Commonwealth's proposal will provide a stable funding base for this important education sector and will allow the expansion and upgrading of the TAFE system. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Ipswich area 
is at present experiencing a significant youth unemployment problem. I know many other areas uh, in Australia have, sim have similar difficulties. But Ipswich Star newspaper, the Queensland Times, recently launched a campaign, Project 500, in conjunction with representatives of the various levels of government, including myself, of course, and uh, government departments, in an attempt to address this issue. The campaign is taking advantage of many of the existing federal government employment programs, such as the Australian Traineeship um, System, New Start, and Craft uh, Apprentice Training Incentives and, and uh, Job Skills programs, along with uh, initiatives taken by the Gospel Labor Government in Queensland. The government has continued its record of, of support for these labour market programs in the One Nation document. It announced a $100 million package that will assist 40,000 young people that will turn around the decline in apprenticeship and traineeship numbers over the last two years. The benefits of this package for the community are, of course, twofold. Firstly, it will increase employment opportunities for young people, and secondly, it will reduce the risk of repeat of the skills shortage faced by the Australian business during the dying days of the Fraser government in the early 80s. Not only the assistance for apprenticeships and traineeships help those out of work, it will also ensure that many apprentices at risk of retrenchment during the downturn will have their jobs saved. The One Nation package increases government assistance to labour market programs by, by, by around 24 per cent, over and above the 62 per cent increase from 1990-91. Labour market measures announced in the statement will directly assist over 350,000 job seekers nationwide. Those opposite, of course, have their own proposals in regards to vocational education training and labour market programs. These proposals would jeopardise training reforms achieved by the government through separating training policy development from the provision of training services, creating duplication and barriers to policy coordination and, and making recognition of the need for training for the unemployed harder to achieve. Funding for the TAFE system would only be increased by a flat $77 million per year, resulting in a real production in TAFE funding during, a, during the Houston government's first term in office. The Coalition's commitment to the, to the dismemberment of the Commonwealth Department of Employment, Education and Training would have grave implications for cohesion in this government policy area. One department would be replaced by three government agencies and an unknown number of private agencies. S seven different categories of government and non-government bodies would be responsible for policy advice and program administration of employment, education and training responsibilities under this plan. DEET, as better known, was established in 1987 in order to develop a more coordinated approach to the, to the interrelated problems of, employment, of unemployment, education and training. The alternative structures under the Fight Back package would impose substantial administrative costs due to duplication and the loss of a coordinated approach to these interrelated um, problems. Instead of the present approach of constructive assistance to the unemployed, Dr Houston would simply force people off benefits without any attempt to improve their skill level or employability. The job seeking functions at present provided free of charge would be abolished under a coalition government, leaving the unemployed to fend for themselves in the employment market. Their, ost their ostrain would, be, um, would, by the opposition's own admission, provide only 10,000 replacements in a full year without the benefit of any, or, or, or the benefit of any on or off the job training whatsoever. Services provided by the government to youth would also be devastated with the CEF Youth Access Centre network being abolished. Now, I'm very pleased with the local youth access centre I have, my electorate, which has recently done a big promotion and, and, and recognition of the good work they're doing. Mr Deputy Speaker, these draconian labour market training policies come about as a result of the free market philosophy that underpins the fight back package. If you read between the lines of the document, the opposition's contempt for the unemployed comes through quite clearly. They believe that the unemployed are fundamentally to blame for their inability to find work and have no comprehension of the social cost of the tragedy of unemployment. The government comparison recognises that the overwhelming majority of the unemployed are out of work because of the structural change at present, uh, at present taking place in the economy, many of which the opposition want to introduce themselves. I wish to turn to the change in Aborigine and Torres Strait Islander policy announced in the statement, just briefly for one moment, and following on from yesterday's statement by the Minister, the Minister for Aborigine Affairs, the Honourable Robert Tickner. I'm sure that all members of this House were as, were as distressed as I was to see some of the media reports recently about how our Aborigine people were being treated. But the problems identified with the program are more complex than, than relations between Aborigines and police, and highlights the need for a public education campaign to inform um, non aboriginal Australians are the plight of the Aborigine people. And I think, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, 
following on from the uh, uh, minister's statement yesterday, I hope that all uh, state governments will respond to that. And certainly, I know that the, uh, there has been bipartisan support from members of this house in, in addressing the problems of the Aboriginal people. And I hope that the uh, all governments, except their res Order. The honourable member's time and, uh, has expired. Ad ad adopt a lot of Order. the uh, recommendations from the Royal Order. Commission. Thank you. The honourable member for Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. You know, the opposition has to sit here day in, day out, when the Parliament's sitting, listening to a whole lot of hogwash coming from the uh, government side of the Parliament. Uh, Today has been a very good example of what's happened uh, in regard to the sort of diatribe of rubbish that we get. And uh, question time was a was a good example of the sort of uh, distortion of the truth that we get about the coalition's proposed fight back package. And, uh, we had the minister assisting the Prime Minister on uh, women's affairs tell us that if the coalition gets into government and implements its fight back package, women wouldn't be wearing bras. That took us to a new height of ridiculousness about the debate that we're having in this place regarding the nature of the coalition's fight back package. The former uh, speaker, the honourable member for Oxley, um, uh, added to the sort of garbage that we have to put up with, and if he believes the sort of things that he's just been telling us about uh, what the coalition's uh, fight-back package would do to Australia if it was implemented, if he actually believes it, then I suggest you go home, take a couple of bexes and have a good lie down, because quite frankly it's completely and utterly untrue, and anybody who believes the sort of distortions that are going on from the government about what the coalition is proposing to do uh, really uh, will be very easily conned by anybody. But you know, uh, there are a few people awake to what's going on in the uh, parliament at the present time from the government. Uh, it's interesting to note that Ross Gittins, in, uh, the uh, economics writer in the Sydney Morning Herald, highly regarded, said on Monday, he said, uh, uh, talking about Mr Keating, he said, rewriting history was always his forte. And indeed, uh, that is true. I mean, we've sat here and listened to Mr Keating uh, rearrange history uh, for years and years and years, and of course he gets away with it a fair bit of the time. But unfortunately, from time to time, things catch up with him, and of course, what's caught up with him is the recession, the recession we had to have, the recession that Mr. Keating told us that he personally engineered, and of course, uh, it's caused a great deal of uh, damage and hardship in our community, and indeed, it's caused uh, tremendous upset within the ranks of the Labor Party. We only had. Uh, uh, yesterday in the papers, Senator Walsh, the former Minister for Finance, coming out and saying that uh, what uh, Mr Keating had been, has been doing to the economy was most unwise and that uh, he used a lot of uh, terms that uh, I think anybody would say was very strong language. He, he said that uh, the sort of things that uh, Mr Keating had done in his, in his One Nation package had been cooked up not by the Treasury but within his own office that uh, he said the whole thing reeked of economic stupidity and political cowardice. And he said that uh, uh, certain aspects of Mr Keating's administration, uh, in, particularly in regard to the uh, Coronation Hill issue, uh, he described in terms of another sop to self-indulgent sanctimonious spivs. Now these are the words of the former Labor Minister for Finance, Senator Walsh, a member of the Labor Party here in Canberra, a man who voted twice for Paul Keating to become Prime Minister of Australia at the expense of Bob Hawke. Now, these are the sorts of things that we see coming out of the government here in Canberra. We've got people like Ross Gittins uh, very uh, perceptively uh, saying things about Mr Keating, such as that uh, he's so desperate to stay Prime Minister he's prepared to say anything. And that's, in fact, actually what's happening. This man, who is now the Prime Minister of Australia, will say anything to anybody at any time if he thinks it's going to help him get a vote further on down the track. And, of course, all of the stuff he says about the opposition's fight-back package is another example of how he's prepared to say and do anything in order to try and win uh, political favour out there in the community. Um, and, indeed, a number of the things that he has said in his One Nation package are worth uh, further examination. And one of the things that's, of course, of great interest uh, to me in the uh, electorate of Gilmore, in the centre of that electorate at Goulburn, that came out of the, uh, the One Nation package, uh, part of which uh, is uh, being uh, debated here in the uh, supply bill tonight, is the funds that will be allocated towards the railway improvements that the Honourable Member for Oxley spoke of in his address and other members 
from both sides of the House have spoken of in their address over the last couple of days. There's an extra $465 million that will be allocated to upgrading the rail link between Brisbane and Perth over the next two years. And indeed, many people would say this is a good idea. This is going to do a great deal of good for Australia's railway industry and indeed for the general, generally for the transport industry as a whole. And indeed, it shall do some good. But one has to ask the question, is it going to be as good as the government says it's going to be? Mr Keating has given us, or the Prime Minister has given us, the impression that this is going to completely transform the rail line between Brisbane and Perth and give us a modern, efficient, uh, reliable railway system operating around Australia, connecting the major capitals uh, by rail. Now, in fact, that is not going to happen as a consequence of the One Nation package that and the monies that have been allocated towards improving our railways. At $465 million is not going to do the job that Mr Keating is alluding it's going to do. For example, if we look at the section of railway that interests me, that is the bit between Sydney and Melbourne, it's 980 kilometres in length, and uh, it's going to have $110 million spent on it. Now, it costs $3 million to build a section of uh, one kilometre $3 million to build one kilometre of railway line. To upgrade a kilometre of railway line costs around $1 million. Now, what that tells us is that uh, we're going to have uh, about 11 per cent of the track upgraded, if that's all they're going to do to the track. And indeed, we know in the area that uh, uh, the Honourable Member for MacArthur has within his electorate that it's not going to be just upgrading. There's going to be a complete realignment of the track and new construction. I think it's around Picton, take out that great big unnecessary loop to try and straighten the uh, line up between uh, Sydney and Melbourne to make the triple lock quicker. And of course that means that $3 million a kilometre is going to have to be spent. Now a great portion of the $110 million is going to be absorbed simply in that Picton area to fix up that loop. In order to fix up the line between Sydney and Melbourne, you have to spend between six and $700 million. And that's just on that section alone. Now, of course, the $465 million spread over two years is not going to go anywhere near fixing up the line between Sydney and Melbourne, let alone the line between Brisbane and Perth. Now, if you compare that with what the Coalition is offering in its fight-back package, and if you use the Treasury papers that the government uh, presented to the Parliament in the last sitting fortnight of the Parliament, you will find that what the Coalition is offering the railway industries of Australia is a net saving of $306 million per annum. Now compare that to the $465 million one-off payment over two years to upgrade our rail line and you can see that the proposals that the Coalition are putting forward will deliver $306 million each year here in, here out um, for our Australia's railway system. So we can do in the course of uh, of uh, one and a half years, uh, what this government is proposing to do in two years, the only difference being on top of that is that we're going to continue to keep on doing it each and every year hereafter because the savings that we will give to railway operations throughout Australia will give them that money each and every year to carry out whatever they feel is necessary in order to make their systems more efficient. So what the coalition is offering is a darn sight better deal for railway operations in Australia than the $465 million one-off over two-year payment that uh, railway is going to get out of this One Nation package. And then, of course, you've got to look at the other aspect of railway operations in Australia, and that is the operating losses. Uh, I am now informed, reliably informed, that Australia's railway systems are losing $5,000 million a year in operating losses. $5,000 million a year represents $300 for every citizen in Australia, man, woman and child. That's what's being lost on our Australian railway system. And yet, does the One Nation package of the Prime Minister address this very serious problem? We are losing the entire value of the Australian wool clip down, down the throat of operating losses on Australia's railway systems. You've asked yourself the question, is this to be addressed by the Prime Minister in his One Nation package? And the simple answer to it is no. The Prime Minister has said, yes, we want to have some new Greenfields uh, industrial relations agreements struck before we'll go ahead with the $465 million being spent. 
But what does a Greenfields Industrial Relations Agreement mean to a Labor Prime Minister? I tell you what, it doesn't mean the sort of things that most people would expect, and that is a wholesale rewriting of industrial relations, not only on the railways but across Australia. Um, what it means is that we're going to find a very watered-down agreement struck, if it's going to be struck at all, with Australia's railway unions to try and implement this $465 million in uh, upgrading of the, of the railway line. Now, of course, the, um, the deadline that was set by the government for these greenfield industrial relations agreements to be established was June of this year, July 1 of this year, I should say. Now, if you look at, um, at what's being reported in the newspapers, both the trade unions involved and indeed the National Rail Freight Corporation are telling us that there's no way in the world that even a preliminary agreement can be struck, um, can be struck before July the 1st in regard to these greenfield industrial relations agreements. Now, what that means is that if they can't strike those agreements, then the money theoretically won't be spent. And indeed, the federal treasurer, Mr. Dawkins, has threatened to reallocate the money elsewhere if the agreement is not reached. And yet, the unions and the National Rail Corporation are saying the agreement can't be struck. And so, if that is the case, then the $465 million that the government is offering in its One Nation package looks like it's not going to be implemented simply because the deadline that's been set is not going to be achieved. The unions cannot and will not strike an agreement with the National Rail Corporation to ensure that that deadline is achieved and those uh, greenfield industrial relations agreements are struck. And the other thing that is also contingent upon uh, having this money spent is that uh, all of the states accelerate their reform process of their rail operations. Now, Mr Spiker, who is the Victorian Minister for Transport, has already said that he will not rationalise his rail routes and provide the sort of accelerated reform process that the government is looking for in order to enable it to go ahead and spend the $465 million. Now, Spiker, who is well known as opposed to all type of reform in the transport system, is determined not to go ahead with those reforms. And if that is the case, then it's quite easy to say that with no Greenfields Industrial Relations Agreement struck by July 1, without uh, any proposal being put forward by the Victorian Minister for Transport to uh, accelerate the rate of reform of his rail system, then this $465 million will be nothing more than a straight-out mirage. And we will not see the money being spent. And even if the money was to be spent, we wouldn't see the type of improvement to the national rail system that the Prime Minister has uh, indicated will actually occur. What we will see is a fairly minor, overall minor, improvement to the national rail system that will not deliver the type of wholesale reform and efficiency gains that the Prime Minister indicated in his One Nation statement. If you then go to the road transport industry, what did the uh, One Nation package of the Prime Ministers offer the road transport industry? Road transport, of course, is a very, very important industry because it delivers the bulk of goods that uh, country people use. It delivers the bulk of our export commodity commodities to the, uh, to the wharves to be exported, and it's uh, the vital link for Australians to keep ourselves uh, provided with all the things that we need for our daily existence. And so one would think that if you're going to do something to try and help the Australian economy, you do something to help the Australian road transport industry. And yet there's nothing in it for the road transport industry. There's no cut in fuel excise, there's no removal of sales taxes, there's no uh, axing of payroll taxes for the road transport industry. All we get is the prospect of another tax that will be introduced very, very shortly towards the middle of this year. And so there's nothing in it for the road transport industry. And once again, if you go to what the coalition is offering in its fight back package and refer to the Treasury papers that the government uses to base its attack on the opposition, you will find that the Treasury estimates that the coalition's fight back package will deliver an advantage of $1147 million per annum to the road transport industry. Now that is a tremendous advantage in anybody's book for the road transport industry. It means that the payroll taxes will be cut out, wholesale taxes will be cut out, that fuel excises will be cut out, that all of the GST will be refunded to those people in the road transport industry. And at the end of the day, for the average truck, 
it will mean a forty to sixty thousand dollar per year saving per truck to road transport operators. Now that is a sizable advantage that's being offered by the coalition in the fight back package, which cannot be matched in anything that the government has offered in its one nation package because there's not one single solitary thing in there that's good news for road transport operators in the One Nation package brought down by the Prime Minister. Go to air transport. All that the uh, One Nation package has done is open up the air routes between us, or promised to negotiate to open up the air routes between Australia and New Zealand. Go to the Treasury, packet, tr Treasury paper, see how they estimate the value of the Coalition's fight back package as far as air transport is concerned, and they estimate that the Australian air transport industry will be benefited to the tune of $376 million per annum. $376 million per annum versus zero from the government's One Nation package. Go to water transport. Very important because this is where our exports go out our front gate. One Nation has offered an extra $20 million a year, or $20 million as a one-off payment, I should say, for retiring wharfies to help fund their redundancy packages. Now, there is not another thing in the One Nation package that deals with our water transport industry. Now, if you go to the uh, fight back package, see what the Treasury Papers has to say about that, they will say that the uh, fight back package put forward by the Coalition offers savings to the water transport industry of $96 million a year. And that is, of course, without taking into account our industrial relations reforms that will uh, take place on the waterfront and within the Australian shipping industry that. Uh, will deliver around about $1,000 million a year in savings to the Australian economy. So you can see from a very quick analysis of the benefits to our infrastructure in Australia of the two packages, Fight Back versus One Nation, that One Nation, according to the government's own Treasury papers, comes down as a, as a complete straight-out winner. I mean, the, the infrastructure of Australia, the transport infrastructure of Australia is a big winner out of the fight back package of the coalitions. Then, of course, if you look at another area of interest that I have, and that is waterfront reform, you'll find that uh, over time the government has been boasting in its usual modest way uh, about the sort of productivity gains that have been achieved on the Australian waterfront under its waterfront reform program. Uh, the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister, Mr Hawke, last year said in his November statement that uh, there had been a 70 per cent gain in productivity on the waterfront. Two days ago, here in the parliament during question time, the current Prime Minister, Mr Keating, said there had been a 50 per cent increase in productivity as a result of the government's waterfront reform program. Senator Collins, the Minister for Shipping and Aviation Support, has said on a number of occasions now that productivity gains of 114 per cent have actually been achieved as a result of the government's waterfront reform program. So those are the boasts, and let's match them up with the truth. The truth is provided to us by the government's own Waterfront Industry Reform Authority, commonly called WIRA, and it'll tell you the sort of productivity gains that have been achieved. And in its latest paper, it says on the US-Australia route, we've had a productivity gain of 12.9 per cent, and on the Far East trade, a productivity gain of 14.7 per cent. And on the Europe to Australia trade, a productivity gain of 41.9 per cent. Now, how do those productivity gains compare with the boasts of Senator Collins at 114 per cent, of the current Prime Minister of 50 per cent, and of the former Prime Minister of 70 per cent? Obviously, the sort of news that we're getting from the Labor Party, be it Prime Ministers or Ministers for Shipping, is totally inflated, totally untrue, and the truth can only be obtained from the government's own Waterfront Industry Reform Authority, which paints a very different picture to the one that the government is trying to create for us. Now, of course, at the end of the day, productivity figures on the waterfront aren't the most important thing. What is the most important thing is the, is the price of getting a container over the Australian waterfront. And to that end, the government has dismally failed. And if I go to a letter that was written by Patrick Slee, Shipping Agencies Proprietary Limited, to the National Farmers Federation in February of this year. And, uh, Patrick's, uh, Patrick Slee says, many of the benefits that have been derived because of the waterfront reform process have been lost to the industry because of Port Authority increased costs. What they're saying is that there are no cost advantages to the users of the waterfront as a result of the government's waterfront reform program. And they say the actual productivity that's being boasted 
by the government is not in line with that being boasted by particular stevedoring terminals. So, in other words, they're saying no cost advantage is being passed on to the users of the waterfront and that productivity gains are being grossly exaggerated. That is the, one of the living examples of the problem that Australia faces, and that is it's not getting the truth from the Prime Minister, it's not getting the truth from this government, it's not getting a fair assessment of Australia's economic problems, and it's not getting the solutions to our economic problems from this government. And the solution will only come in the form of the coalition's fight back package, which seriously addresses for the first time uh, the wholesale reforms that are needed in Australia in order to make Australia competitive, Order. The Honourable productive Member's time and has expired. The Honourable Member for Page. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm happy to rise to support this, this uh, supply bill. As we look to the achievements of the 1980s by the Labor government and consider the real steps forward that have been made and continue to be made, we do come to a clear appreciation that we are a forward-looking government and that we're constantly looking to policies that will advance the prosperity of all Australians. That hasn't ceased now. And even to the present day, the programs enunciated in the One Nation program, the One Nation document, do look to the future, where the government that has brought in the tariff reforms that this nation had an absolute essential requirement for. You've got to remember that the damage done to Australia in those post-war decades can't be overestimated. The coalition governments of the time encouraged our manufacturing industries to be inward-looking, to look only to the domestic market to become inefficient, unable to compete with products in price or quality that the rest of the world were producing. In those post-war decades, when the forward-looking governments of the world were out looking for trade, producing and competing, and ensuring a growing prosperity for their countries. Because of the inability of the coalition governments at the time to see that opportunity, or perhaps because but even, even though they saw it, they were slack, or because of vested interests, they failed to do anything, and in those times Australia really did miss the bus. But now, through the 80s and into the 90s, the government and, the, and Australians are taking up the challenges and the opportunities that are presenting themselves. Australia is becoming competitive over a large range of industries, in quality and in price, with the best the world has to offer. We are becoming an international trader. The costs, and they were immeasurable costs, of those ill-advised policies of those post-war decades were borne by primary industries and by the ordinary consumers of Australia, the families that had to pay the premium of that tariff protection through higher prices. And the beneficiaries of the growing commitment to our low tariff policy will be those same pay people who will pay less for all their needs. And it's all very well for the coalition to look back at our policies now and adopt them and even go further to adopt zero inflation. But actions do speak louder than words, and I think all Australians would have grave doubts as to whether the opposition is fair dinkum. Would they have had the gumption to put those words into practice? Past experience says they wouldn't, and even as late as the Fraser years, tariff protection was increasing. And I believe that the spectre of McEwen still lurks in the opposition benches, and that there is a growing protectionism movement over there, and it's likely to divide them. The real difference in the performance of Australia can be seen in the comparison of coalition and Labor government performance. For the three decades until Labor government took office in 1983, Australian merchandise exports as a proportion of GDP had failed to grow. Now, surely at that time some people in the coalition government would have had the perception to see that there was something wrong with their policy, especially as the same exports in other developed countries were increasing at a, at a rate of one and a half times that of GDP. And that showed real stupidity in allowing that situation to continue. And that situation did, did continue as a direct result of the opposition tariff policy of the time. Increases in exports for the five years of the Fraser government to 1983 rose 2 per cent per year. But in the last five years of this government, they've risen at 7 per cent per year, three and a half times the rate recorded by the Fraser government. 
During the period of the Fraser government, growth in total exports rose 29 per cent. In the same span of eight years under this government, total exports have risen 70 per cent. Australian industry leaders are seeing the light, they're seeing the way ahead, and those exports figures reflect the growing optimism and opportunities that's there for them. The need for Australia to look to the future has never been more pressing because of the reason that we wasted those years when other countries were looking ahead, and under a coalition government we really did stick our heads in the sand, deep in the sand. The One Nation program signals a direction for all Australians. It's about rebuilding efficient transport networks, road and rail improvements that will benefit all industry, primary and manufacturing, through more efficient and cost-effective carriage of goods, improvements that are 50 years overdue and that will ultimately build, benefit all Australians. The $1.1 billion spending on infrastructure is focused on more efficient industry and includes the development of a national standard gauge rail network from Brisbane to Perth and a better and a safer road network. The government has also recognised the ongoing need to improve productivity and the buying of new and modern plant and equipment has a major part to play in those increases in productivity. The changes to depreciation arrangements whereby depreciation is simplified and accelerated encourages investment in modern efficient equipment and the new rates of depreciation which give generous concessions for longer lived assets in particular will encourage investment in new equipment in the rural sector. The clear direction of these and the other policies of the government are forward to a more united, undivided Australia, an Australia that stands alone, is not dependent on others but gains its strength from its own people in a concerted way. If you compare this with the fight back document of the opposition, you see that there is no forward thinking in that document, no thought of building a better Australia, no infrastructure spending, in fact in the land transport area, so important to Australia there's a cut of $74 million. Theirs is a policy to divide Australians, to make the gaps wider. There's no thought of sharing in prosperity, no thought of geographical unification, no thought of Australia becoming competitive. It's a policy that wears a disguise, that purports to give benefits but hides the costs. And the costs are immense. The policy is about the introduction of a new tax, a new tax Australians have, had not, have not had to bear before, a 15 per cent surcharge on everything that people buy, a regressive, unfair tax that hits the low and middle income earners harder than the higher income earner. And there's plenty of examples of that. But one is that a Ferrari will cost $15,000 less, but the family car will cost more. And on those bases, the, bases, the tax is grossly unfair. The tax will hit the staple needs of Australian families, bread, milk, meat, items that have not been taxed by the Labor government. And what's this new tax do to country Australians? It asks them to supplement, to subsidise those people living in cities. The fight back package tells country people that they're going to pay more tax than their city counterparts. And this occurs because of the difference in retail prices between city and country and because this goods and services tax is based on retail prices. Now, retail prices are already higher in the country and the additional new tax will make those differences greater. The goods and services tax adds 15 per cent of the cost of everyday needs. Milk, bread, fruit, vegetables, clothing, and when those items start at a higher price, then it's quite obvious that the gap between city and country prices will widen. In many country areas, retail prices are about 8 per cent or more higher than metropolitan areas. And with the compounding effect of the goods and services tax, that price difference will be 9.2 per cent. In other words, the price differential between city and country will increase by 13 per cent. Now that's grossly unfair to country people, and I think they're entitled to ask the National Party in particular why they haven't asked for compensation in this document for country people from the Leader of the Opposition. Or maybe 
they were aware of these problems and maybe they've gone along with the Liberal leader because for a short while they thought he may give them a victory. But that's rapidly changing and diminishing and the chances of that victory are almost unnoticeable now. So maybe now the National Party will look more carefully at the document and its bad effects on country people. And I want to repeat that it is grossly unfair to country people to make them subsidise through higher taxes those in the cities. And if you compound that item of unfairness with the fact that lower and middle income earners are the ones who are king hit by the fight back package, then you realise the real divisive nature of this policy. Country electorates, and mine's a good example, are made up in the vast majority of low and middle income earners. So that group of people is going to be hit hardest by the goods and services tax. And on top of that, the opposition is going to, as well, tax country people at a higher level. In other words, the goods and services tax cut contains a double hit for the people of my electorate, and the same applies for all country electorates. And you're entitled again to ask the National Party why they allowed the leader of the Liberal Party to get away with this, and even more so why they support this program that is, that is grossly unfair and disadvantageous to country people. Mr Deputy Speaker, the great problem of the 1980s and prior years to that for Australia was inflation. In the late 80s, investment was being placed in assets that people perceived because of inflation they perceived that there would be profits in those investments. Many of those investments were not in the interests of Australia. They were unproductive. They weren't in any way connected with import replacement, export generation, value-adding or the means of really making Australia competitive. The Labor government has now achieved historically low inflation figures. The result of that, coupled with the low interest rates, means that the incentive to invest in those same mistakes of the 80s is no longer pre present. The incentive for investors is now for investment in the real yeah, means yeah. of production, investment that will bring income into Australia, investment that will provide an early resumption to better employment figures. And that framework has been put there by the government for a competitive, industrious, unified Australian through the 1990s and into the next century. And that framework is about forward thinking and about the future. That fr framework can be destroyed if Australia returns to the inflation of the 80s, because investment will once again, in part at least, return to that, those, asset, uh, those assets likely to increase in value because of inflation and not into the means of production, not into the real means of making a quid. Now, people can argue about all sorts of models, but it's obvious that inflation will increase when you increase prices. You can't put a 15 per cent tax on everything and not expect an increase in inflation. Not only that, but it is simply not common sense to argue that this will be a one-off rise. The consumers, the people of Australia, are not going to suddenly find more money to spend, and therefore retail sales will fall. You can't raise a new tax which will collect $40 billion per year at a cost of $23 per week for every man, woman and child, and expect that sales will not fall. The sales may stay at the same level if you include the tax, but the sales that return to a business its profit will fall. <coughs> Thus, from that you will get lower profitability in business, and business people will be entitled to look to cover that increase to cover that loss of profit by increasing their profit margin to cover that fall in sales and also to cover, of course, the not inconsiderable costs in the managing of the paperwork involved in the goods and services tax collection. After all, those business people will all become tax collectors and anyone who says that there are, there'll be very little or no costs involved in that is really not in touch with reality. So for those two reasons at least there will be a continuing increase in retail prices due to the goods and services tax. And continuing inflation will of course 
follow those increases in prices as sure as night follows day. We'll have pressure, of course, also for higher wages. How can you put the spending power, the real wages of ordinary people down and not think they're not going to press for higher wages? Of course they are. And then once again, we'll lower business profitability and once again, business people will be looking to cover that with higher prices and once again, you'll be followed with increased inflation. Now, all that's really only common sense and I'm sure any businessman will tell you that it will happen and yet the opposition deny there will be continuing inflation and it really does demonstrate that the opposition are, to a great extent, out of touch with reality. I'm sure if the members opposite really thought about what I was saying, they would see the truth in it. The result is that the goods and services tax puts, puts Australia back on the path of the inflation roundabout. It dashes the hopes of sound investment. The goods and services takes one almighty step backwards to where Australia was years ago. A return to high inflation for Australia robs us of the op opportunity that are there for us that Australians are grasping now and that they have been grasping and taking those opportunities during the period of this government. The increases in productivity of greater GDP, of increased employment, are all down the drain with the introduction of a goods and services tax. Now, the Leader Opposition does not consult on this program and, as every day go by, goes by, he alienates himself from another group in the community. Dare to criticise the goods and services tax policy, and he takes it quite personally and asserts that criticism is politically based. Of course, the reason he takes it personally is that the fight back document is his personal credo. The dogma contained in the program can't be criticised because you criticise him. It can't be changed in any way because it means changes to him. It contains his catechism and every point is pursued by his missionary zeal. Anyone who questions is treated in much the same way that the inquisitors in the Middle Ages treated people who questioned. Now, the Liberal Party leaders document there is no room for advice to be taken, no room for the opinions of the people it affects. It's obvious that the National Party in particular have great trouble swallowing it, but they have, and they have to the cost of their constituencies. It's a dogma not born from an understanding of the needs of Australia and Australians, but from one man's quest for power. The choice for Australians is becoming clearer as the days go by. On the one hand, a policy of looking ahead to a future where Australia can become a competitive international trader, a nation that produces, adds value, manufactures and strives for, for prosperity for all. On the other hand, we have a divisive program that will accentuate and widen the gaps that only the privileged few can prosper in, a program that takes Australia back to high inflation, high interest rates and dropping GDP and zero employment growth. Employment growth is the end result, the main aim of the programs initiated in the One Nation program, the policies of the government. But that growth cannot be achieved without investment in industry, and that investment in the means of production will only be maximised under a low inflation policy. The opposition policy, as I've shown, will, will result in ongoing inflation, inflation quickly rising once again to double digits, and as a result there will be no investment, no employment growth and no future for Australia. It is divisive by its nature, particularly between country and city. We have, on the one hand, in the first instance, prices in country areas rising at a greater rate in city areas because that 15 per cent uh, applies to the retail price. Country prices, the, the difference in country and city prices will widen by 13 per cent. And I noticed uh, at, at a Coolar meeting recently, the member for Benelong, when asked several questions about cost differentials and disadvantages between city and country prices, said, I don't deny in some cases things will end up being more in the bush than in the cities. And on top of that, you're going to uh, 
by the general trend of the GST, uh, disadvantaged country people, most of whom are in the middle, uh, low and middle income bracket. So you've got that double whammy for country people. It is a policy that won't be accepted by the people of my electorate, won't be accepted by the people of any country electorate, and it really is up to the National Party to start pointing that out to the people in the Liberal Party, the leader of the Liberal Party, and insisting, insisting some compensation in their program is allowed for in, that, in their program for, for country people. Theirs is, a policy that, restrain himself. theirs is a policy that looks backwards for their programs, backwards and to failures overseas for their inspiration. It's bound to failure and the people of Australia are quickly realising this and that's reflected more and more in the polls that are coming to light each day. Order. The honourable member's time has expired. The question is this bill will be narrowed a second time. The honourable member for Deakin. Mr Deputy Speaker, the current debate on the Australian economy should focus on one central aspect the economy's capacity to grow and provide jobs for Australia's citizens. Any other issues are secondary to this. I am particularly concerned, Mr Deputy Speaker, to emphasise this because of the crucial importance that job growth and business expansion have in lifting our economy out of the bleak and demoralising recession that currently dogs our path and clouds our future. Furthermore, Mr Deputy Speaker, it must be emphasised that finally it will not be government tinkering at the edges of our economy but investment and confidence by business, particularly by small business, that will list us out of the rut. The government's policies, when measured against this goal, indicate only that it has been prepared to take a risk for electoral purposes. Faced with impending devastation, it has put together a package with which it hopes to seduce its own disaffected heartland back to the fold. I have no doubt, to Mr Deputy Speaker, it will not work and that the risks will be seen as a gamble they are. When one starts to examine our economy closely, it becomes apparent how much it has been allowed to slide into the depths of inactivity and despair. Perhaps one of the clearest indicators of the health of the Australian industry uh, can be seen by looking at the automotive market. Traditionally, retail sales in the automotive industry have provided a benchmark from which the overall health of the Australian economy can be judged. The fact is, Mr Deputy Speaker, that if we look at the present new vehicle market, the government's record in revitalising Australian business could not, in fact, be worse. The government would actually seem to be becoming aware of the importance of the automotive industry. It announced uh, a reduction in sales tax on motor cars from 20 per cent to 15 per cent in what was clearly an attempt to respond to the opposition's fight-back package in an obvious and rather transparent way. I should make it clear, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, why I believe that it is important to focus on the automotive industry and why its health is crucial to Australia's future. Australians have come to expect, for reasons of geography, topography, climate, distances travelled, purpose of use and access to speedy service, that they should have access to locally manufactured vehicles and a national distribution network. The government has known of the plight of the automotive industry and of dealers since it came to power, and yet after all the inquiries and reviews of the industry, has done little to protect this vital sector of the economy. According to data released by the Paxis Corporation, the automotive industry recorded one of its worst ever years in 1991. Sales of new passenger vehicles were down to 388,269, uh, a drop of 74,237 uh, vehicles, or a massive 16.05%. In the last 17 years, there have been only three occasions when uh, passenger vehicle sales have fallen below 400,000 a year, and each of those occasions, Mr Deputy Speaker, occurred during the period of the Hawke-Keating government. Last week's figures were released, which indicated that, uh, um, that there had been a slight upturn in uh, vehicle sales, and this is to be welcomed. What is not so promising is the fact that customers seem to be showing an increasing preference for foreign cars. According to the figures, again released by Paxis, 13 of 18 local Australian models had sales slumps, including the Ford Laser, which fell 39 per cent, and the Toyota Corolla, which fell 37 per cent. Perhaps part of the reason for this is the fact that the rise in prices of locally produced cars continues to exceed the CPI. On 13 February 1992, the Automotive Industry Authority released figures which indicated that for the 12 months ended uh, December 1991, 
the increase in recommended retail prices of local cars was 4.5 per cent, well over an aggregate consumer price index increase of 1.5 per cent. In contrast, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, recommended retail prices of imported cars increased by only 2.6 per cent in the 12 months of December 1991. Once uh, again, imported cars have gained a further competitive advantage. At a time when the government's handling of the economy has threatened both the profitability of Australia's automotive manufacturers and importers and the thousands of jobs that those companies provide for ordinary Australians, we should not forget the profound impact that the downturn in sales is having on Australia's automobile dealers, their operations and the people they employ. Most uh, recently, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, Nissan has decided that it can no longer uh, continue to manufacture cars in Australia and has announced it will be closing its uh, manufacturing operations. Jobs will be lost uh, not just in the manufacturing uh, plant but in the downstream areas of dealerships, repairs and servicing and in the upstream areas of parts and components manufacturing and supply. As well, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the week since the closure, Nissan has taken the opportunity to embark on a major but yet unannounced program of rationalisation of its dealer franchise network. This has only served to aggravate and deepen the damage already done to Australia's economy by its decision to quit manufacturing in Australia. I believe that uh, already between 60 and 100 dealerships have been abandoned by Nissan without compensation of any kind. It is likely this may result in as many as uh, 2,000 to 3,000 more employees who have given dedicated and loyal service to the car, mark, uh, car maker will now find themselves out of work. I fear, Mr Deputy Speaker, that there are still more to follow in what uh, is one of the most savage reductions in a company's commitment to the Australian market ever seen here. Given these uh, unfortunate consequences, I believe there would be considerable merit in the government extending to automotive retail workers who are retrenched the compensation and retraining benefits available to workers involved in car manufacturing under the Button Car Plan. Such an extension into the retail areas of the automotive industry would recognise it is also undergoing serious structural change as all local manufacturers uh, savagely react to losses they have incurred as a result of the Prime Minister's recession. The Nissan uh, episode, Mr Deputy Speaker, is however only part of the sorry current situation in this vital trade. According to figures which uh, I have tamed from the Motor Trades Association of Australia, in 1984, when this government had only recently come to power, there were 2,650 new vehicle franchise dealers operating approximately 4,000 franchises and employing over 68,000 Australians. By July 1991, Mr Deputy Speaker, after eight years of this government, there are only 1,540 new vehicle franchise dealers in Australia, or at least 1,000 fewer dealers than in 1984. Those dealers now operate 2,754 franchises. Employment in the surviving dealerships has dropped remarkably since 1984, from 68,000 to only 40,000, a net drop of over 40 per cent. The situation is even worse in rural Australia. Here we can find even starker evidence of the recession that Australia is enduring. In 1984, there were 2,400 farm machinery dealers in Australia. In 1991, there were 900, with a loss of about 16,500 jobs from country towns during that period. There is no doubt, to, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the recession has had a marked impact on the automotive industry generally. I mention what uh, Nissan has embarked upon since it closed its manufacturing operation. But uh, it is uh, a matter of national concern the fact that a number of manufacturers and importers in Australia are taking advantage of the economic downturn to rationalise their operations at the expense of the very dealers they have franchised and, as a consequence, those employed by their dealers. On the 11th of November 1991, I drew attention to the plight of a number of new franchised motor vehicle dealers in Australia who have been subjected to unconscionable conduct by their suppliers. I drew attention, Mr Deputy Speaker, to the action which Toyota had taken against the Ken Morgan Group of companies in forcing Mr Morgan to sign a contract under economic duress that effectively led to the receivers being brought in and to the collapse subsequently of his dealership network. In May 1990, uh, uh, you yourself, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, 
uh, in your capacity as uh, the honourable member for Stirling, raise the actions uh, by Honda Australia Proprietary Limited in terminating the franchise agreement of three major uh, motor vehicle dealers in metropolitan Perth. These dealers were given an undertaking by Honda Australia that if they upgraded their premises to a certain standard, uh, their franchise agreements would continue into the future. The dealers spent the money uh, on plant development and site presentation, but nevertheless uh, Honda unilaterally and precipitously decided to terminate those agreements. I understand that at the time there was concern that at least one of those franchises, franchises had been taken up by the Otsuka family of Japan. Since then, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have been advised by Honda Australia that it has not, been forced, uh, has not forced any dealers in Western Australia to sell their businesses to Honda Australia uh, or any Japanese firm, and that the Otsuka family have not at any time in the past nor at the present time owned a Honda franchise in Australia. That may well be so. Uh, uh, however, it does not alter the fact that the action which Honda took against two dealers in Western Australia to terminate their franchise agreements was ill-judged and did considerable harm to franchisor and franchisee relationships. It should also be acknowledged, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that after intervention by the Motor Trades uh, Association of Australia in this matter, the executive director was able to write to Honda acknowledging that the difficulties had been settled cooperatively to the satisfaction of their members. It shows uh, what can be achieved when manufacturers and dealers uh, talk to each other. But at a time when one would expect manufacturers to be trying above all else to build better relations with their franchise dealers to bring about stability and recovery in the marketplace, the action taken by Honda was not an isolated case. Toyota and Mitsubishi also took action against the Northern Territory dealer last year and terminated his agreement without any fair settlement. This action was repeated in Toyota's action against two major dealers in Victoria whose businesses would have remained viable but for the manufacturer's action. In addition, last year Daihatsu also terminated their agreement with a Queensland dealer and took similar action against a dealer in Tasmania. In South Australia, uh, I understand that Alpha Romeo Australia Proprietary Limited has recently decided to terminate its franchise agreement with a prominent industry dealer. Without uh, going to individual cases, what all of these actions illustrate is the problems which franchisees face in regard to the tenure of their franchises and their basic rights as franchisees to make a fair and reasonable return on their capital and labour. Unless dealers have the right to retain sovereignty in their businesses and the right not to be subjected to unconscionable and precipitous action by their suppliers, then the long-term uh, health of those vital Australian businesses will be at risk, and so will the jobs of the thousands of young Australians they employ. I must make clear to honourable members, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this is an issue that the government cannot ignore. It is, in fact, an issue that, as recently as the 6th of February, the Small Business Coalition placed before the government as part of a 20-point agenda of issues which set out those matters which small business feels are inhibiting its capacity to grow and therefore to employ. Among these issues is the need to develop a code of practice to govern franchisor and franchisee relationships. This is not an issue with which the government is unfamiliar. It was central to the issues considered by the President Minister for Small Business and Customs when he previously chaired um, the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Industry, uh, Science and Technology during the period when it conducted its inquiry into small business in Australia. The Minister for Small Business has since appointed a national task force on franchising to investigate a wide range of issues relevant to franchising and which recommended the establishment of self, uh, the self-regulatory code of practice to be administered and maintained by a council of representatives from all areas of the franchising sector. At its meeting with the Prime Minister, the Small Business Coalition asked the government to support this measure and to seek the support of all state governments, trade and business associations and all franchise businesses for the introduction of a voluntary code to be supported where necessary by sanctions applied by all parties against those attempting to circumvent it. On Friday the 13th of March, the Commonwealth State and Territory Ministers of Small Business met and issued a communique which broadly agreed to support the recommendations of the Franchising Task Force report by agreeing to a trial self-regulatory code for the franchising industry. I understand that the Minister of Small Business will be taking the matter to Cabinet shortly. Finally, uh, frankly, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's not before time, and I can only say that the sooner the better, so, long as, uh, so as long as it lasts there will be some action in this area. 
I, for one, will be attempting to remind the minister that action is now due and no slippage is excusable. The opposition, as part of its fight back package, has acknowledged that a voluntary code for franchising must be introduced as soon as possible. The opposition spokesman on small business, the honourable member for Forrest, has committed the opposition to introduce and facilitate these measures. It's a, a commitment to be applauded. And it must be emphasised that the guarantee and protection of rights in the automotive industry can never be merely a government responsibility. It is up to the major car manufacturers and importers to ensure that a range of franchise agreements are put in place with their franchise dealers which are fair and equitable, which provide mechanisms for dispute resolution and which underpin the health and viability of those retail outlets which are so important uh, to the health of the Australian economy. Perhaps it is timely, therefore, for the major motor vehicle manufacturers and importers to take a lead from developments which have occurred overseas and in particular in the United States, where the need for fair and equitable dealer arrangements is now under close scrutiny. In 1990, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the United States, the General Motors Corporation for the first time recognised the plight which many dealers find themselves in, and through uh, negotiations with the National Automobile Dealers Association in that country, developed one of the fairest and most equitable dealer arrangements that uh, has been developed in the world. In this regard, Mr Deputy Speaker, I understand that the Australian Automobile uh, Dealers Association, a member of the Motor Trades Association of Australia, has taken that standard dealer agreement and developed it for Australian conditions so that it may be used by dealers in future negotiations between dealers and their franchisees. Obviously, agreements will differ from company to company to suit both manufacturers and dealer interest. Nevertheless, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I consider that much more could be done by the companies to listen to their dealers and to negotiate dealer agreements with them that are in their mutual interests. If the basic rights of franchisees were respected and held in high regard by the companies which supply those franchise dealers, there would be no need to raise in this place the examples of abuse of market power which some companies have undertaken in their own interests at the expense of their own dealers and the many people they employ. Mr Deputy Speaker, the automotive industry and the retail motor trades generally are vital to the health of the Australian economy. The capital size of uh, the dealer service and infrastructure, as shown uh, by submissions by the MTAA to the Industry Commission, is at least $10 billion. The parts stock alone is valued at $610 million. This is an investment which ought to be protected and ought not to be put at risk. The government, which has the power to address the issues that affect the capacity of small business to grow and employ, has to take steps now. In its consultations with government prior to the economic statement, the Small Business Coalition put forward a 20-point plan which, if implemented over the coming months, would significantly assist small business. There will be many small business people today examining the government statement to see just how many of the crucial impediments to profitability and employment growth have been removed or even considered. And uh, it is a, a little bit touching, as I spoke to my dad tonight. It's his 70th birthday to reflect on the fact that we've owned our cane property, sugar property, for 70 years. And while I leased my farm in 1986, I still derive income from the production of sugar and tomatoes. Just like many people in this house are doctors and solicitors but don't practice because of their responsibility, I no longer actively uh, farm and grow my cane, although I consider myself a cane farmer and am proud of it. And over the last few years, Mr Deputy Speaker, there's been much debate in regards to the restructuring of the sugar industry in Queensland, and I've certainly been the subject of criticism for supporting the abolition of the sugar embargo so that we could go to the GATT with clean hands and argue for a fairer and freer trade, given the fact that we export 80 per cent of our sugar overseas. When I supported the reduction of tariffs across the board, as the government has done, I was criticised and vilified by the National Party from Brisbane to the Cape. And it's interesting, Mr Deputy Speaker, to see the duplicity and the double standards that exist. Every member of the National Party in Canberra supports the fight back package, as one would expect or believe. But back home in Queensland, the same people go to water when they meet their farm organisations and when they meet their own branches and become outright protectionists. The member for Dawson has criticised me con continuously for supporting the abolition of the sugar embargo, fighting for freer trade, and has argued against the cuts in tariffs. And yet he is married to the fight back package and recently put out a, uh, a uh, pamphlet supporting the fight back package. And I guess he, he has two points of view. One, when he comes down here, when he tries to be a statesman, but when he goes back home, he goes to water as a typical Queensland National Party politician and he says what people want to hear. As for Senator Boswell, the leader of the National Party in the Senate, interviewed last week, he was asked 
but your own federal coalition is going to reduce those tariffs on sugar uh, by the year 2000 to zero, aren't they? Well, I hope they won't. That's his answer. Now, this is the leader of the National Party in the Senate. One can wonder, and one should ask the question, have they got the courage to stand up in front of their own people and tell the truth? Because I don't mind being criticised for telling the truth. Uh, the uh, point of order, the member for Latrobe. Yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. If the honourable member wishes to cast aspersions on members, uh, which was just done, I would suggest that the member would be more in order uh, under, with it a substantive motion. Um, provided he hasn't accused any particular member of. Uh, he did. Of, well, the, the chair's not aware of that. Um, uh, the, the member for Hinkler. Over the, last two, over the last two years. I'll read out another one for you. Scrap tariff cuts, Randall, shadow minister in Queensland, National Party shadow minister. I mean, oh, they do it all the time. There's no shame whatsoever. And of course, if you look at the Australian recently, Libs pressure Mr McLaughlin to justify tariff cuts. What's really happening over there is it's starting to burn. It's starting to burn. Because while you can go back to your own constituency and tell them what you think they want to hear, down here you've got to try and act like politicians within your own party room, and it's starting to hurt a little bit. But the irony is, Mr Deputy Speaker, our tariff cuts on sugar will bring tariffs on sugar in uh, July 1992 relative to the, the fluctuations of the exchange rate and the price overseas from between 23 to 27 per cent. That's conservatively. But under the people on the other side, zero within eight years. And the leader of the National Party in this House has called for the speeding up of certain tariff cuts. Now, I wonder what they're going to say when they wander back round Queensland and when they face those same cane farmers that they've told we've betrayed by cutting tariffs and getting rid of the sugar embargo, when they themselves are married to zero tariffs, zero tariffs across the board. On top of that, we've seen the Nationals try to, in a very petty, dirty way, gain votes from playing on the emotions of farmers in the rural crisis. But what are you going to do to them? You're going to put a tax of 15 per cent on, then road user charges, then road user charges. You go back to Kingaroy and tell your mates you're going to tax them at 15 per cent on every single thing. You've, you're going to create a crisis by your fight back package. That's what you're going to do. And the biggest crisis for you lot is the fact that the Fitzgerald inquiry came out and put a bit of decency into Queensland. And so your colleagues in the State House have now faced law and order. And actually, four of them, of course, as you know, went to jail. So what I'm interested to see is whether you're prepared to stand order. up and tell the truth, each and every one of you, to your constituency about where you stand on tariffs, because you're not telling the truth back in your electorate, nor is Senator Boswell and nor is the member for Dawson. And he ought to resign from the front bench because he's got two standards, one down here and one back in Mackay, and I'm order. looking to see him the in, in Monday. Time expired. The member for Franklin. He kept looking at me, Mr Cortese. He had me frightened for a few minutes, but never mind. Being a very proud Tasmanian, I'd like to just say a couple of things about Tasmania tonight. First of all, we're a most unusual state. We had a, a, a case not so long ago where uh, they were talking about homosexuals tonight, where we had uh, the, uh, the terrible situation of a homosexual being granted custody of his two children, and then he went to live in Western Australia with his gay lover. Now, I objected to that. I thought in principle that that should never occur. The judge that made that decision went a little bit crooked at me. I thought for a minute I was going to be up for contempt of court. But we've gone mad. The world's gone mad. Nothing surer. You know, when we've got those sort of things happening, where we've got a person given custody of two little children under the age of 11, could you imagine? Look, I was reared by a lone father. Could you imagine myself coming home? of a night time at the age of eight, seeing my father with another man, it would have an indelible effect on me. And that's what's gone wrong with the world today. The norm seems to be forgotten. You know, these trendy ideas, these trendy fashions that are going on today, people seem to think that's the norm. And it's up to people like myself and other members of the House to start pointing out that that's what we don't want. And I think we have to do it more voluble than what we do at the moment. The other thing, too. You know, we've got the site in Tasmania at the moment, and you've heard me on, this, on many occasions talking about the greenies in Tasmania, you know, what they do. Once, I mean, I don't like them, but anyway, I won't get too wild about it. But we've got the silly situation in Tasmania with 11 per cent unemployed. We've got the greenies 
unemployed people that are protesting, pre pretending to be greenies. One, for an example, sitting up a tree down at the Picton River, an unemployed musician. And I made the remark he must be whistling up there looking for a job. But we've got good people down the Jeeveston area near the Picton River trying to get a job, trying to pay their, their way, trying to pay off their trucks if they work in the timber industry, trying to make a decent, respectable living, being confronted by people who are unemployed, getting unemployment benefits, stopping them from working. And all I said that we should bring the police in. Don't yawn. It's a good speech. We should bring the police in, or the I know you didn't mean it to me. We should bring the police in, the army, and get rid of them. You know, before there's pandemonium down there. But nevertheless, they're still down there. They're still down there. The member for Kalgoorlie. And I know that sometimes you may agree with me. I said your speech was good the other day. You would agree with me. It's wrong that we've got people wanting to work and not allowed to work. Because would you agree? You would agree, of course you would. But the other thing I want to get on to tonight, we've got a lot of a lot of people. I I like I like Victorians, Land. and I like Lord Victorian politicians, and we've got a lot of good Victorians, a lot of Tasmanians living in Victoria. Two of my daughters live in Victoria, and they pretend now that they're Victorians. But one of them rang me up and said, said Bruce, or oh, they call me Bruce. They said, Dad, Dad, did you see that cartoon in the Melbourne Sun Herald the other day, page 12? depicting one nation, six states. It was a very, very clever cartoon. It was, I think it was performed by a Mr Knight. I don't know his Christian name. It was a very good cartoon. What did it depict? Mr Keating's head, right? But no Tasmania. Tasmania was left off his head. I know he hasn't got it in his heart, but he hasn't got it in his head now. I heard him today talking about resource security, trying to shame me and my other Tasmanian colleagues saying that we didn't stick up for resource security. Of course we stick up for resource security. We want it so that the industries in Tasmania can go on with their work, employ people, produce products that are going to be beneficial to the rest of Australia. So Mr Keating and others that may try and take a rise out of the Tasmanians who stick up for those sort of things, they're barking, and I mean that literally, up the wrong tree that we do stick up for the industries in Tasmania. We do stand up for the people that want to work. We do stand up for the timber industry that's been confronted year after year <coughs> excuse me, by the people like Bob Brown and others who are stopping good development in Tasmania. So again, I repeat, we've been left off the map once again by Mr Keating's head. A very good cartoon, actually. Looks like Tasmania may be his hair, but I don't think so. But anyway, that's the point that I would like to make. The Honourable Member for Kalgoorlie. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Order. If the Member for Gippsland interjects again, I'll name him. Excellent idea. <laughs> uh, Mr Speaker, I want to speak tonight on uh, Australian nationalism. It's uh, something, a subject I've written on a bit <coughs> and it's a subject dear to my heart. What is concerning me is uh, the arousal of what I consider to be pseudo-nationalism, which is uh, aimed at uh, bashing Britain, which offers no sovereign threat to Australia at all, no conceivable threat in any way, shape or form, yet tends to, pa uh, to uh, pander to uh, uh, North East Asia. And, um, you know, I think it really uh, comes from the Ghana Ascendancy, the book uh, written by Ghana, rather North East Asian Ascendancy. It is a very, very dangerous trait, and it hides the real problems. Now, the problem in Australia with the Republican movement has been taken over by the multiculturalists. And the multiculturalism is what's tearing the heart out of this country. Now, I think an example of this we have is the, uh, the camp of the New Zealand shearer, the, the shearers out here, the outside parliament, protesting against shearers from New Zealand. Now, in my own electorate, I have been uh, inundated with, with representations from shearers complaining about this. The interesting thing, most of them are in fact New Zealanders, and they say, look, we've come to Australia, we've made a commitment to Australia, we are paying our taxes here and we can now no longer get jobs because these people, fly by nights, are coming over from New Zealand, working for a short time, paying no tax in Australia, breaking down our award conditions and then going away. Now, this occurs because of the uh, taxing arrangements we have with New Zealand, something which the uh, Treasurer today indicated he would look into, and I have faith that John Dawkins will, will try and rectify the situation. I might also say that I've had calls and spoken to many pastorists who say that they too are concerned. They say we're making very good uh, progress 
talking to the union about uh, sharing costs and uh, a nominees in the award, and now with the advent of these uh, the, the sharers from New Zealand, which they know is only a short-term phenomena, the whole thing has been destroyed. The rapport they're building up has been destroyed, and they see this as destructive to the long-term interest of the, uh, of the industry. Now, I might add that while this New Zealand uh, sharers is supported by the likes of uh, the member for Kingston and all the agro-political bodies, I'd say to the farmers of Australia, just look what the agro-political bodies have done to you in the past, in the recent past, in respect to uh, the wool industry. They got it wrong and their performance has been appalling. I believe that Australia, if we are going to be a nation, we must stand up for Australians first. Now, uh, shearers that uh, are keen to work, that want to work, now cannot find employment simply because they're being undercut by these people who uh, are entering from New Zealand. Now, under the agreements we have with New Zealand, where we basically have a uh, common labour market, it is difficult. But the government must, in the final analysis, find some way of stopping this occurring. Because if you're going to build a nation in Australia, it has to be a nation with industry to support it. It means you must have an intelligent industry policy. In my view, that means you're going to have to give sectoral support to some industries. The primary industries of Australia are industries which are clear winners for this country. They have a great future. They are, in many cases, in many ways, sunrise industries. We are not going to benefit this nation if we are going to see the sort of thing happening that is being allowed to happen here in this case. Now, if we can make it a level playing field, and we hear a lot about the level playing field, the reality is, in Australia, we don't play on the level playing field. We actually tilt it against ourselves. If we play on a level playing field, and that's all these sharers are asking for, there is no problem. They're prepared to compete out there for their jobs, but they can't compete unfairly. Where people come in where they've got a foreign exchange uh, advantage, where they can afford to cut the rate without actually losing money themselves, where they don't pay any tax here, where they can go back to New Zealand and, in fact, not work for the rest of the year, so reducing their, um, <coughs> their overall rate of tax to a level where they pay none or negligible tax at all. You simply can't compete with that in Australia. And in Australia, where we have the trauma of unemployment in country areas, a very depressed country, area, far worse than the cities, you're finding a lot of this unemployment is directly related to the sharing industry. It is a problem that government cannot afford to sweep under the table. It is, it is wrecking the very fibre of this nation, and if the fibre of this nation is allowed to fray in the country areas, mark my words, Mr Speaker, it will spread to the cities. And one of the great problems in Australia is we are developing into two different nations, an urban nation and a country area, a poverty-stricken country area. The reality is it is the country areas of this state through their prime ministry and their mining that provide all the jobs and drive the economies of the city. And we have to realise that if we're going Order, to build this country back in the United time Nations. Has expired. The honourable member for Wide Bay. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today the anti-dumping authority announced that it had rejected an application by the Australian peanut industry for protection for, from peanuts being dumped in this country from the People's Republic of China. This is an extraordinary decision which demonstrates the federal government's total lack of commitment to the interests of Australian industry and the utter hypocrisy of the Prime Minister's current empty rhetoric on tariff issues. In the case of Chinese peanuts, both the Anti-Dumping Authority and the Customs Service have found that dumping is occurring and that the Australian industry has been damaged, but refuse to impose anti-dumping duties. The authority and this government prefer to favour the interests of a handful of importers rather than support the just grievance of Australian peanut growers. Much of the peanut product coming into this country is of poor quality, it's chemically contaminated and has already done damage to the consumer's appreciation of peanuts. But on top of all that, the peanuts coming to, from, <coughs> to Australia from China are dumped. Last year, the Peanut Marketing Board, based in Kingaroy, with the support of six independent peanut shellers, lodged an application requesting anti-dumping measures against exports of raw and blanched peanut kernels from the People's Republic of China. The industry established beyond doubt to both the government's reviewing authorities that the peanuts coming into Australia are being dumped. The authorities have also accepted that material injury has occurred to the Australian industry. Despite fulfilling all the reasonable criteria for having dumping duties applied, the government will do nothing for this significant Australian industry. ABS statistics figure, uh, point out 
that since 1987, peanut imports from China have increased from 2,053 tonnes to 8,374 tonnes, a 307 per cent increase to now represent 30.9 per cent of the Australian market. These peanuts are being brought into Australia at prices up to $800 a tonne below domestic prices Australians achieved in the past, significantly reducing returns to local peanut farmers. There have been poor seasons, making it necessary to import some peanuts to make up the shortfall in local production. But some of the importers want to institutionalise the imports to maximise their own profits. These dumped imports have destroyed the confidence of the Australian peanut growers. Even now a better season has returned, farmers have failed to plant their previous acreages. In the past, Australian farmers consistently planted between 30 and 35,000 hectares. The current crop is one of the best for years, but there are only 23,000 hectares. And this can be attributed directly to the impact of dumped Chinese peanuts. The executive director of the Anti-Dumping Authority, Mr Jock Maguire, demonstrated the philosophy of our anti-dumping agency when he said, when we go to a factory to assess it, 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 we assess if it is suffering material injury from imports, we want to find a bit of blood on the floor. That is what we want to see. Mr Speaker, I am sorry to report that the peanut industry qualifies also under this criteria. If Maguire and his staff care to wander around the remnants of the Australian peanut industry, they will find plenty of blood. The number of farmers has been slashed, investment has ceased, most farmers are carrying massive debt. Virtually all the farm families are living below the poverty line and few have positive cash flows. Federal Customs Minister Bedall offers no sympathy. He defends the importers and heaps ridicule on the Australian industry, accusing it of merely trying to increase its market share. Of course the industry is trying to recapture the market share it's lost to the Chinese, and it can, su can su successfully do so with a superior product if only it's given a fair go. By contrast, the National Liberal parties will deliver a fairer trading environment for Australian industry upon return to government. We will slash the amount of time taken to determine anti-dumping and countervailing cases and change the material injury test to ensure that an industry does not have to be decimated before remedial action can be taken. If there is to be any bias in the inquiry process, it should favour the Australian industry rather than the, than the importer. Assistance must be available to help particularly small industries meet the massive cost of mounting effective anti-dumping action. And where there is any doubt, we should favour the Australian producers. The editorial in the last edition of Peanut World said it all. Make no mistake, the fight against the dumping of cheap Chinese peanuts in Australia is a fight for survival of the Australian peanut industry. Astonishingly, the industry has won all of the arguments but has still lost the battle. The government's claim to support Australian industry has been put to the test Order. and found the to be empty rhetoric. The Honourable Member's time has expired. The Honourable Member for Morton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy, uh, Mr. Speaker. In my few moments this evening, I would like to uh, speak on the report of the government's response to the Aboriginal deaths in custody and particularly to welcome the report and the comments made by the Honourable Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Affairs, Robert Tickner, in his presentation of the government's response. And I'd firstly like to thank uh, the Prime Minister and the, uh, congratulate the Minister for Aboriginal and Island Affairs for the comprehensive response that was contained in uh, the presentation that was made yesterday in this House. I think it's particularly important to recognise the extent of government commitment to the recommendations or the response to the recommendations that have been made by the government. Yesterday, the Honourable Minister announced an initial first stage commitment of $150 million from the Commonwealth to tackle two important areas that were raised in the Aboriginal Deaths in Custody report. Those are the issues of law and justice and the question of alcohol and substance abuse. And I think the commitment of $150 million by the Commonwealth is a very substantial and very important commitment to those areas. There is a, over five years, yes, I recognise that. The second stage of the report will be very, also vitally important because it's in fact in that second stage response that the more fundamental issues will be addressed, issues such as health, housing, employment opportunities and equal opportunities for Aboriginal people throughout our country. 
And, Mr. Speaker, what I'd like to say this evening is uh, I'd like to make some comments on, with regard to the response that we've received to date from our state and territory governments, because it's of some disappointment to me that we have received such a poor response from state and territory governments of all political persuasions throughout this country, because it is in fact the state and territory governments that have the primary responsibility for many of the issues that need to be addressed from the 339 recommendations from the Aboriginal Deaths in Custody report. And I'm particularly disappointed with the response from my own Queensland government. And it is uh, sad for me to note that the Queensland government has indicated in this initial stage its unwillingness to commit any further funds from its own resources to address some of these fundamental issues. And I find that particularly sad because the Queensland government, the Queensland actually has the largest proportion of Aboriginal and Islander people living in this nation. And therefore, it probably has more of a responsibility to respond positively to the issues raised in this report than any other state or territory government. And so I'm particularly disappointed so far at the level of commitment that's been made by the Queensland government. I find it quite alarming, Mr Speaker, that in the last few, wait, last few weeks we've had from the Queensland government a commitment to $19 million on the loss that they managed to make on the Indy car race uh, that uh, occurred recently at the Gold Coast. And similarly, we've had a commitment of $10 million by the Queensland government to underwrite the uh, refloating of Compass Airlines. Yet the Queensland government says that they cannot find any additional funds to try and provide some further resources to uh, significantly uh, respond to the massive disadvantage that is faced by Aboriginal people in the fundamental issues of health, housing, education, community resources and alcohol and substance abuse. The Queensland government does have primary responsibility for these areas. And I know only too well, after having lived and worked on an Aboriginal community in far north Queensland, the level of disadvantage that is suffered by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Queensland. And I call on the Queensland government to think again about their response, to think carefully about the level of funding that they do allocate at the moment, and to very carefully consider the priorities that they do have. I understand that all state and territory governments have limited financial resources and that they do not have buckets of money that they can throw at every issue. But this is a fundamental social justice issue. And with Queensland having the largest population of Aboriginal Islander people, that the Queensland government does have a fundamental and primary responsibility to respond positively to the recommendations of the Aboriginal Deaths in Custody report and to match the funding that has been provided by the federal government on these issues and to come forward with some true, meaningful responses to this report and put their money where their mouth is as far as social justice commitments are concerned and start tackling the real issues that, address, that need Order. to address the Aboriginal The Honourable Member's concerns. time has expired. The Honourable Member for Dunkley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Monday at question time, the Liberal candidate for Wills, Mr John Della Creta, came in for some very harsh and most unjustified treatment. Some matters, I believe, should be addressed in a balanced way. I'm not aware of the contents of letters written directly to other members of this House. However, the fact that they were used without John's consent make a mockery of this institution. Only this year, you, Mr Speaker, wrote to each member regarding the security of information in each office. In John's case, the contents of his letter were not accidentally but deliberately leaked. If this leak occurred in the same manner as his comments on sheltered workshops, it is a shameful reflection on the standards of this institution. I know a little about these sheltered workshops and have corresponded with the ministers on behalf of various businesses, including John's company. The sheltered workshops have caused me to write to the ministers, and they are in two categories, the duster industry and the industrial laundry industry. I believe it is a tremendous idea that handicapped people have the opportunity to work. I know John De La Creta believes the same. I happen to have spoken to him about it on many occasions. However, Mr Speaker, there have been problems in the two industries already mentioned. 
landfill dusters and industrial laundries. The problems arise in the fact that the sheltered workshops undercut the pricing structure of existing businesses. They are able to do this using subsidies both for labour and for raising new capital. The result is that taxes raised from enterprises like John's are used to, to subsidise products that compete with his products. John's competitor, for instance, has had some millions of dollars in grants which have harmed John's business. A similar situation has occurred in industrial laundries. These subsidised workshops should be able to compete but not undercut prices and not at the expense of established businesses such as John de la Creta's. There are many other ways of expanding an enterprise without buying business by offering very low prices. Quality and service are, are the real features from which the sheltered workshops should promote. Mr. Speaker, some enterprises do have a legitimate concern when sheltered workshops use government funds unfairly. Recently it was announced that the Transport Workers Union had agreed that the Victorian Railways can compete with free enterprise in road freight. It is common knowledge that V-Line is one of the most inefficient and corrupt organisations in Australia. Correct. It relies on an enormous, in fact scandalously high subsidy from the taxpayer. Its management is riddled with Labor Party hacks and the organisation is crippled by outdated work practices, overmanning and rorts of every description. To use this organisation to drive legitimate transport companies out of business is an outrage. I am sure the sheltered workshops are not as blatant as this, but the principle is still the same. Mr Speaker, to my knowledge, John, John de la Creta has operated a very sex, successful business, even won export awards. These achievements are very worthwhile, and I wonder if those who have criticised him have contributed as much to the community. I'm sure they haven't either, the member for White Bay, and to the earnings of vital export dollars for this country. He manufactures a world-class product and should be congratulated on his success. Should he become the member for Wills, he would be only a, one of a handful of members who have actually manufactured a product in Australia and exported it overseas. Manufacturing products for export and for import replacement is the key to our future. Even the government admits this. John de la Creta's enterprise and perseverance in this field would certainly be a valuable addition to this parliament. Thank you. Order. It being 8 p.m., the house, the debate is interrupted, and the house stands adjourned until 9:30 a.m. tomorrow.